Hello and welcome stream. Welcome to our tea circle where we're going to be sharing tea and drama. That's right. I have rebranded. We no longer do any kind of analysis. We are now just uh, baseless conjecture, rumor, and speculation. Although to be honest, it's not quite that different from uh, what we were doing before. How are we all doing today? After the raid stream yesterday, this should be good. Uh, people overhype the, the rage stream. I don't know, do they? Do I have a good comment I can share from that? Can we please talk smack about Mr. Caption? Well, that's sort of the thing is, um, every time he's come up and sort of the chat preceding this live stream, um, I've been kind of reading about it. And the main consensus I've taken away is that there's a lot of people who are prepared to speculate about things that they can't really know about. Ah, uh, yes, here's a good one. This is a great example of, I'll put the chat up now. This is a great example of, not to call this person out because they watch the streams, of um, it was fine until it was my guy. Like, he explicitly says it at the beginning that, like, he used to watch this guy and he's very familiar with him. So he's all of a sudden surprised that, like, I'm treating it differently than I have any of the other, any of the other videos. Well, the fact is, if anybody else had made as frustrating a video as the Sammy Online video, I would have treated them the same. That's just sort of the of the cut of it. So, um, I liken it to, um, there's a, a common metaphor to kind of describe these things when you're in, in politics, which is, um, it's sort of like a man covered in feces coming up next to you, like next, like you're out rallying for something and a man covered in feces comes up next to you and just starts shouting how much he agrees with all your positions that that's sort of the, the sammy online video um the main thing i didn't like about that video was that it was setting up a lot of arguments that i agree with in ways that are incredibly easy to debunk which is what happened with the sorcerer day video which arguably i think the sorcerer day video was probably worse but there's like that factor of, but I disagree with Sorcerer Dave, so is it worse or is it just that I disagree with him? And I think if you think about it, the person who uh, just spent 20 minutes really setting up all the tees on the golf course so that other people could really just uh, knock holes and ones off of all his arguments, I think that one was the worst of those two. So... Uh, Anyways, let's talk about Mr. Caption. Mr. Caption is a story of uh, of speculation, and I didn't really go to the effort of, like, availing myself of the drama that went on with him, and that's mostly because I really, really could care less. Well, is it I could care less or I could not care less? It's a sort of... That's one of those... Th I have, like, this Orion complex... Um, and to explain that, every time I think about, am I saying that wrong or is it the other way, makes it impossible for me to remember which way is actually the correct way. So I don't recall if his name is Modern Orion or Modron Orain. So, and that's because I had so many instances of like, where I had to go back and look up what his actual name was. So now, I actually don't care what the expression is. So, anyways... To uh, give you all a basis for this, I want to do this once, and I never want to talk about this on this stream again, okay? So if anybody in the chat brings up the drama, just tell them to be quiet. Okay. Here's what happened, from my understanding. I used to watch this guy on YouTube called Mr. Caption, 
He made some pretty good videos, in my opinion at the time, about Elder Scrolls and about Fallout, and I liked those videos. That was all I really watched from the guy. One day he covered Nier. I ignored it. I don't give a shit about Nier. Nier looks like one of those games that could be interesting, but to be completely honest, I don't think is particularly interesting. Um, and you know, it's, it's one of those things, I get skeptical every time I see a game that kind of does the sex appeal thing, which Nier was giving me big, like, signals of. Um, so he made a video, apparently it was pretty basic it was like it was on the level of like the videos that we've been dealing with with elder scrolls and of course if there's any community that's more obnoxious than elder scrolls it's probably the near community and so they took to it pretty well and um putting that up for the for the 20 knock for the norwegian dollars all right so they took to it pretty well i believe it was 4chan and reddit who uh came together to uh really smear him now, was he wrong? I have no fucking clue. Like I said, I'd never played Nier. I haven't seen the video. I haven't seen Nier. To be honest with you, I don't think there's anything he could have said short of, like, I don't know, intentionally getting stuff wrong to really justify going that hard on him. So, he got put on blast for it, and he took it, he just, he took it about as well as, um, He didn't take it very well at all. That's a lie. So, there was like a big apology video and there was a big drama and then he like deleted all his stuff. Now here's the thing. I actually have to kind of respect him even if like he just annihilated his own channel and you're thinking, why would you respect him for annihilating his own channel? Um, there's a common saying that goes, if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. And a lot of people kind of don't think about what the implications of that are. The expression is that if you're not prepared for the rigors of being a chef, then you should have no responsibility being in the kitchen. And so, the general sentiment is that if you can't take criticism, which, again, I'm not familiar with Nier, and I'm not familiar with what was said, I have no clue if the criticism was valid or not, and I'll loop back to that in a second. If you can't take criticism, then you should leave. There's a lot of people on YouTube who can't take criticism, but we're still stuck with them. So, in, in the one instance where the guy actually was like, you know what, I can't take criticism, so I'm going to leave. I got to say, I respect that more than 90% of the people that we're stuck with. Now, uh, about this issue with, like, valid and invalid criticism. Look, I'll be completely honest. Most people on the internet can't give good criticism about YouTube videos. And you're saying... You should be able to take criticism when your criticism is mostly just you insulting the person or you saying things that has no critical value to the video. Someone being wrong about something, you just have to say that they're wrong. You don't have to go crazy. Now, I don't have no clue about the extent of what he was wrong about or how the community responded to him. But what I do know is that Nier is one of those games that people don't like to talk about now, similar to Undertale. And that was mostly a result of this kind of conflict that went on. Hmm. So the kind of... So to kind of like, uh, no, I won't do this. But it's, it is sort of one of those things where it's like, I can easily imagine a situation where, um, where like on a bad day, getting a bunch of uh criticism like okay here's the thing um if i made a video about skyrim my video was nothing but like let's say 20 minutes of me just going god todd howard is such an idiot for getting all the lore wrong god he's such a fucking moron um, and that was just kind of the tone of the entire thing most people wouldn't really accept that as being 
like good criticism, right? Well, that's kind of just how YouTube comments are. Um, so that's kind of why like I take YouTube comments at face value. Why would anyone care about a game's fan base? Well, it depends. Like everybody has a different kind of philosophy when it comes to how their videos are received. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, I probably won't ever talk about Undertale because of their toxic fan base. There's some games that I and a lot of people on this platform will not talk about because I know full well that it's not worth the amount of effort and time it would take to get every little autistic detail right to uh, justify it to these people. So it's either you just ignore the commentary, which I don't like to do, or you don't do it. And so I tend to take the route of just don't do it. So there's tons of stuff that I would like to cover that I don't because of that. What's the most toxic fan base? Uh, communism. <laughs> so, let me, uh, pop on screen here. I'm an anime man. Everybody hates the anime ga the anime gag, but yeah. Oh yeah, NCR. Yeah, I would say that's that's definitely one. Well, okay, so like, how about this is a good rule. The more like complex and like detail heavy a fandom is, mixed with how horny it is, is definitely a good sign. So it's like. Undertale, from what I've seen, is like something that you have to get into and kind of, um... Sure, give me one second. Undertale is like a fan base that uh, is really horny, but it also has like a lot of detail in the games. I don't know why she, she doesn't, she's not talking. I might have to restart it. One second. Undertale, like, to be right about it, there's a lot of, there's like a lot of areas that you can be wrong about it from what I've seen. So it's like, it's just not worth the effort. Tez is pretty horny too. No, no, dude, no. You don't understand. Some guy on YouTube uh, having a VTuber model. It, it did, Like, trust me when I say that the Elder Scrolls community is not nearly as horny as, like, the Undertale community. When I think Undertale is also, like, it's kneecapped by, um, by, like, being the sort of game that, like, relies heavily on kind of your subjective interpretation. Which for them means that you can be wrong about what you subjectively felt about a game. Now, now, I think I think subjectivity is kind of overrated. But all that said, one million sex mods on the Nexus for Skyrim. Well, I mean, I don't know. It, it is completely possible to. Um, to navigate the Elder Scrolls community and like have the extent of it, have the extent of your horniness be like someone asked why Argonians had breasts or something. Like it, sexuality in the Elder Scrolls community is very opt in. You have to seek it out. You have to put it in your game. Whereas the Undertale community is, um, the Undertale community is just sort of like that's part of the process. Now I hope we're clear here. Um, after we, after this point, you gotta ask me now, or you gotta bring it up now. If there's anything you want to say about this caption shit, where you, where he nuked his own channel, you gotta say it now, because I'm not addressing it at any point later in the stream. I mean, the point here is that you, would you ever nuke your channel for making a video people shit on? Not me currently, but I'm in a good state. 
I have no clue what was going on with the guy in his life. I don't know. I can see situations where that's the way that I would do things. So I've gotten into Season 4 of Attack on Titan, and I can't believe all of the Nazi stuff. It's hilarious and very on the nose. A little disappointed they're mixing it with Norse, myth Norse mythology. Yeah, um, it's a little more complex than it's just Nazi stuff, because you have to remember there's, like, um, various Japanese war crimes involved that, like, the people, that the, that the guy who wrote it might be like, I didn't commit that, so why am I being held responsible? So you have you have to factor that in too. I do agree. Um, the what what is their name? I don't know the the gold bands, white coats, what have you. Um, very very one dimensional, and I that that's kind of the core issue with the sort of post basement reveal world building and Attack on Titan, is that. It's all about the kind of moral complexity of what Aaron does in response to those people. And so making those people as one-dimensional as possible inevitably resulted in most people just going, yeah, who cares if they get wiped out? Yes, I agree with the sentiment, giving up on Attack on Titan after they showed what's in the walls. Well, the issue with that is, for me, it felt like they were introducing more mystery than they were solving. And it was one of those things where it's like, okay, well, you're going to have to actually show that, like, you're going to resolve some stuff before I get any more invested in this. Have you made any choices on those videos you asked us to research? Um, I was looking at what you guys said, and it seems sort of like... It seems sort of like we would just demolish them like we did the salt video, but... Um, it would be like YouTube videos with like 50,000 views. And so it's like, you might think, well, what's the difference if they have 50,000 views or 3.5 million views, right? And I would say the answer is that uh, we're always walking a fine line in life. And uh, the line, when you get down that, when we get down to those people, the line starts getting really, really fine. Now, actually, I'm glad you brought that up because there is some, there is a small Skyrim video that, uh, that its creator did something that basically guaranteed that I no longer felt bad about covering it, and that is this Skyrim video. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Well, there's three things wrong with this picture. This is a video from 2019. In the description, it says that it's analyzing things from a 2020 perspective, and the title says that it asks, does it hold up in 2021? Um, yeah, so, <laughs> should be pretty obvious that, um, there's some issues with what, what's, with what's going on here. So it's, like, a lot easier to rationalize doing this than it is, like, donut edits, where it's just kind of innocuous. But that's sort of the thing, right? How accurate to today could a video from 2019 on Skyrim be? And you might be thinking, well, what's changed about Skyrim since 2019? Um, there's this thing called the Anniversary Edition that uh, 
might make people interested in checking out Skyrim videos from 2021 and beyond. Well, okay, so I, I put it like this when I made made the tweet about it. Um, I get the YouTube game. I was a small creator. Uh, some point, like 20, like early 2020, I started putting the years in the title. And you just do that because of search engine optimization. Because what people tend to look for is they'll, they'll look for like Skyrim retrospective. And then it's like, well, maybe I want a more like modern Skyrim retrospective. Cool. I'll show off what I made. Um... So, they want a more modern Skyrim retrospective, so they'll do Skyrim Retrospective 2021. And it makes sense to do that because with the Anniversary Edition, you know, things have changed. Some people might want to see sort of a retrospective post-Anniversary Edition. It's sort of, it's sort of like in uh, 2017 wanting to see videos that account for like the Special Edition or the VR Edition or Switch Edition, what have you. <laughs> so the issue is that um there's another video we watched by Avarti which genuinely was uh Skyrim in 2021 that was the premise of that video so it's unfair to people who are genuinely making videos in... Do you still see dislikes too? Uh, that's a good question. It's unfair to people... I see them on my own channel. Uh, it's unfair to people who actually made the videos in the current year to kind of rebrand your old videos as being more current. Please admonish chat. Chat has its issues. That's to be sure. Do just random people not see dislikes? So the way they, like... They roll out features for users in waves. YouTube's pretty big. Um, it's not kind of like an... It's not like an MMO where they just, like, do a patch and then everybody's on the same feature set. Like, everybody gets models at different times. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are uncertain about the Altmer model. Um, they, these are, these were all kind of designed to unsettle. Well, okay, here's the thing about the copyright claims. I have yet to be claimed for any of the music that's been used. Notable things being, like, um, Al Green and uh, Lil Nas. Not Lil Nas, just Nas in general. Uh, <laughs> fuck, made that mistake. Uh, that was in the Dime Tree video, and then the other one was like the Dragonborn Hero remix that was in the Mod Edition video. I, I thought that had played too long, but I managed to mute it in time. Um, I have not been claimed for music yet. I have, um, I have been claimed for zero punctuation and i have been claimed for harry partridge how does video game music not get dmca'd anyways okay so the thing about that is that a lot of video game music isn't in is not in like the kind of copyright databases and this was done intentionally there was sort of a deal brokered in the early days of twitch that made it so that um, video game companies wouldn't kind of use the copyright system to go after content creators. And so one of the big things about that was not busting people for video game music because that's like the fastest way to kind of to auto content ID people is to go for the music. Um, so that's why video game music tends to be excluded from the content ID system. Mm. 
Now, I'm not, I'm not, uh, <clears throat> I'm not one of these people, I'm not private sessions, who, um, my music choices for videos tends to be just the games that I'm actively covering. Who the fuck? Ah. Um, unless it's the, so the Oblivion video has some additional music in it, which I don't, some people notice, but a lot of people don't. Um, the danger section in the Oblivion video is full of musical references. Where's that bibliography? Actually, the video in general is full of musical references, but there's tons of like instances where I'll use music from other games. Um, and that was mostly because, like, I couldn't use... Uh, so, like, orig in the original cut, during the Malakath section, I used the kind of Lord of the Rings orc theme. And uh, that would get claimed. And it's sort of like... My sort of thing with claims is, like, avoid them, if at all possible. Alright, see you, Zarek. Yeah, I liked the Invincible cutaway. I wanted to do more with that, but it kind of didn't pan out. Why do I think Bethesda continually dumbs their lore down with every game? There's no reason why a native Nord from Skyrim acts exactly like a Br Bruma Nord. Oh, God. Um, It's sort of... Uh, uh. I'm trying to think of exactly the way that is appropriate to explain it. When you see somebody, like when you see a Nord in Morrowind, those are kind of like the exiles, like the extremes of their race. And so the idea is, and like in Skyrim, when you see a Dunmer, that's again like the exiles, like the extremes of their race, right? So when you're in Morrowind, you see a lot more like the commoners and the peasants and what have you. And then when you're in Skyrim, you see, you know, the Nord commoners and peasants and what have you. Um, that's always kind of the way that I've coped with it. Um, now, it's undeniable that there has been some loss of resolution when it comes to the cultural kind of distinctiveness of the Nords in Elder Scrolls. So, anybody who's like... It's sort of like the equivalent of how the Imper Like, the, it, the same thing happened to the Imperials, right? Cyrodiil and the Imperials were like this cool thing in the lore until we actually got Oblivion. There's one NPC who worships Kine and not the Imperial cult version. Well, that's sort of the thing is they don't really acknowledge the sort of religious conflict that's supposed to be going on in um, in Skyrim. It's like the bulk of the... Re I know Zarek has stuff to talk about this, so it's funny that he left. I know that... Um, so, like, the Nords had an old pantheon, and, like, they had a religious... Like, they... The fact that the Nords worship the Nine Divines is a pretty recent development in the religiosity of the Nords. They had, like, a completely separate pantheon, like, even at the time of Oblivion. And then it's like... Okay, so... You all just converted to Christianity, and within a hundred years, you're already having a religious conflict about, like, the Holy Spirit not being in the Pantheon anymore. That, like, that's kind of... That's kind of what Skyrim is, is, like, you have a bunch of people who suddenly became... Who suddenly joined a religion, who are now having a religious conflict about it. It's such a weird thing that they... That, that was the route that they went with that. So it's like when the Force One are like, yeah, we worship the old ways. And it's like, oh, so you're like actually into those old Nord gods. And they're like, no, we're into like um, Satanism and stuff. That happened in Christianity. Sure, but it didn't happen like in the space of 200 years.
No, I, th I think you guys are kind of missing the point here. Um, because what happened in real life is not is not as like in as stupid as what happens in Elder Scrolls. The Nords have a pantheon of God, of gods. The old culture gets completely obliterated and replaced with the imperialized religion. And then the imperialized religion changes, gets rid of one of the gods, and Skyrim has a civil war about the fact that they can't worship one of the new gods that, rightfully, there should be more than a couple people in Skyrim who are still alive who remember at least somebody who worships the old gods. Like, real-life religious groups got wiped out, sure, but Norse mythology didn't disappear. Like, wh like when the Christians took over Norse countries, religiously anyways, um, those old customs didn't just evaporate from existence. And that okay so and that's kind of my point is is that it there's not a precedent in human culture for in the space of 200 years a religion to be completely wiped out and then for the members of those religions to be having a schism about a, an entire god being removed when you like you don't even see any like religious dissatisfaction about the new gods Anyways. No, you guys are still missing my point, okay? There's real life stuff that happens, and it had more nuance than the way that Elder Scrolls presents it. That's my point, is that Elder Scrolls is dumb, okay? That's literally Islam, though. No. No. You're missing my point. There's no earthly parallel because it's not fucking possible to obliterate a religion from existence in the span of 200 years like you can't do that today with modern technology and there's actively a country that's a world power that is trying to stamp out religion in its borders and they still can't accomplish it no it's not possible you want to know why there are still people who worship the Norse gods, despite the fact their country was religiously conquered over a millennia ago. And that's my point. The old gods of Skyrim were completely obliterated, despite that fact that that shouldn't be possible. All right, let's uh, tab over here. I thought the new Pantheon was just a retcon. That's my point, is that it's stupid. They just kind of changed all the gods that the Nords were into and acted like... How many gods did the old Nordic pantheon and the Imperial cult have in common? They had a couple gods in common. Uh, what's the book? There was a Kirkbride book that, like, lists out all the Tamrielic religions and stuff. But, like, so originally Alduin... So they didn't have a, they didn't have a parallel to Akatosh. Alduin was, like, that role. Um... And then, like, you know, you have, like, Shore, and you have... Then you have, like, parallels like Kine and Kinnereth, Mara. Um... Your Discord sucks. Mm, I think it says more about you than anything.
If your basis for my Discord being bad is the people in the Discord, then yeah. That's a skill issue. No one's ever like, um... Or if Discord sucks in general. Yeah, that's true. Um... But no one's ever like... Yeah, the user experience on your Discord's bad. No, it's always about the people. So, this is the hardest part. Starting the video. Hello, one and all. Uh, I forgot. Turn it down. Welcome to my review for Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. As you will be likely able to tell simply by looking down at the video. Now, okay. I want you guys to bear something in mind. This video has, like, gone through compression hell because um, of the fact that it's been uploaded, downloaded, uploaded again as an archive, downloaded and uploaded. And I don't know how many iterations of like YouTube compression this video has gone through. So I actually don't know what the original quality of the video is, but yeah, each time a video gets uploaded on YouTube, um, you're like stripping back another layer of just pure unadulterated quality. <laughs> Video length below you, this is a very in-depth review of Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. One that will explore in depth many details and facets about this game and compare it to a number of other RPGs. Which means that this video is likely to spoil you on the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, 4 Oblivion, 3 Morrowind, Witchers 1, 2, and 3, Fallout 3, New Vegas, and potentially 1, 2, and 4, including all these other games where you swing swords at shit. If you have not played all of these games to story completion, and care about spoilers for the stories of any of them, I recommend you go back, play anything you haven't played to completion, and then come back to this video to watch it. If this video spoils any of these games for you, that's your fault. With that out of the way, let's start talking about video games. Yeah, this is why I don't do spoiler warnings. I mi I don't miss... I don't miss the uh, old school kind of philosophy of like, Oh yeah, you gotta put spoiler warnings in for all the stuff that you're gonna ruin. No, fuck you. I don't care. If I, talk if I spend a section talking about like Dark Souls lore, and you're not read on Dark Souls, I think that's your- it, like, that's your problem. Well, okay, so spoiler warnings are dumb, and but even dumber is, like, the people who, like, absolutely just go ape shit at spoilers. Dunmer Mom. Are you really gonna veto? Are you really gonna veto the Altmer girl? She's new. The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim is the fifth and latest addition to the Elder Scrolls franchise. Are we sure that, like, this wasn't Dishonored Wolf's first channel? It was released on November the 11th, 2011, and is one of the most recognizable and highly- I also don't miss this stuff. You, like, you can really tell the era of the video. Imperial Girl? I haven't done the Imperial Girl yet. That's an Imperial Man that you're talking about. I don't know, honestly, what is an Imperial Girl? That's like the least noticeable... Least noticeable females of the series. But, um... Yeah, I don't like the the old... Everybody used to start their game reviews with, like... Like... 
The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim was created by Bethesda Game Studios, headed by Todd Howard, and was released on November 11th, 2011. You know, that shit. I'm so glad people don't, like, feel compelled to do that anymore. ...claimed games of the last console generation, so much so that it is known for being actively part of the top 10 Steam sales charts for the last five years, which is something that not many games can say. Upon its release, Skyrim was met with incredibly positive critical acclaim. Observe here. The fifth version of Bethesda Game Studios' long-running role-playing series is an incredible game. A Do we know who this guy is? Who's he, who's he, um, who has he brought in? You missed my super chat. Oh, which of the four Imperial Dynasties was the most based? Elysian, Cyrodiilic, Septim, or Medic? Well, okay, I'll definitely say it's not Medic. Probably Septim. A bit, obviously a bit of a bias there, but, um... Any empire which can actually conquer the entire continent through war and politics is uh, worth respecting. Yeah, based on what? Mary Sue Septim? I wouldn't say Mary Sue Septim. I've, I've never really seen that complaint about like Tiber Septum is oh he's a Mary Sue yeah okay I'm sure the author was really self inserting them into the himself into the role of Tiber Septum version of Bethesda Game Studios I'm so curious who this is is an incredible game a colossal fictional world that constantly surprises even after over 100 hours of play You'll still uncover quests and items and characters that lead to undiscovered territory and unexpected results. Not only is Skyrim one of the best games of 2011, it's one of the best role-playing games ever made. I've forgotten about the whole role-playing part of the genre. So it's refreshing to play a game like Skyrim that imbues so much effort into immersing you in its world. Quit your job, divorce your spouse, give your child up for adoption. And who's this? Do whatever you need to do to find the time to play Skyrim. For you know how strict my rating. Oh yeah, somebody posted this one, the uh, the dark side fill review of Skyrim. Scale is, I'm gonna give Elder Scrolls V Skyrim a 9.5. I think it is one of the best games I've ever experienced in my life. <laughs> That's not even fair. That's I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and that's why the final Based. verdict. I don't even have to cut to the it. Elder Scrolls Skyrim is a full highest rating that I can issue. Cut. Ten out of ten, and it easily earns the badass seal of approval. I cannot wait to see all the DLC. Oh and my god, he uses the coming. whole clip. Definitely dated with like the uh got to put the full reviews in there. The, the sizzle reel of um Yep, it got good reviews. And it's like there's a faster way to do this. There, just screenshot this. <laughs> and it is a game that tops a lot of people's best games ever made list. Yeah, I take that action. I mean, what, is Skyrim not a really good game? I know that I've basically been subjected to, like, what is it, three weeks of uh, Stockholm Syndrome now about Skyrim. But yeah, it's like... I don't know. 
it's such a weird thing to present it like, oh no, Skyrim's not actually a, like a good game or a decent game. No, it's sort of a weird thing. It's like, you know, don't get jaded. I think Skyrim is is up there, probably only because, probably only because, it doesn't have any competition. If um, if like there was a big genre of Elder Scrolls style RPGs out there, then yeah, Skyrim would definitely not be, not be up there. It's it's sort of like uh, winning by default. Because the other, the other racers died. So this begs the question, is Skyrim as good as everybody says it is? And that's what I'm here to do, to answer that question in full to the best of my abilities. And what impeccable timing I have, since Skyrim was just recently announced to have an HD re-release coming to next generation consoles. And now, with all of this introductory material out of the way, allow us to swoop right into Skyrim. Just like the last- Alright. Remember when Far Cry 3 was marketed as Skyrim with guns? That was a journalist thing, though, wasn't it? I would not be surprised. To Elder Scrolls games, Skyrim opens up with your character having been taken prisoner in some form or another, but does this in the most boring way I can think of. The opening of a game is supposed to hook you into wanting to play it, usually by having something either bad or interesting happen to the player character after any initial cutscenes, and if they don't, at least make the introduction quick so as to not bore the player, which is something every other major Bethesda lease since Morrowind has been able to achieve. In a world... Cyberpunk 2077. <laughs> To not bore the player, which is something every other major Bethesda lease since Morrowind has been able to achieve. I would just... uh, he's going to clarify, but I would disagree with that sentiment. Oblivion, the first thing we see after the cutscene is our character in a prison cell, which obviously throws off alarm bells for us because, hey, why are we in a prison cell? Which is enough to keep our attention until the Emperor arrives and starts the real beginning. That sounds very subjective. I feel like... You could you could spin that the other way. The prison cell entrance is so much more boring than than the prison cart. But like no, I think Oblivion's introduction has like pretty much all the same issues as Skyrim's. But, um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep saying it. Cyberpunk made me like the, the Bethesda intros. Boy, howdy, do I like 30-minute intros now that I've been subjected to four-hour-long ones. This is not the worst video. Don't fucking kid yourself. This is the worst video. Are you kidding me? Okay. One second. I got your back. ...spoke, or because she had an interesting personality, but because she gave such horribly broken quest directions. When that's something that players remember your NPCs for, above all else, you failed as a game designer, but that's a topic I'll go into a bit later. We look back at the frustration this kind of thing caused as quaintly charming years later, but that kind of archaic nonsense has no place in a modern game. Listen, listen, listen. Can't judge videos by like the first five minutes. I know you might be thinking, what? What do you mean? Almost with consistency, like every fucking video introduction is it. Like I always say the roughest part is the start and it's true. Um, that's like the way sex works. <laughs> it's rough at start, but you got to get into the rhythm. 
But this is definitely not the worst video. Come on. Prison cell, which is enough to keep our attention until the Emperor arrives and starts the real beginning. In Fallout New Vegas, which was at least published by Bethesda, we start off the game at a doctor's office, having been told we got shot in the head, which is obviously another alarming event, since that's not how most people spend a Thursday night. And in Fallout 3, we start off the game... being born which falls more into the interesting category of things, since most games don't start off with the character being born. And Skyrim begins with the player character sitting in a cart, where they can only move their camera around to look at stuff, while being surrounded by a bunch of random dudes who spew jargon that a large percentage of the player base isn't going to understand or pay attention to. Interesting word choice. You're not the first video we've watched to describe the introduction as saying a lot of jargon. I mean, it's true, but... But again, I, yeah, I feel like the chat is kind of catching on to what I'm about to say, which is... Um, I could present a way where every intro that he just praised is boring, and the Skyrim introduction is exciting. But uh, now we're seeing a pattern with the jargon. Imagine unironically saying Fallout 3's intro is better than Skyrim. Well, yeah. I feel... <laughs> Being born is interesting, sure, but that's it as far as Fallout 3's introduction being interesting. <laughs> They're really? Can't say shit like that. Unless you made it. In which case, well, I guess you can. I think everybody in this chat's been born at one point in their lives. Jargon that a large percentage of the player base isn't going to understand or pay attention to. Because I would agree with that, because the majority of people who've played an Elder Scrolls game have only played Skyrim. That said, it's not like... Oh, man. I played Oblivion, and then I... I, I so I played Skyrim. That was my only Elder Scrolls game, so I decided to pick up Oblivion. And after playing Oblivion, then I started Skyrim up again, and dude, the intro made so much more sense. I mean, you're free to like Fallout 3's introduction. I... No, I don't, and I think it's a bad introduction for how long it takes and, like, kind of the way it presents. Like, it's... Tr okay, so it's trying to do, like, the, um... This is a microcosm of, like, the experience that you'll get outside the vault. Which is fine, I guess. I don't know. I don't have as developed opinions on Fallout. I just don't think it's... I don't think it's... I think it's worse than Skyrim, so I'll say that. Because this was a lot of people's first Elder Scrolls game. Mm -hmm. uh, being uh, slowly carted down a hill with a, a bunch of rocks and trees on it. It's boring. I think the weirdest part is they, like... They start the game off desaturated, and then, like, by the time you get to almost the bottom of the hill, like, the game's in full saturation. I always thought that was weird. The beginning of Morrowind also opens up with our player character being spoken to while also being transported as a prisoner. But within two minutes we've been taken off the boat, sent to a census office to file a form for our release, created our character's face, and chosen or made our class. Within two minutes, Skyrim has us slightly more down the hill than we were two minutes ago. It's mm -hmm. not very exciting. And the sad thing is I can very- It's supposed to be the sun rising? That looks like shit then. Typically, things get lighter. They don't change saturation when the sun comes out. Well, yeah, it's like the colors in this game 
in the introduction in the standard edition. Oh, this looks terrible. You, you would think you were in for a bad time if, like, this was your only experience with the game. I think it's, uh, like, it's making it too easy to say, well, Morrowind's introduction isn't very exciting. You know, it's just basically you immigrating to Vardenfell. Oh, you must be excited by trips to the embassy. You know, like, I wouldn't present it like that. I think the cart the cart ride is definitely an issue because so everything up until like you get unbound is um uh, like Skyrim has so little like okay each introduction has like this scripting stuff where it, it will like unlock the menus as you progress Skyrim's introduction doesn't unlock like basic player movement until a certain point which I think is a valid criticism. Like, that's the issue with the cart ride, is that you're just sitting there. The only agency you have in this scene is that you can look around. You can't even talk to these people. It's, there's no dialogue. And you're not gagged, either. You're just mute. In a game where the player can talk to people. Hello, one of- Okay. Minor fucky-wucky there. We'll obviously associate as burlaps. Reminds me of the Metal Gear Solid 5, 5 Jeep scene. At least the Jeep scene had, like, some interesting dialogue. I like the awkwardness of the Jeep scene. I almost it almost feels like intentional. Like um like you're fucking up Skullface's entire plan. Skullface was like looking forward all week to having this like evil conversation with like Big Boss and then like he gets in the Jeep with him and he starts talking to him and the guy does not talk back. This isn't Big Boss. He's not talking back to me. You can't. It's like conversations are not one dude. <laughs> so I, I, I like that element, but like for the wrong reason. Spoilers? No, it's not spoilers. I've got bad news for you. If you haven't played Metal Gear Solid Five, you have no rights to uh, not having the stor story spoiled. But yeah, it seems like, ah, uh, I'm forgetting what game, but I'm thinking like the cart ride would be the opportunity to, would be a good opportunity to let the player ask at least one question. So you're like, you're talking to Rayloff here and you can ask him a question like, what are Stormcloaks? Who's Ulfric Stormcloak? What's happening? Where are we? What's the Empire? Like, you just give the player like 20 questions that they can scroll through and pick and like so like any question that the player might have about this setup at some point in the cart ride the player should be able to ask and get an and get a response to i think that would go a long way sacks being over people's heads with kidnappings because usually well then we were two minutes ago it's not very exciting and the sad thing is, I can very easily think of one way that would at least add a little bit of spice to this introduction. Shorten the length of the ride into Helgen, and put a bag on the player's head, like a burlap sack. It would immediately be a... Yes, I would agree. I think that would make it more interesting, uh, to... You can deprive the player of sight, but maybe, like, there's a hole in the bag that you can see through, so, like, you can see that you're on a cart ride going somewhere. But you can obviously tell that, like, there that um, you're not supposed to be able to see anything. The 
signifier that something has gone awry for most people, since a lot of people obviously associate as Berlin. Hey guys, want to see something cool? Should I do it? His fate is in your hands, chat. There's a hell of a delay or you guys don't care. And you ruined my joke. Oh, see? Then yeah, it didn't update it. I was what? Uh, okay, so like, if I'm like... Ah, I get it. Okay. Nice. No, it stopped the scrolling for me. I'm just a... I'm just a dumb brain. Smooth head. Overlap sacks being over people's heads with... Like, what the fuck is Sovereign Guard? Um... I don't, do people need to, like, be told what Sovereign Guard is to understand the introduction to Skyrim? Really? Really? Like, come on. I'm going to give people the benefit of the doubt that if they hear a name, if, if someone says, We're about to be executed. I'll meet you all in Sovereign Guard. That most people are going to have enough context clues just from that sentence to assume that, Hey, that's called... That's heaven. If you read this, you're Lovecraft's cat. Now, Lo I thought Lovecraft was just like tentacles and racism. <laughs> or it's like, you hear someone going, um, uh, Jor, Kinnereth, Debella, Mara, protect me. Or I forget wh who exactly Loki appeals to, but it's like, Wow, what are all those names? I don't know what those names are. I can't enjoy this intro. And it's like, okay, context clue says that he's probably praying to his gods. Like, at some point, you have to assume the player has the basic skill of, like, figuring out context clues. What the hell is a Skyrim? It, exactly. It's like... The the jargon argument is weird. That's like the weirdest approach to the... To the introduction is to say like, Oh, it's full of jargon, so it doesn't make sense. It's like... Okay. I would just say that like... It's boring. It takes too long. The player doesn't really have any agencies during it. And during in this open world game... But I wouldn't say, like, oh, yeah, the characters were saying stuff and I didn't know what they were. Any fantasy story intro would be full of jargon by this logic. Well, yeah, that's kind of the thing is, like, okay, so how many, like, how many fantasy games don't break this rule that you're establishing? since a lot of people obviously associate as burlap sacks being over people's heads with kidnappings because usually that's what they're used for in media which is at least a more interesting scenario than guy on a cart going down a hill looking at rocks once the game decides it actually wants to get started we're treated to I'm our character customization proposal. screen then we get on to our execution featuring the coolest character in the game for the love of Talos shut up and let's get this over as you wish I think this, like, I, I do like this part, because I think it sells the idea of the Nords. That it's like, fuck you guys, just kill us. Don't bother, like, I don't, I don't care about living another 20 seconds. Like, this is the most Nordic thing to do, is to die in a really stupid way. If he was an Imperial, it would make sense for him to, like, stall for time. Like, oh, someone's gonna save me. But yeah, like, this is exactly what... 
This is exactly what like a Nord from Morrowind would have done in this situation. And then like the for the rest of the game, Nords aren't like this, basically. Yeah, like, I love that shit. The last Moro and Nord just got executed. And then you get to, like, then you get to base game Skyrim, and it's like, Nords aren't brave enough to fight witches, they're not brave enough to fight vampires, they can't even take on, like, bears. I swear that YouTube gamers literally base their view of the world on the previous algorithm topper on any given subject. The jargon point was brought up in an extra credits video like 10 years ago. So extra credits covered, um, they covered Skyrim instead of the jargon thing. I will look into that maybe. Skyrim's opening, how to not start a game. Oh boy, oh boy, I'm excited. Hey, missed you guys. Hope you all had a good break. Let's get back into it. Well, you don't need me to tell you that Skyrim's pretty great. We've lost more hours to it than we probably should have. Probably gonna lose a few more later. And we have many a tale about slaying dragons and shouting back monsters, but still, it's not without flaws. And hey, that's alright. Now it can be a great game and a good learning opportunity. So let's look at Skyrim, specifically the first five or ten minutes. We've talked about the importance of the first five minutes of experience before. How those earliest minutes are both the hook that draws the player in and the context that sets the player in the correct emotional state to get the most out of the experience they're about to have. So let's look at how we're introduced to Skyrim then. Alright, so we've got an opening screen. It's minimalist, but console club. But we've got the Skyrim theme slowly building up. And then we have a loading screen, but it's got some lore on it and a picture of a dragon, so that's cool. And then, and then we're going for a cut ride, I guess. Now, if I were to ask you what the core engagement of Skyrim was, what would you say? What, at its heart, is the most appealing about this game? What human desire are they fundamentally tapping into? You might argue that it's about growing and becoming strong, but really, even that's in service to something more basic: our desire to explore. You'll find that most games have, at their root, one or two very fundamental ways that are trying to engage the player, and that in the best games, all their design decisions help to reinforce this core engagement. Now, Skyrim does this very well throughout most of the experience. But let's return to the introduction, that moment that should really get us excited about the core engagement of the game. So, I'm just, just I'm looking for the part where he says jargon. And wheel down a hill, because this is an Elder Scrolls game, we're also a prisoner, which means that our hands are bound. So, as a player, mechanically, all we're left with is the ability to manipulate the camera or you know, look around. Finally awake. Now, this decision may seem to play directly against the core engagement of the game, exploration, and I'm not sure it was the best route to go, but okay, there are certainly arguments for it. A lack of freedom can be used to cause us to desire freedom even more. Unfortunately, I don't know if that's really what they delivered here. I find it's always useful to look at games in relation to each other. So here's a question for you. Can you think of another game where you're put into a vehicle to be taken to your execution, and all you can do is move the camera while voice actors give you an exposition dump to fill you in on the plot? I was gonna say Call of Duty. Yep. Wait, just use transcripts? Um, no. The intro to Skyrim is straight lifted from Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, both mechanically and thematically. Even more painful, Modern Warfare does it much, much better. In Modern Warfare, this intro works because it plays much more into the core engagement that they're trying to deliver. In both of these games, the designers are trying to intro- What a position. Modern Warfare has a better intro than Skyrim. But it's like, okay. One, that's not how Modern Warfare starts. And, um... Two, I don't really see what it, what it does better. Introduce the player to the world they'll be engaged in. After all, this is the only function of constraining the players looking around while you wheel them through the world. But Skyrim and Modern Warfare deliver very different kinds of core engagement. Modern Warfare is attempting to set up a world on the brink, a setting where hard men need to do what needs to be done. It's all about heroic empowerment, making you feel like a badass hero while you run and gun. It's a gaming ex Extra credits are now fans of Call of Duty. Experience full of intense firefights and pig set pieces, which this scripted introduction establishes perfectly. Skyrim, on the other hand, should be using this time to sell you on this incredible world full of mysteries and wonders for you to explore. Here, let's just side by side these two introductions and look how they sell the world they take place in. First, let's look at the most obvious. What's the player seeing around them while they're riding? In Modern Warfare, the player is riding through an unspecified Islamic city, right with elements that are supposed to be exotic and foreign to the player. What if you're from the Middle East, though, my guy? Then I guess it's not as exotic. But beyond that, the city itself is in chaos. The player passes tanks and cheering crowds, and the impromptu execution of resistance fighters. This is clearly a dangerous and unstable place. Historic things are happening here, and you are caught right in the middle of it. Nope. I've, it's incredibly forced, in my opinion. Now let's pop over to Skyrim. Let's see, we got some snow, and some pine trees, there's some rocks, more snow. Uh, yeah, exactly. What Skyrim needed was people in the background getting gunned down by Imperials. I mean, okay, so we've talked about this before with, um, with, like, the speech check stuff, but there are some 
inherent limitations to what fantasy can accomplish compared to the modern era and it mostly has to do with like technology so it's like um it's very easy to kind of quickly get across the idea that like oh yeah there's executions going on in the background right because of things like guns um it's a lot harder to do that in kind of a fantasy setting more snow. Now, I happen to know that Skyrim's full of spectacular vistas and beautiful mountainous landscapes. Where are those? Where are the crumbling castles and standing stones? Come on, how did you manage to find the least impressive chunk of land in all of Skyrim? That's not how to make a first impression. Of course, part of the problem is the way Skyrim is set up this scene. They've made it unduly hard to provide the player with any such visuals. See, you'll notice that in Call of Duty, all the dialogue comes in the form of a voiceover, blanketing the player from the minaret speaker. Neither of the characters in the car ever actually talk to you, which allows the player to freely look around without feeling like they're missing anything. You'll also notice how the driver and the passenger are seated close Oh, yeah, I'm gonna really miss the facial expressions of this guy as he dumps exposition on me. Oh, that's a that's a big, that's a big sad face. Yeah, I've seen the Spectrum Crunch video. Together, so the player can easily see both of them at once and quickly take notice if one of them moves or does something. In Skyrim, on the other hand, the other characters in the cart talk directly to the player, forcing the player to watch them if they want to make sense of the conversation. Not only that, but the speaking characters are spaced widely apart, making it difficult for the player to watch both at once. Just stop back there. What's wrong? Yeah. Watch your tongue. You're speaking to Oprah Stonecloak. Meaning, more of your time is spent trying to focus on the characters in the cart. The spacing thing is only an issue if you're at 70 field of view. And not the world around you. Now let's look at what the characters are saying. In both of these cases, it's a plot dump. They're trying to fill a naive player in on what's going on in this world and set up the overall quest. You'll notice that in modern warfare, this is done entirely with terminology we understand. By which I mean, they never reference people by name or even call out specific places. Whereas in Skyrim, within three minutes of booting up the game, you will hear the terms Imperial, Stormcloak, Hammerfell, High King, Southern Guard, Ulfred Stormcloak, Nord, Rorikstead, Dibella, Kinnereth, Akatosh, Divines, General Tullius, Dalmor, Helgen, and Ella. All of spelled Tullius wrong. Also, what's the issue here? Again, there's these things called context clues that tell you what a lot of these things are. Most people will hear the term empire and have some preconception of what that means. All of this jargon is, I believe, an attempt to make the world feel massive, but anyway. Okay, so there we go. He said the words. Six seventeen jargon. We now have a trend. Once is an oddity, twice is a coincidence, three is three times is a trend. What's an empire? I don't know. So I, I kinda wanna like I wanna scrutinize Akatosh, this. Divines, General Julius, Dalmor, Helgen. Okay, I think he's started intentionally spelling stuff wrong. Okay, so I think he was doing a joke there. But I mean it's like, okay. Empire. You can't figure out what that is from context. Stormcloaks. Well it's it refers to a specific names, but they go into detail of what the Stormcloaks are. Hammerfell? Well, that sounds like a region. Nord? That sounds like a race. In fact, there's few, real people that are called Nords. Kinnereth, Dibella, Akatosh, Divines. We already established that. Those are all gods. High King? Doesn't really need a lot of elaboration. Ulfric Stormcloak? Literally a guy that you're sharing the cart with, right? Um, general Tullius, again, doesn't really need a whole lot of elaborations. He's a general in a military. Most people know what that is. Sovngarde, spoken in the context of the afterlife. Rorikstead, spoken in the context of being a place. Thalmor, spoken in the context of being a faction. Elgin, spoken in the context of being a place. It's not like fucking the characters are talking about the 36 sermons and expecting you to know what any of these things are. So, um, yeah. Interesting. Now, l let's ask the fundamental question. Do we think that um, Mr. Caption was just a big extra credits fan, and that's where he got the jargon thing from? Or is this a situation where multiple people have kind of come to the same conclusion based on... Um, Who was the other jargon person? Because I I guess I don't have it written down. God damn it. This criticism can be applied to anything. Oh, I don't get the terminology at the start of the game. Let's, um... 
Yeah, I mean, let's... Let me look at Steam really quick. Go to my library. Try to just scroll down. Stop. What am I on? Mass Effect. Mass, let's look up Mass Effect's introduction, shall we? Well, what about Shepard? He grew What's up a in shepherd? Colonies. What's a colony? He knows how tough life can be out there. Okay. His parents were killed when slavers attacked Mindwar. What's Mindwar? He saw his whole unit die on a cruise. What's a cruise? He had some serious emotional scars. Every soldier has scars. Shepard's a survivor. Is that the kind of person we want protecting the galaxy? That's the only kind of person who can protect the galaxy. I'll make the call. Oh my god! Oh my god, no, I can't- What's Mars? What is a Mars? What's a galaxy? There's too much information. I'm overloaded. But yeah. It, Prime relays in range. Yeah, what's a relay? Transmission sequence. Yeah, that's like a legitimate thing. It's like there's no there's not really enough context clues here to know what a relay is. And they they still say it anyways. Cuz it's not that big a deal. Most people can keep up. Oh, it's must be something to do with like transportation. Commander. I forgot that Mass Effect 1 starts in our solar system. I yeah, I forgot that. We are connected. Calculating transit mass and destination. Yeah, it's like so that's jargon where he's where like you're overhearing them the kind of technical uh terms for going through the relay. That's what jargon actually is. Relay is hot. Acquiring approach vector. All stations secure for transit. the sound effects. Mass Effect's always cool. So that was a game that I picked randomly. Are people just mad you couldn't instantly load the game and, and start playing? Well, yeah, I am. But it's like... So you have Morrowind. In Morrowind's introduction, you can be over with in five minutes, and you can be out in the world actually playing the game. Skyrim's introduction in that in the time that you would spend setting up. I mean, this is removing character creation from all the games. That's typically how I look at the introduction is I always assume that the character creation takes the same amount of time for each game. By the time that you would finish Morrowind's introduction, you would still be like in the execution in Skyrim. So I think Morrowind is a really good like Kingdom Come Deliverance is an hour? Eh, it's longer than an hour. Kingdom Come Deliverance kept yanking my chain. Was my issue with that game. I mean, but anyways, it's such a, just such a weird thing. Like, Skyrim's introduction is full of jargon. Like, yeah, most science fiction and fantasy stories start with, like, some level of like terminology because it's generally assumed that if you say things in a sentence 
Most people can figure out what the meaning of those things are, even if they don't have a basis in the real world. As a hero, let's all have a moment of silence for Nord number 1,462. Moment of silence. F's in the chat, everybody. All right. Once it's our turn onto the chopping block, we have our death intervened by Alduin, who is a dragon. He's also the game's main antagonist and the first dragon we see in Skyrim, which is a bit of a big deal since dragons are kind of Skyrim's thing. We make our way through the town while Alduin systematically destroys everything, which helps build a lot of anticipation for our future dragon fights, since this one is so spectacular. The well, yeah, so... It's such a weird thing to harp on Skyrim's introductions problem being jargon that seems like a very minor thing to the other issues that i think he that he brought up which was like the lack of really the character's ability to kind of move and interact with the environment i mean you you, you could always be you can always here's a terrible introduction Good morning, and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. This automated train is provided for the security and convenience of the Black Mesa Research Facility personnel. But see, this introduction fits all right once for Half-Life, because um, the main character of Half-Life is the Black Mesa facility. So getting a full, like, you get a ride through Black Mesa, you get to overhear, like, tons of stuff. To, it's like, whoa, that, that's a weird thing. But yeah, like, um, what's a Black Mesa? Yeah, exactly. Uh, when you say that, like, an intro is full of jargon, the Black Mesa train ride, I think, would be, like, a really good example of, like, you're going to need some context. You're going to need to figure it out via context. Because, I mean... That's a game where, like, stuff gets set up in the introduction that doesn't really pay off. Like, there's, like, for everybody remember the giant robot that moves boxes? Whatever happened to that thing? The player has, at this point, been introduced to the two warring factions of Skyrim through the two characters in each army that they go around with, and is forced towards the end of their escape to choose one or the other to get out with. There were some interesting comments that people left about this kind of, um this topic one was that there were there seemed to be like a decent number of people who weren't aware that there was even a choice to make their first time playing the game i i, th I think that's kind of interesting most players are likely to go with roloff and the storm cloaks on their first run because they spent some time bonding with them as prisoners and you know weren't getting executed by them and also aren't likely to fully understand the conflict between them and the imperium or the imperials whatever the fuck you want to call it so their opinion can't get changed by any of that wishy-washy politics people are interested in these days and I, I was gonna say before you say anything about the imperium uh there's like there's a line of dialogue in oblivion that i put on my second channel um where they literally call it the Imperium. I think I actually find it. He got reassigned to Anvil, I think. Without him around, all this hustle and bustle about the Grey Fox will go away. I never believed in the Grey Fox anyway. I think the Imperium just made him up as an excuse to raise our taxes. Blasted thief. I hope they string him up where they can catch him. He's a slippery one, though. The beggars are his eyes and ears. Yeah, if you don't know, I have the second channel um, where I post, like... I post, like, like clips, random stuff. There's a couple streams over there that that was an idea that I used to do, but now I just unlist the streams on the main channel. But, um... Yeah. That's kind of just where I post, like, anything that isn't worth posting on the main channel. Warhammer 40k versus Elder Scrolls, who wins? I would say Elder Scrolls, honestly. If only because it's not owned by Games Workshop. Imperiums or Stormcucks? Yeah, this feels like, um, if you were doing one of those videos where, like, you gradually corrupt all the names of the game, so, like, you're explaining Elder Scrolls lore, but you're, like, fucking up all the names... You would say that Skyrim, 
Skyrim job is about the Imperials, the Imperiums versus the Stormcucks. Your opinion can't get changed by any of that wishy-washy politics people are interested in these days. All right, so the the streaming fucking over people's videos thing, that's kind of old news. That it used to be that way. It's not really that way anymore. It all kind of depends on how good of a stream you have, whether or not it actually affects your channel. It it'll cripple your channel if you do daily or weekly uploads. But um, I don't know. My last upload was three weeks ago. And I'm going to be following suit. Not because I particularly like the Stormcloaks or even really care about this decision, but because Roloff is a Viking. And that's all the reason I need. It's inside the Helgen Keep that the player's hands are finally unbound, and we're slowly introduced to the game's combat, magic, and lockpicking mechanics, just like we did in the dungeon in Oblivion's opening. In fact, Skyrim's opening is more like Oblivion's than any of the other games. They both follow the same general formula. We go down through a cave system under the keep to our escape outside of the town, where we get to see one last look at Alduin flying overhead. Roloff, or alternatively for any of the heathens in the audience, Hadvar, give us our first quest. And the game officially truly opens up and more or less starts like every other Bethesda-style game. Now, of course, the vast majority of players- I wouldn't worry about him saying the name wrong. Players are likely to start exploring content at their leisure at this point, darting from location to location, completing side content as they go. However, to help give this review a sense of pacing, and more importantly, direction, I'll be following the main quest for now and getting into the world side content later on. Bef Got it. I don't even want to think about how I'm going to approach... Like, I, I have the introduction, and then the Skyrim introduction, and then I really don't know, like, what's appropriate to follow that. Am I the only person who just favorites everything so the favorite menu just becomes a copy of the equipment spell menus? I don't favorite everything, but my magic my magic favorites list is, is like 20 or 30 or 40 things long. It's really annoying. Um, menu Having a menu hop in, in Skyrim is really, really a massive impedance on like utility magic in, in uh, Skyrim. Before we do anything, However, there's a small note I'd like to point out about Skyrim's story, which is its lack of ludonarrative dissonance, which- Paging private sessions. Private sessions, you're needed. In the emergency ward. There! First try, fuckers! For all you people out there who says I can't type. In fairness, th um, this is very, like, dated to the era. Th this was all people would talk about. During this time period... Morwen really lacks the ability to delete spells that Daggerfall had. You can delete spells. Unless you're saying they cut content. Never knows best was right all along. Buzzwords are cringe. I mean, you know, this could be the start of like a really interesting take on kind of ludonarrative dissonance. Like, um... The right balance of humor, hijinks, and childness. In looking back, I wish I'd at least mentioned something about mental illness and- yeah, Okay, I have no clue when. He, he talks about lewd narrative dissonance in this video, but I don't know when. I mean, I don't care. I don't let a term being overused stop or start me talking about it. 
I think if it fits, it fits. But let's ask the question now. What does it mean? The conflict between a video game's narrative told through the story and the narrative told through gameplay. No, I would say that I would say I disagree with the notion that Skyrim has no ludo narrative dissonance. And I think the main thing would be healing potions. And you might say, oh, that's a gamified thing. Okay. So there's a woman, an Argonian woman in Riften, who you like cleanse her body of skooma with a healing potion. This is never brought up again. So it's like, or, or you have like Valdir who you help with a healing potion. So it's like, it's an it's an instance where healing potions are not just like a mechanical shorthand for like a potion that that like um sort of starts the process of healing you. Like it's sort of typically healing potions are like in games are representative of sort of a broader healing process. No, the game just is just straight up like, yeah, they're miracle cures that uh, will instantly rejuvenate you of any wounds or uh, addictions that you're feeling. All right. Side content later on. Before we do anything ludo narrative dissonance as an example is beating a boss but losing in the cutscene right after yes but i mean like the healing potion thing to me is dissonant because um it seems like so there's like the people at the chapel of kinnereth and white run and there's like wounded imperial soldiers all over the place that issue shouldn't be happening because healing potions are extremely, extremely common in Skyrim. And not only are they extremely common, they're extremely easy to make. Like, literally, some of the most common ingredients that you can find in Skyrim is wheat and blue mountain flowers. And that can make a potion which will revive people from mortal injury and cure them of the... Well, it doesn't cure you of your addiction, but, like, it purges your body of drugs. They don't cure diseases. But most of the people that we see are not diseased. They're wounded. And then it's like, oh, you need a healer who can cast restoration magic, and you gotta go to the hospital in Whiterun, and it's like, no... I always thought um, healing potions would work better as an overtime effect. That way you don't have that element of, like, Skyrim gameplay is just, oh, the red bar's low. Let me pop a couple healing potions and make it full again. However, there's a small note I'd like to point out about Skyrim's story, which is its lack of ludonarrative dissonance, which is a made-up industry term for when a game's story and a game's gameplay don't match up in the slightest. Oh! Oh! Chat just got owned. Now you guys know how it feels. You guys should have just let him finish. Fuck you, chat. Fucking cut him off. I'm not a goblin, you piece of shit. Skyrim doesn't suffer from this. It's perfectly reasonable for your character to justify the player running around doing dungeons and ignoring the whole dragon thing because, frankly, most people probably wouldn't want to go chasing after a world-ending lizard monster that can burn down villages. That would only be true if dragons were, like... There's something off about the dragons. Like, they're really big creatures, but they're not as powerful as they should be. Like, apparently they just have to frequently land because they can't keep themselves in the air.
Why are you so angry these days? God. No, I didn't I didn't say it dumb enough. Why are you so angry these days? God. There you there we go. Now it's just now it's not just me like reading the chat. And alternatively, some people might want to go and see what all this dragon business is about. So the story of your character makes sense in either fashion, which isn't true about all Bethesda games or all games in general. To give you an example of bad ludonarrative dissonance, let's look at another popular Bethesda title that I need to stop talking about, Fallout 4. In Fallout 4, the player has to look for their son as part of the main quest, and considering that that's their entire goal for going into the wasteland at all, they're rather desperate to try- But what if you were an abusive fa- Oh wait, no, they show you not being an abusive father. Well, shit. That's kind of the intro. They should just say that he's your son and allow you to extrapolate what kind of father you were up to that point. Try to find their child, which is one of those things that people- Oh no, I, ga I gave uh, Sean the old buckshot suppository. People have gotten attached to these days since we don't lose all of them to the whooping cough like back in my day. And it makes then very little sense for that character to then, you know, go around unearthing 45 rounds and cigarettes in 200 year old ruins that aren't anywhere even near the path they've been told they'll find their kid at. Yes, I agree. Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 I think both have this issue. There are fathers who don't care. Oh my god. Oh my god. He's so dumb as to not understand my point that yes there are fathers who don't give a shit about their kids but fallout 4 goes out of its way to establish that you aren't one of them oh what a novel concept it's like i said that in skyrim no such disconnect occurs if anything it makes more sense to avoid all that dragon nonsense and spend 20 hours mixing potions since those probably aren't going to burn down your house Okay, I agree somewhat. It makes sense that the player wouldn't want to, like, chase down and go kill Alduin. Sure. Because the player has no real reason to want to do that. But, the most people would probably look at what, Helgen and say, what happened in Helgen and say, maybe we should try to prevent that from happening in the future. So you get to Riverwood and you see this, this perfectly flammable village... This idyllic village that's full of, like, you know, there's kids playing in the street. There's, like, a, a, a three-way love affair. You know, there's multiple families living in the village. You know, it's like, you know, you don't want Riverwood to get burned down. And that player's heavily pushed towards going to Riverwood. So then when you get the request, hey, can you go to Dragon's Reach and, like, um, tell them to send guards out here? Like, yeah, the player is probably, like, unless you're, like you know, Evil Bastard McGee, which Evil Bastard McGee probably wouldn't even go to Riverwood with Rayloff. Um, I would imagine most players would abide that. What if your player doesn't actually care? If your player doesn't care, you'd probably go to Falkreath. All they say is, this was fucked up, go tell the Jarl. Well, I mean, yeah, but it's such a minor thing. And also, when you go to Whiterun, which is like, you know, one of the five major cities of Skyrim, when you go to Whiterun and you, you, you're you approached by the gate guard and they remind you that, like, you're supposed to be telling the Jarl about what happened at Dragon's Reach, or what happened at Helgen, and then you go to Dragon's Reach and it's like the same thing. Here's, but here's the thing. You will inevitably tell the Jarl about what happened to Helgen, or you'll cut you'll just cut yourself off from the main quest, 
Civil War, the enchanting services at Dragon's Reach. Like, like, just miss me with this. Oh, yeah, no, you can just, you can totally sidestep the main story in Skyrim. Everything up until Dragon Rising is pushed pretty hard on the player. I never said it was a character flaw. If you start the main quest, every new quest will urge you to get to the next one as fast as possible, and you don't need to because you trigger all events. I'm not sure what you're saying. So, I don't know. Can't go to Civil War without getting to Riverwood? No. One of the first things that happens in the Civil War is you have to deliver a letter to Jarl Balgriff, which means you have to have the dragon conversation with him, which means that he would push you towards talking to Farangar and going to Bleak Falls Barrow. Dragons won't even spawn unless you kill the first scripted dragon. What? What? I'm not aware of that. I didn't know that. I've never played Skyrim before. <laughs> unless you're a chat who hits Bleak Falls Barrow before getting the white one. No, that's worse. That's worse because then you have the dragon stone, so you immediately give it to Farangar, so then you're immediately... The dragon attacks the western watchtower. Again, the whole point of this is, can the player play Skyrim without becoming the Dragonborn? And the answer is yes, obviously you can. But can the player play Skyrim without being pushed to become the Dragonborn? And you can say, sure, I'm just going to run off in the woods in that direction and ignore the main story. Okay, we get it. You're cool. You're a badass. You've never done Oblivion's main quest. But it's like... You understand... There's, you're in the middle of the woods. You've just spent a lot of time with this guy. One line of dialogue saying, no, you can just go and do whatever you want is not adequate for like weeding the player off to go do their own thing. The nearest town is Riverwood. If you go to Riverwood, you'll be pushed into doing the main quest. And yeah, you miss out on the dragon shouts. And so anyways, that's my point. Yes, Todd Howard didn't come to my house and force me to do Skyrim's main quest. That's never what I said. I said that the game pushes you to do it. That, that, uh, that line of dialogue is equivalent to the Oblivion journal entry that says, or you can go off and do your own thing. Also, you can fast travel to Coral to get this main quest rolling, baby. Whether or not you've chosen Hadvar or Roloff, the first quest is generally the same. We've been instructed to go to the nearby town of Riverwood, which very coincidentally happens to ha I wonder if he's actually- so, you can talk to them and get some pretty interesting dialogue from them. If you talk- if you actually talk to them at this point. ...house both Hadvar's uncle and Roloff's sister, who hopefully don't get into any fights about their family siding with different armies or anything. That would make the neighborhood potluck a drag. Since Vikings were going to be guys, we get it. He's saying the name wrong. Nobody cares. Saying goodbye to Hadvar and going ahead with Rola for the rest of this playthrough. We go down to the town of Riverwood, a cozy little fishing village. Oh, so you're a racist then? You said that Ulfric forced you to do the main quest. You're missing some grammar there for me to understand your meaning village near a river and wait for Roloff to catch up and give the news to his sister and her family. While we're waiting for Roloff, I thought I'd talk about a few details about Skyrim that I enjoy. You could literally comment on anything he's saying, and you're, you guys are all getting caught up on the fact that he mispronounces it. Guess what? He's probably going to mispronounce it the entire video. He probably had, like, okay, it's as simple as 
It's as simple as he was writing and he thought his name was spelled like that for the entire script. And then he presented it that way. And he probably realized the entire editing time that, whoops, his name is actually that. Oh, what a big deal. What a big deal that he said the name wrong. Nobody gives a shit. Or nobody should give a shit. And if you give a shit, you should feel bad. Joy. First off, Skyrim has better shantification, which if you... Do I do it? I should be a more evil streamer. I should just start randomly banning people. <laughs> If you don't know what that means, there's a link in the description to a video by Mr. B-Tongue that will help you to explain it. I'm sorry, what? A few details about Skyrim that I enjoy. First off, Skyrim has better shantification, which if you don't know what that means, there's a link in the description to a video by Mr. B-Tongue that will help you to explain it. Then the game that preceded it, Fallout 3. Yeah, we're talking about a lot of Fallout here. Basically, in Skyrim, I never sat down in a town and wondered where people get their food from. Because Bethesda answered that question. What the hell was that term he used? Shadmandification. That's what I'm gonna put it in as. Uh, Mr. B Tongue. Skyrim establishes where people get food from. I'm sorry, I can't keep up with everybody's made-up terms. And then, like, look at me. I'm going to look this up, and it's going to be, like, a term that's been used to, in literary analysis for, like, two centuries or something. Nope. Just some guy's made-up term. Where does it come from? What's the term based on? You made the same food points in your Morrowind video? Oh, man. You just epic owned me. Epic style. Mic drop moment. Like, yeah. I'm not discounting the point. I'm just saying it's kind of dumb to, like, use a made-up term to describe it. Oh my god. I literally have like chats like it's about people knowing where people get their food. Not only did he say it, I have it in my notes. This part of the of the stream, it actually means something. <laughs> Can you guys take your brain medicine? No, I'm not even I'm not getting pissed. I'm not even like 5% tilted. You want Tilted? We can watch, um... We can go back to watching this video. If you want Tilted. ...spoke, or because she had an interesting person... ...when gives you the same answer to every question. Exactly the same. Copy-pasted, in fact. Regardless of who it is, or where they are, with a few exceptions, they'll tell you the same th You wanna see me- You wanna see Tilted? Go watch Thursday's stream. That's as close to Tilted as I've gotten so far. Take your schizo meds, yeah. Skyrim is a game that has been lauded for its immersiveness, so it's good that I never walk into a town and not know how any of the people in many places are subsisting, since they often have a clear source of food and water nearby. Not only that, but... Sure. And I like the... They have, like, uh, bathrooms in some dungeons. I've pointed that out before. I like the people still defining it. Yeah, I can go back to the Altmer. Um, 
I like the people still defining it in the chat. Oh, yeah. And, like, you guys are missing the whole point, okay? It's a made-up term. I had never heard it before. Well, well, most terms are made up. But it's a made-up term by some guy on YouTube. Okay? 63,000. Hey, hey. I've got... I've got more subs than this guy. This means that I'm more of an authority than he is now. I've literally never seen a single channel by this guy. So you can't expect me to know his made up terms. And it's like the biggest sort of cliche in video essays is, oh yeah, we just like invent our own terms to describe stuff. And then you expect me to like know what it is and like what it means and that like I'll actually give a shit. He didn't make it up. We just looked it up. We just looked it up. Okay? You want to know what the answer is? He did make it up. It's his term. But extra work was placed to make it seem like each town has an actual community. I can't invent my own term. It's called banning people in chat. <laughs> With jobs that need performing, sometimes different social classes, and daily... Wow. You, pu you pulled the epic... Epic mic drop own on me here. Lil, you're making the jargon argument. Stop dropping the mic, dude. It's expensive. Not you and like you're doing it at the wrong times. You think that like you think that you're pulling like off some epic fucking I got him! But all you're doing is you're basically ensuring that you have to spend more money on a new mic. Daily amenities such as markets. It would probably be a great time to also talk about this game's supposed aliveness that many people like to talk about, but I'll save that for later. Another detail, which is a much smaller detail about Skyrim that I like, is the water. It's got some really good looking water. Especially in an era where we don't have any form, yet, of water physics simulations and have to rely on mo- No, okay, let's clarify. We had water physics simulations, it was just extre- it was just more expensive than we could actually, um then uh, we could actually justify using in games and even to this day um a lot of it is still just kind of mildly illusory water 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 but yeah i find that there's like a problem with people on the internet who are like really focused on like trying to get their epic mic drop moment like you especially you see it on twitter everybody on twitter is like here's here's how i describe them they they are like just constantly giving epic they like go on stage they give an epic zinger they hold out the mic and then drop it and then they just sort of stand there awkwardly and they like slowly bend down and like pick the mic back up and like stand back up and then they like do another zinger and like they they put their hand out and drop the mic again and then, like, just infinitely repeat them, like, awkwardly picking it back up again. <laughs> That's why I always like that metaphor. Because somebody's got to pick the mic back up. But yeah, chat's, chat's basically the same way. Chat's IQ equals Twitter's IQ. Uh, I wouldn't take... Don't, don't get... You, you guys aren't that bad, okay? I'm sorry, guys. I'm, I'm sorry, children. You're not that stupid. <laughs> Models and textures to show us what liquid looks like. But beyond that, there's a surprising amount of neat things in the waters of Skyrim. For example, you can actually see salmon swimming upstream doing that little jumping thing salmon do. And river rapids and streams... But I don't understand why, because... Hang on. I gotta look at a map of Skyrim real quick. Specifically, like, it's water's ways. No, you guys aren't that dumb. So it's like... Okay. So you see the salmon jumping... Oh, yeah, I, I like this map. We'll, we'll use this map. Okay. 
All right. So the big like waterway is this one that goes from this lake to this river, right? And you follow this river. Okay, so this waterfall is like legit a hundred foot drop or some like some crazy shit. Like this is an insane waterfall, right? And we keep following the river. More waterfalls, another big waterfall, more waterfalls. Now, okay, okay, before you say anything, yes, I grew up in Washington. Fish go up waterfalls all the time. I am familiar with that fact. However, they have a bit more difficulty when it comes to these massive, you know, 100 foot drop waterfalls, okay? They're pretty, like, they can pull off sort of, they can get through these rapids. It's a lot harder for them to get through this. There should not be salmon at this point in the river because it physically would be impossible for them to get to that point without some kind of uh, estuary for them to climb. Or like this area, how there's like fish in this area, despite the fact that this is an impa these are impassable waterfalls, this is an impassable waterfall. Like, I don't even know why they bother putting boats in this lake. Considering, like, literally the only place you can go is Golden Glow Estate. But for some reason, somehow there's a whole dock area with two massive ships. Skyrim's waterways are just, like, it's an improvement, but they it still has that issue of, like, it just makes doesn't make sense. Ah, yes, levitating fish. You figured it out. will actually push the player and any corpses they leave in the water along like actual water does. Wow! Yeah, Halo 3 did that on Valhalla. That was like the coolest thing, um... W the, like, one of the things that stood out to me about Halo 3 was like, bodies could fall in the water and then they would like flow down the river. I always thought that was cool. Um... I'm, I'm talking like when I first got a 360, because I really hadn't seen anything like that in a video game. You know, my basis of comparison was like Morrowind and World of Warcraft. What if humans took a bunch of fish and dumped them upstream? Um, it seems probably pretty difficult and pointless. Not like, not gonna lie. We do that today, but we're also, like, you know, trying to conserve their populations. Typically, okay, we don't, tr in, in, the, in the modern day, we don't really transport fish upstream. Rather, we engineer ways for the fish to kind of navigate the, uh, the in impediments we made. Because that, that was a big issue in Washington was, um, if you don't know, there's a lot of hydroelectric dams in Washington. Uh, which creates issue for salmon who are going upstream to uh, to spawn. So uh, typically what they would do is they would create sort of a, a ramp system for the salmon to get upstream. But okay. You're telling me a bunch of fishermen caught salmon, found a way to transport them, and then put them back in the water so that they could catch them again. In, in Skyrim. In a land of people who probably don't care very much about conservation of nature and probably wouldn't even care. I'm sorry, but that's just cope. Did I also mention that it just looks good? There are a lot of different meshes dedicated just to the water to have streams, rivers, babbling. So they caught a salmon and they put it in a bucket of water and they took it upstream so that they could release it 
so that someone else could catch it and eat it. You you see why I, I'm saying it's cope? Like <laughs> that is my that might be one of the dumbest things I've heard. Why? Why would they go to the effort of transplanting salmon upstream in a in a society that like has barely invented the printing press? Yeah, never heard of catch and release. You, you No, you catch the fish and then you put it back in the water where you caught it. You don't catch a salmon and then take it past a waterfall and then release it. So they can populate the lake. Dude, okay. I, okay, in fairness, you might not know what a salmon is. Salmon are saltwater fish. They spawn in freshwater. They go up the river to have children, and then those children go down the river to live their life in the ocean. They're not freshwater fish. They... <laughs> they just spawn in freshwater. Brooks, waterfalls, all kinds of stuff. In fact, I would say most of the water is probably done with a model rather than Bethesda. I literally grew up within 10 minutes of a salmon hatchery. This normal thing where they just set a giant mesh of water at a certain height and use that as the quote-unquote... He's right about all this, though. Um, Skyrim did make a genuine improvement with the way that it would do water by making it sort of a more three-dimensional object. Sea level. All right, now that I've wasted your time by talking about water and lettuce, it seems Roloff's finally come to town and told his sister's family the bad news. Roloff tells the gang about what happened at Helgen, and his sister advises us to go out to the city of Whiterun and warn the local Jarl about the news. Whiterun's only a short walk away and is another good example of that immersive quality I was talking about with all of its farms and little housing outside of the walls of the city. To and then it's like basically the only city that has that. Well, I guess... Windhelm's got Windhelm has three farms somehow. Um but yeah, like White Run should be like the main agricultural hub of, of Skyrim. And it's like run by also three farms. Quality I was talking about with all of its farms and little housing outside of the walls of the city. To get inside of the city, we either have to persuade, bribe, or tell this guard about what happened at Helgen. So far in my experience with Skyrim, I don't remember having seen anybody with more speech checks than this guard. Any- Um. No, it happens. It happens a bit. I Okay, so... I, you're technically right in that there's- Speech checks is almost always- Persuade, bribe, and intimidate. But it's like, why would you provide multiple kind of persuade options outside of just flavor text? This guard... <laughs> this guard has, uh, has spawned more conversation about speech checks than, um... Like, this is the speech check filter guard. For Skyrim videos to allow role playing options yes but you have again it's all based on you have a limited amount of dialogue if you giving extra lines to white ring guard number five uh in response like oh the player can role play here that means you have to take away from somewhere else now you, there's a lot of things you can take away from Skyrim like for instance all the duplicate dialogue which I'm told he like will talk about at some point Yeah, I think you're guaranteed to pass this speech check. Although it's not listed on the impossible to fail list. Hmm.
Well, okay, so you have to bear in mind, there are speech checks that are also impossible to succeed. Like, um, convincing the Markarth guard to leave you alone after the first Forsworn conspiracy one. The Riften guard is dumb. There's no point. They should have had the balls to just fine you to enter the city. Well, okay, so the point of that one is Riften's corrupt, but it's not her, it's not like. It's not as bad with the guards as it will be. Because that's kind of the... If you have to take Rift in like a roller coaster ride where you go through the main gate and then like you hear the, the mule conversation and then you talk to Maul and then you hear the debt conversation and then you get to the market and Brynjolf invites you to the guild. So it's like... Kind of the point of Rift in is the guards are corrupt, but... The Jarl will fire them if they're caught out as corrupt. So loudly saying, this is a bribe, is enough to kind of get him to back off. He highlights one of the major weaknesses of speechcraft in this game. Not only does it now lack any form of minigame, it also lacks any form of feedback as to how well I might succeed in bribery, persuasion, whatever, whatever. There's no percentage reading like in Fallout 3, no hard requirements like in Fallout New Vegas, no disposition minigame like in Oblivion. There's just nothing. Speechcraft as a mechanic barely even exists in Skyrim. Sure, there are perks for it, but most of them involve bartering rather than actual speechcraft. And all the same, there's still no minigame to play. Yeah, well, it's because you would... You would be wasting perk points to buy that stuff. I would rather have the mini game than nothing. Is kind of the way I see it. place the one from Oblivion, which isn't an amazing minigame, sure, but not fixing the problem and just removing it isn't a very good solution. A better solution would have been to come up with a new minigame that was more fun than the last one. For now, we're just gonna tell the guard what we saw at Helgen, and he'll grant us full access to the city. We run our way to the castle and meet with the Jarl. The Jarl's having a discussion with his cabinet about what's going on down at Helgen when we tell him the truce of what actually happened. After that, the Jarl sends a small detachment of troops down to Riverwood to help protect it in a small scene that actually features some good politics, which make Balgruff seem like an actual leader. Balgruff tells us that we're going to need to talk to his pet wizard, who tells us that we need to go to a fetch quest for some rock he wants from a barrow. But he does this cheeky little thing where he pretends that that's not what this is, but, but don't listen to him, it's a fetch quest. We head out to the barrow, which is the first dungeon we get to, and is now- That's awfully reductive. <laughs> SAR? Oh yeah, that's a good point. What are what is SAR? Saudi Real. Now the longest stretch of real combat we've had in this playthrough. And while I go through this dungeon, I think it's only appropriate to start talking about Skyrim's combat. To keep it short, I don't think it's the best. However, if I wanted to keep things short, this video wouldn't be this long. The fighting in Skyrim can be divided up into three categories that I'll talk about separate from one another. You have archery, melee, and magic. First off, let's talk about the simplest form of combat, archery. Really? I can see why you would think it's the simplest, sure. Isn't this stream haram? Um, well, that's the thing. I think porn is banned in Saudi Arabia, so this might be the, the best that he can get. Brother! No! Don't look! Don't look at the Bosmer Bussy! <laughs> Do 
Inshallah, brothers. That's not racist. I am an I am a Muslim. Archery combat is based only on bows and uses up both of your two hands, which I'll get into later. True enough, Dawnguard did later on add crossbows, but this video isn't about Dawnguard, so for now we're going to say that Skyrim only has normal bows. I mean, let's be honest, crossbows aren't that different from normal bows. Don't Saudis approve of boy sex? You just can't kiss? Is that true? Should you adjust the height of each avatar? Yeah, I guess I should. There. Now I'm lore appropriate. <laughs> For a first or third person game like Skyrim, a bow and arrow is a simple concept. Usually you'll have the bow ch God, do I hate- I hate bows and arrows in VR. It's like one of the most common things they do. I fucking hate it. If my sergeants were to be believed, yes. Well, everybody knows that the staff sergeant is, like, the cultural ambassador of the unit. <laughs> Charge a shot to represent how far back the arrow is being drawn against the string. Give the arrow a certain travel time and ha How do we rate his Hanzo plays? Hanzo's alright. The issue is, like, when you have a Hanzo and a Widowmaker. This is old footage? No shit. This is when I played Overwatch. Um, you know, when it, when it was garbage. As opposed to uh, flaming garbage. I wasn't asking for your opinion on Overwatch. I was asking for your opinion on the play. Yeah, the only appeal of Overwatch is... Um, the waifus. Um, like McCree. Where's my tier list? I posted... I, I've shared this tier list before. Um, there we go. What's McCree's new name? Uh, McCree. He's always gonna be McCree. I can't fuck a man named Cole Cassidy. He sounds like a mayonnaise salesman. You can change his name, but it's gotta be better. And Cole Cassidy is not better. Is this upside down? <laughs> this on looks or including personality? I would say including personality. That's why Tracer's only A tier. Hulk Cassidy is at least the name of a wrestling gay porn star. Hulk Cassidy is the sort of name that I wouldn't want to share like a tent with. All right, new guy. You got to shack up with Cole Cassidy. Have it react to gravity, which will eventually bring it down to the ground. Usually I like that he's taking the time to explain how bows work in games. I mean, in fairness, it's the kind of thing I would do, but my videos are like eight hours long, so. Well, some of them anyways. Usually not too far away from where you shot it, so it arcs through. Oh, I have no clue about modern Overwatch. I just know the porn. Through the sky. All of this combined together so that your bow doesn't act like a gun. These rules make perfect sense because that's how you best simulate a bow and arrow in a video game because that's how they function in real life. No, the best way you simulate it is you have the bowstring break every three or four shots. Q 
Keep pausing the video every three seconds. It's pissing off that Aussie fella. Is there a guy in the chat who's getting really, really upset about us pausing the videos? Funny if true. I've got bad news for you. We're going to be pausing the video quite a bit. Because um, not only are we going to be pausing the video quite a bit, we're going to be doing it all day. If you want to watch this video unpaused, you could, you know go watch the video. I'm not saying you need to leave, but it's like, yeah, we're here for the commentary and the chat. <laughs> Streamers pause the video, that's what they do. I have it on good authority that on Twitch, you could just like, just let the video play and leave the room. Or like, just have lunch. Like, didn't they advertise, didn't they do like a, like a Twitch advertisement of like, here's our community, and they literally showed one of their top streamers just eating while watching a video? But apparently Skyrim did not get the memo. Not only does Skyrim slow down the player's movement to a painful speed, which is another common attribute of video game bows, so it's not that bad, but it also slows down your camera's panning speed for some god-awful reason, which may- I assume precision. It would be nice to have an option, though. But yeah, you're not pulling off, like, e epic flicks in Skyrim. To be fair, you can't headshot, so why would you bother? Yeah, I had a hamburger, and that's got to last me another 10 hours. <laughs> uh, some people want high sensitivity. If you can aim high sensitivity while you're while you're drawing back is not a bad thing. But typically games will give you options so that unlike Skyrim, which hates giving you options, which makes holding down a shot a pain in the ass as you struggle against the game to lead fast targets and get the perfect shot. And by fast targets, I mean any targets. I often find myself relying on physical movement to shimmy my aim around because the camera... Uh, uh, you need to play more like competitive shooters. Like, yeah... Sometimes the best way to get a headshot in a, in a first person shooter is to physically move yourself. That was something I had to learn while playing like Rainbow Six Siege. Was that like uh, movement was like also part of aiming. The sign leaves while the video plays and then cuts off the video before they can promote their channel. Yeah, I've, I've heard not good. Th like, OK. So we're doing this right. And this is pretty fair use. Because we're providing commentary for the whole thing. This is going towards something, right? Um, you know, this is about as, like, like as ideal as it gets. Because we're literally commenting on everything. We've got, we've got so many notes. Holy, holy fuck. And then, like, you know, there's people in the chat who just want me to mic off. Mic off video played. Uh... We're like, we're just doing some kind of gay watch together. It's just too slow to turn. So anyways, my point with that is those streamers that are doing that are fucking it up for everybody who's actually doing the right thing. In Rainbow Six, movement and QE spam is essential. Yeah, I, I hated when the Rainbow Six meta became like, oh yeah, you got a lean spam. I always thought that was dumb. Not only that, but for a reason that I can only assume involves compensating people who can't shoot a bow properly, arrows in Skyrim begin with a very small upward trajectory before anything else, not a straight one. Meaning that in certain cases, if you're like me, and expect the arrow to go, well, I don't know, fucking down! You'll aim higher than your target, because, you know... It's weird, but, I don't know, you can get you get used to it. At least it's not drop shot meta. I hate, I hate fucking drop shotters in Rainbow Six. I hate Rainbow Six, to be completely honest. I, I used to really like that game. I have a lot of hours in it. But they, like, started... Um, they, like, started fucking uh, catering to the esports crowd. And that really killed kind of the the aesthetic of the game. NPCs love to randomly sidestep arrows sometimes. They just do that with projectiles in general. And it's really random who can just, like, 
the world away from your projectiles. You, know, you expect the arrow to go, you know, down into them as it travels throughout the air. And I would say when the arrow first comes out, I could probably imagine like it would do a bit of weird things. You have to remember that like what is a bow? You're literally drawing a bowstring back and using the tensile force of that bowstring with like the the rigid kind of um, structure of the bow to create spring uh, to create a spring to launch it so that like the first like half second of flight is going to be kind of off get the bow i don't care i just want to see what it looks like Yeah, this is useless. Oh, I don't know if I want to play a BBC clip. They're, they might try to fuck me on that one. Get to the point. All right. No, that go that goes pretty straight out. Like, am I wrong? I mean, I know it's a modern bow, so it's gonna be different. But we're talking about like the basic kind of physics principle of it. I don't know, the jury's out. I'm not going to say that it's right or wrong just yet. And miss because the arrow goes too high. I can't think of any good reason besides compensation as to why this exists. Much of which isn't really necessary since zooming and the slowing down of time can be unlocked as perks. And the strange thing is that the movement speed restriction can be removed also via perks, but not the aim speed restriction, which pushed me towards further keeping my mouse idle and just turning to my movement keys, my, you know, W, A, S, and D to slide my aim around. When you're dealing with first person shooting controls, it's best not to restrict your player's control of where they can point the camera. So any misses or hits are all on them. Not only can the game not cause them to miss, but if they miss, they can't then blame it on the game. Oh, and did I forget to- I don't know. I, I find this to be kind of a... Uh, kind of a weak argument. It's sort of- it's just one of those things like, yeah... I don't know, you can compensate for the way it works in Skyrim. Skill issue? I don't know if it's a skill issue. I mean, um, it can be mildly annoying if you're, if you're used to other stuff. Is it Pleb or Pat? This is Pleb. This is the second channel. Thank you. More Saudi dollars. Oh no, I'm... visible. Kagranak, no! <laughs> I'm taller now. To mention that bows, at least according to the Skyrim Rukia, don't deal damage based on where you hit the enemy, meaning that you can't get headshots. Uh, um, anybody who's played Skyrim for more than like 
10 minutes knows that there's not locational damage. How did Dwimmer get vitamin D? Well, they have outsides to their ruins. I assume you could just, like, go out. Which, by the way, makes absolutely no sense, considering Fallout 3 has an entire system dedicated to damaging different limbs. Okay, so I I think that's weird, and I think it's weird that they didn't include, like, the dismemberment from Fallout. But, okay, how many people have, um ever installed like a headshot mod for Skyrim. You know that it typically breaks the game because headshots are really easy to do in Skyrim. Would dismemberment push up the rating? Probably not because Skyrim was already M rated. And there's already like some gore in Skyrim. Headshot mods always break Skyrim's tenuous balance, and I think that's why they didn't want to do locational damage. Why would dismemberment matter? Because it's a game about using giant bladed weapons to fight people. Like, okay, so I was playing Blade and Sorcery, and it is pretty easy to accidentally, like, cut someone's limb off. I mean, it's a bit arcadey with, like, because, like, there's not really a way that someone just swinging a sword is going to cut off a limb. But, you know, it's a fantasy game. So it's like, if you want to sell the fantasy that, like, I'm an uber badass, super strong warrior character, and I'm using a fucking claymore, then yeah, you should be able to, like, you should be able to do enough, to, like, if somebody is super low level, and you hit them in the head with, like, a giant warhammer, their head should just fucking explode. Like, uh, like how it is in Mordhau. Yeah, like that. Bugs? I don't see bugs being an issue, though, because Fallout 3 had dismemberment. Oh, this is Fallout 4. This is New Vegas, but it was the same same thing, basically. Like, he just... He literally just... Oh, this looks like a mod, though. You can't cut somebody's arm off and have them live in New Vegas. Yeah, so, like, you can see his legs just fucking blew off. But, I mean, I think I just think it's sort of a weird thing that they came up with a system to do it, but they just kept it at, like, the kill cam decapitations in Skyrim. Doesn't location damage crash the game anyways? In Skyrim, maybe, if it's, like, really badly implemented, but they had locational damage not only for enemies, but for the player in, um, in Fallout. You want stealth archers that make people's heads explode. I mean, wouldn't that be a pretty cool part of the fantasy that, like, you become so good, you, you become such a powerful archer that you can literally pop heads... Huh? 
Not only does this make the archery in Skyrim really annoying, it makes it more about how much math you have on your side rather than how well you can shoot. Which... Sure... I think they... They kind of wanted, like, uh, technical skill to not be a huge factor in, like, selling kind of the power fantasy of archery. Which is infuriating for an action RPG such as this. I mean, it's not like you're getting rewarded for headshots, right? Here's just a few suggestions that might help improve Skyrim's archery. Basic things, basic things. First off... We don't know what level he is. And uh, to be honest, using iron arrows, using iron or steel arrows on dragons kind of makes sense because you're just going to drop the, you're just going to like waste a bunch of arrows. Not to drop the mic, but could, but could that be a different philosophy between Fallout and Tez? Well, yeah, it is a different philosophy. I think Bruce Nesmith's not as big into kind of the gore aspect as ML is. But I mean... If we start getting into the like, okay, you gotta understand my point with the with the different style, the stylization thing. My point isn't you can't ever criticize something because they were intending to make it that way. That's not my point. My point is you have to take into consideration the why of Fallout's dismemberment when you're considering proposing putting it in Skyrim. So the why of Fallout's dismemberment is the VAT system, uh, the, making the gunplay feel cooler, and then you go, okay, so we understand why dismemberment's in, um, we understand why dismemberment's in Fallout, so could that be extrapolated and put into Skyrim with minimal effect? And that's the thing, is it's mostly, for, for an Elder Scrolls game, it would mostly just be cosmetic, right? Whereas, you know... The main thing where that conversation came up with was like with speech stuff where there is a mechanical difference between the two systems there's not as much a mechanical difference if you implement dismemberment into elder scrolls and i mean you could put stuff in like you know you slow enemies if like you cripple their legs or what have you and that would have a mechanical difference but it would be very minor and it wouldn't be that intrusive into the design formula You can, no, I want to, I want to clarify, uh, and I, I said it before, um, you can decapitate people, but that's through a kill cam. But we're sort of talking about locational damage, so you have chest, arms, legs, and head, and then, um, you can cripple those, and then, um, like, if, so you do a lot of damage to the head as the killing move, and then, like, their head explodes. That kind of thing. That's how it works in Fallout. I don't think Fallout level dismemberment matches the Tez tone. I disagree. Somewhat. Fireballs exploding a body. Well, yeah, that would be cool. I'm uh, Like, okay. Tez is about, like, obvious... Like, Skyrim especially is about providing the player, like, the power fantasy of being a powerful warrior. And what's more powerful than, like, being so strong that you can do something that's impossible in the real world, which is you can cleave someone's head off in one move. And, again, Skyrim has that with the kill moves. All I'm saying is it should be extrapolated into the gameplay and for, like, all the limbs. Doesn't fire spells turn people into ash? That would be lightning spells. And that's the perk you can get. Remove the aim speed penalties. And keep the perk like we have, like we have, for the move speed ones. Second off, at the very least. Yeah, they just need a slider. But like how a lot of first person shooters will have. Uh, aim sensitivity, and then, like, uh, zoom sensitivity. Allow for headshots. However, if somebody wants to go the extra mile, allow for differential damage based on all of the limbs on a body. And if you want to go another extra mile, let us, like, pin people's legs to the ground or something. Third off, the arrow goes... Yeah, it would be cool if, like, okay, so you got a normal-ass bandit, right? And you have, like, a Daedric bow, Daedric arrow, you're, like, a master archer. 
and you shoot them with the Daedric arrow and it like pins them to the wall like a the um, like a rivet gun or something that, that would be another like power fantasy thing that you can do like if you're prepared to embrace like this would be such a cool way of making being a, a master in a skill such a thing as like if you're a master in a skill you get these extra mechanics where it's just like where it actually feels different so it's like you just fucking yeah the rebar crossbow you're just such a powerful archer that like low level enemies like their limbs explode or like you shoot them in the chest they get pinned to the wall sounds cool but i feel like that would be buggy as shit it would be bug okay again you're basing this you install mods and it's buggy because the mods are badly implemented if they are actually going out of their way of implementing this like again i showed it they already have stuff like this in the games. Whoa, I thought it would be buggy as shit. But it works mostly fine in Fallout. That's just a terrible excuse. Don't bother trying because it would be buggy. I'm talking about pinning, not dismemberment, though. Uh, you're pin literally pinning a dead body to a wall is super basic. You can do it in Gmod in 10 seconds. Down. Okay. Fourth off, arrow types. Where are my fire arrows? My bomb arrows, lightning arrows, magic arrows? They're in the anniversary edition. Um, yeah, I agree with this sentiment. Enchanted arrows um, need to be a thing. Although, okay, so Dawnguard has explosive bolts for the crossbow. That wasn't his point. Are we going to do this? Are we going to do this? Okay. Are you saying his point wasn't enchanted arrows? Because yes, that was me extrapolating from his point. That's how extrapolation works, okay? I'm just saying my thoughts. This is what it makes me think of, okay? I'm not presenting... This is objectively what he's saying! Now he's talking about enchanted arrows! God, you're a fucking idiot a mile allow for differential damage based on all of the limbs on a body and if you want to go another extra mile let us like pin people's legs to the ground or something third off the arrow goes down okay fourth off arrow types where are my fire arrows my bomb arrows lightning arrows magic arrows anything lack of ammo types in both this and fallout 4 like perplexes the hell out of me because these games both have a lot of crafting in them so like why why can't i make like I don't like moon arrows or some shit like that. Like, for what reason would someone not want their arrows to explode? I agree. I think that, um... I like my bulk enchanting idea. Like, you can enchant ten arrows with a soul gem. And so it's like, you could get a little bit of extra damage. I wouldn't go so far as like, oh yeah, it's super easy. You can just make an arrow that explodes on impact. But, like, um... I, it feels like it would just add ex, an extra dimension to kind of... Yes, yeah, Sun Hallowed Arrows do that. But he's not talking about Dawnguard. He's talking about Skyrim, which I feel like is a really kind of bad way to look at it because it's like, you know, Dawnguard and Dragonborn was like them responding to some of the criticism about the game, right? Bulk arrow enchanting is a Morrowind mod from way back. Yeah. I'm not sure what the what a good balance would be. I would say like 10 or 15 arrows at a time. Well, they, not only do they already have poison arrows, they have enchanted arrows in a, in Morrowind and Oblivion. So it's not like a huge stretch. I would say you'd have to put some rules on it. Like, you need at least a greater soul to do paralysis arrows. 
Selling a fix to complaints as DLC, though, does put a bit of a different category from a normal patch, though. Sure, but, like, what do you want from them? Like, okay, so, what we're not talking about, like, should the fix be in the game. We're talking about, like, is Bethesda learning? Is Bethesda learning, you know, are they improving as artists? And to go... I'm not going to discount, I'm going to discount the DLC and then I'm going to make criticisms that like they tried to address in the DLC. Like if I was presenting this, I would be like, yeah, it's kind of an issue that base game Skyrim is super basic with, um, it's sort of an, it, like, it's super basic with arrows, but it is something that they took to heart and tried to address with time. The second category of combat available in Skyrim is melee combat, which by far has the most amount of weapon types dedicated to it. Because there are a pretty decent majority- Yeah, you got three flavors of paddles that you can hit people with. ...of weapon types just for melee alone. If they fix or improve things while adding actually good content, what's the issue? Well, yeah. Well, and I am kind of, now I'm kind of curious, how is he going to approach werewolves? Because... You know that the werewolf perk tree was a Dawn Guard edition, right? We're gonna have to fragment this crap even further to talk about each one. However, allow me to first off lay down the ground rules that apply to all forms of The Frostbite Spider animations are broken and it's fucking disgraceful that they're broken to this day. Melee combat. At our disposal, the player has a light attack, a strong attack, a block, and four directional strong attacks. To my knowledge, there's no way to control when you can interrupt enemy melee attacks unless you use a shield bash, but even this technique for me didn't seem to work 100% of the time, I still sometimes got hit even if I shield bashed right before somebody hit me with a weapon, and there's no way to dodge an enemy attack without running away. Your light attack is also easily your strongest tactic, there's absolutely no doubt about it if you're being realistic. The only reasons not to spam light attack are either to break shield blocks or just cause you wanna. There is a painful lack of strategy and skill involved in dealing or preventing damage. It's pathetic when compared to something like The Witcher 1, whose combat isn't nearly perfect, mind you, especially not Witcher 1. But at least ask the player to learn time and pa Yeah, okay, but my point with the... My point with the, um... With the Frostbite Spider animation is that it never really worked. So, like, a lot... Of, it never really worked, so a lot of people don't know that, like, it's supposed to be an animation where they, like, they come down like a spider, and then they land on the ground, but now it's just, like, they just gradually hover down. I've never found Shield Bash to be consistent. I would say early on it's inconsistent, and that's because the inconsistency comes from not knowing about, like, stagger resistance. Or that, like, different enemies that have different levels of stagger resistance. Patterns to keep themselves alive. And I'm not even going to bother comparing to this to something like Dark Souls, because that's just inhumane. I like that. That's that's quotable. Yeah, exactly. Let him finish, chat. Just like archery, it's more a matter of how high a level you are and how good your gear is, which is fine in a traditional RPG, but remember that Skyrim is an action RPG with real-time combat dependent on your ability to use its mechanics, all of which are unrestricted by things like cooldowns, to deal and mitigate damage as fast and as well as possible so that you can win. It's not Baldur's Gate, okay? And lastly, it should be noted that there are four subclasses to every weapon. You have axes, maces, swords, and daggers. The difference between the three being a difference in attack speed and raw damage. The slower the weapon, the higher the base damage. This review is two hours, Jesus man. Um, guards, this man has lost his composure.
This one was two hours plus a one hour video after it. And then... You have this video that some guy made. It's 12 hours long. They do, however, lack special damage subtypes like stabbing and slashing, which were found in Morrowind. Though these have been lacking since Oblivion, so if anything, Skyrim's only at fault for just not re-adding them. First off, let's talk about the try and true one-handed melee weapon. Something in your main hand, nothing in your offhand because you're fucking stupid. Good old-fashioned K-Man with a club. This playstyle is probably the one that has seen the least amount of love amongst all the various playstyles available. The only advantage this has over any other form of melee is that one-handed weapons can block better than two-handed weapons. Which is completely pointless considering you can just equip a shield in your other hand and do that. So sure. So basically this has no reason to exist. Granted, of course, Skyrim doesn't try to make this a viable way to play the game. It's just weird that they have this whole one-handed, one-sword is better than two-handed when blocking attribute. I think it's supposed to represent, like, the nimbleness of parries, but I don't know. That That's sort of my read into it. Now, Sword and Shield is a little bit different because they have a shield, which means that your blocking blocks a greater percentage of damage. Mind you, shields only add armor. They can't block, like, 100% of damage or anything. This ain't Dark Souls, where use of a shield is a matter of proper timing and stamina management. It's just a flat percentile damage reduction while the shield is up. And I believe it also provides a certain amount of passive damage reduction as armor. However, you're probably just going to realistically load your shield onto a tanking character and use it to soak up damage while whacking away with your melee weapon. Or you shield bash spam. That's pretty fun. Fun and powerful. I need to be a little bigger. I need to get, like, right here so my mouth isn't even with the time bar. Do shields do anything if you're at the armor cap? I'm not sure how the armor cap even works. I haven't looked it. I haven't looked too deeply into that. What's this? Apparently salt factory guys are trying to get my server banned. <laughs> okay. What pathetic beta males. I mean, really, are you so thin-skinned for your fucking parasocial daddy? Don't say anything on stream, though. Why shouldn't I? Salt Factory should probably disavow that his community is doing that and tell them to stop. Let's, uh... Hang on, I gotta, I gotta look into this. I looked into a server before on an alternate account. I guess I'm joining I'm joining it on my main account now. Yeah, I can put on Joe. Oh, shit. Probably specify. Hey! 
Japan Ultimate Western RPG. A game that raises the bar for all other RPGs. And that's why the final verdict for The Elder Scrolls Skyrim is a full highest rating that I can issue, 10 out of 10. And it easily earns the badass seal of approval. I cannot. All right. I think, hang on, uh, what's the good way to find this? That would be to look up the report link, I would think. I apologize, this is something I have to look into. On stream. Direct, okay. I could also look up the guy's name. Is it intermission? Yeah, you can get a you can get a drink if you want to. God damn, this person has like 1,800 pages of posts. 45,000 posts? Okay, I'm gonna need like yesterday at 1027, okay. I literally don't understand how people can know life discord like this. Well, if they're doing it, they don't seem to be doing it on the actual server itself. So it's just some guy independently trying to re report and take down the server. So is this some actually something to be concerned about? I don't know. I don't know how effective Discord reporting is. I assume my, my server's been reported before. 
even though we have pretty much every racial slur auto banned. Unless you have Spellbreaker or want to block an arrow. Now, before I mentioned shield bashing, so I thought I'd talk about that. It is possible to interrupt enemy animations with a shield bash. However, the rules for doing so seem incredibly strange. I can't be totally sure, but it seemed like if I bashed during an enemy attack animation that hadn't yet finished, like imagine their weapon is raised up in the air and they're coming crashing down on me, but I hit their weapon back with my shield, they got this quicker animation that I couldn't really capitalize on because I gave them enough time if they had a shield or just one weapon to block me. And if I just bashed around with gay abandon while they sit around with their sword, I got a longer animation which I could at least capitalize on for one hit, even with a mace. Basically, all this is to say that if you really care about preventing as much damage as possible... Yeah, I think he's overthinking, like, um... His, his issue is that he's thinking about it from, like, a timing perspective, and not just, like, a stagger, like, stunlock spamming perspective. you can spam shield block too and you can double your combo from light attack light attack light attack light attack to light attack bash light attack bash at least until you run out of stamina and then go back to light attack light attack light attack light shield attack soup like shield bash is super cheap though stamina yeah, what is this from that period of time dark souls was considered the peak of melee combat yes but he already said that he's not going to do the Dark Souls comparison thing, because it would be uh, inhumane. Light attack. The closest thing this has to a skill-based, time-based mechanic I can think of is pairing strong attacks. Because the strong attack has a very long animation leading into it, which telegraphs what's about to happen, so you actually you know, yeah. have to wait there yeah, okay, block so for his the issue right is moment. He's approaching it from like a timing thing. Or shield bash, rather, you know what I mean. But even this is made trivial by the quick reflexes perk, which slows down time when an enemy attempts a strong attack. Two-handed is essentially no different than one-handed, but it just does more damage and has worse blocking because of your lack of a shield. And no utility. I've never really done two-handed because you lack fundamental utility. One thing I guess we can note about it is that it does allow for longer melee range, so if you- Isn't Sekiro just more modern Dark Souls, though? Like, isn't that a From- From game? You have some super high damage multiplication mods, you can use this to your advantage against one-handed wielders. All of the blocking mechanics are, of course, unchanged. And the final fighting style for melee is dual-wielded with one-handed weapons. First off, let me say that I appreciate the inclusion of dual wielding in this game because running around with two axes is cool. However, the combat for dual wield is even more of a light attack spam fest since you don't even have your shield to block with, and there's no real benefit to swinging in between the two weapons you have. Dual wield, as far as I can tell, is just the same as normal one-handed, just with a vestigial extra sword instead of a shield. Yes. I don't understand the logic of you use a dagger in the left hand so it makes the right hand faster. It just seems weird to me. You do get cooler power attacks, so that's neat. You've probably already picked up on my biggest problem with Skyrim's melee. It is indeed how little you actually have to manage while doing it. The main problem comes down to how little resource usage there actually is. I'm it scales a lot better with the difficulty, though. At least you get- at least you have ways to increase your damage, unlike magic.
I swear this guy is playing on a higher difficulty to emphasize the combat bad. You can play on any difficulty and figure out that combat's bad. His issue isn't, like, whether you're, like, w w whether you're one-shotting or ten-shotting opponents, you're still just spamming left mouse button with very little ceremony. And if you aren't using shield bashing, then it, yes, the combat is exceptionally monotonous. Which is how it felt whenever I did melee on my second, on my stealth character, who didn't have a shield. I'm glad shield bashing and power attacks use up stamina, and more importantly, can't be used when you're out of stamina. But honestly, this probably just pushes more players towards using light attack, since they don't have to worry about stamina. Once again, I'm going to provide solutions here. Uh, okay, so... Stamina is more of a resource for you to use in Skyrim than it is in Oblivion. Because your damage in Oblivion scales off of stamina, you have every incentive to keep the green bar as full as possible at all times, so don't ever power attack, right? Because people are like, oh, power attacks have utility. It's a 5% chance, so you're blowing a ton of stamina, like, gambling, hoping that you get the utility from the power attacks. Or, like, you want the stagger, which is kind of lame, or you want to finish the opponent off. Like, the only valid application of power attacks in Oblivion, in my opinion, is the opponent is starting to run away, and you want to close the gap on them. Um, I like the way that Skyrim does it more because you have more incentive to actually use your stamina. Compared to Oblivion. I mean, this is assuming that, like, Morrowind never existed. This video is not that bad. I'll be honest with you. Um, most of it is just like he's approaching it from a perspective I don't agree with, but I don't think he's necessarily wrong. What mod pack should you take for your first playthrough? Uh, download the latest version of OpenMW. Just do that. There's lots of content in Morrowind's that you should probably experience before you actually start doing, like, modded stuff. Here, because that's how things get better. First off, make light attacks not the best, safest solution to all combat problems. If they must stay as such, make it so they have to be performed in some sort of rhythm, like in The Witcher. You could even have, like, combo attacks or something like dual wielding. Secondly, make it so all combat actions, blocking, attacking, whatever, consume some amount of stamina and have some penalty for running out of stamina. Yes, I think normal swings should have a minor stamina penalty. Do you think we could ever have a two-scale Tamriel, but with all the details we've always been promised in lore? To what scale? You mean like the intended scale? Probably not. Third, give disrupting enemies a dedicated mechanic, like what Dark Souls has for parrying. That's what staggers are. It doesn't have to be the same, it just has to be something more than spamming shield bash. And finally, give us a oh, dodge. So, so he does know that it, he can do that. Dodging or blocking is the cornerstone of damage prevention in action games. Either make the shield block all damage, or give us a proper dodge with invincible frames and all that shit. Aside from that, I'm not sure what else could need adding other uh, okay, than maybe so the, the issue is, the focus of combat in Elder Scrolls is first person. And first person dodging is something that's kind of difficult to properly tune. There are damage types to help with the whole RPG aspect of the game. It's really more the actual action combat itself that's really a drag. And finally, the final form of combat in Skyrim. The magic. The magic in Skyrim is my favorite because of how varied all of the spells are. You have a lot of different spells to choose from. You have everything from streams, to traps, to resurrections, to ethereal weapons, auras, all kinds of good shit.
Okay. Mord, how dodging is fun even in first person? Yes, but no. I did a lot of dodge builds. It's not that good is the issue. I, if he had phrased it like, Skyrim has better ways of delivering magic. So, for instance, before Skyrim, the three ways that you would, ha the three options you had for magic delivery was touch, target, and self. With Skyrim, they add, you have like the stream spells, you have targeted spells, you have AoE spells that have different functions like chain lightning and ice storm. You know, fireball is still like classic, um, damage explosion from the previous games but like chain lightning has new functions the ice storm has new functions you have the wall spells that are pretty cool you have runes um you have like flame cloaks like there are new functions for spells but going with the let's just list a bunch of like spell archetypes in skyrim is not the way to go because even with those things skyrim magic is still not better but that's Skyrim Magic's issue, I think, comes down to tuning. Because as, as I've gradually broken the game with my magic build, I have um, started to honestly really think that Skyrim's magic has, like, so much potential. Like, let me find a good example. So, I showed this the other day. Um, I've been using the Ethereal Crown to abuse the Ritual Stone. This is actually a super fun way to do dungeons that has kind of refreshed... Like, I ha I'm doing a lot of dungeons on this character because I'm doing, like, all the side content. So, like, I have to do all the word walls. I have to get all the Dragon Priest masks, etc., etc. So, like, having a playthrough where it's just Firebolt spam should be boring. But the fact that I've figured out that um well i didn't figure it out somebody else did it for me but so you can use the ritual stone and the ethereal crown resets the power so you can keep reusing it so you can gradually accumulate a growing army of undead because the the cap of the number of people that can be resurrected with the ritual stone is 100 people so i literally did the periite dungeon which is usually super tedious but every time i would fight afflicted I would a add them to my undead army, and it made the dungeon really fun. And I was like, wow, I'm actually having fun with magic in Skyrim. It took me exploiting and breaking the game, but it shows that there is potential. And then it's like the same thing, like, um, fireball spam. I'm playing vampire and I have a bunch of illusion perks. So like I can make almost any enemy in the game fight other enemies. That's pretty cool. Like there's a lot of cool stuff to Skyrim magic and they are terrified of giving it to the player. So most of it, I came across with perks or with, uh, exploits. Like, um, you can't really spam fireballs without exploiting the, using the restoration loop to kind of make a character who can has a shit ton of destruction magic reduction, right? You can't really improve your damage output in Skyrim with magic unless you use alchemy to make like a... To be comfortable, I need like a 400% extra damage potion. At least on legendary difficulty. I know I could probably turn the difficulty down, but I mean, that that's, a, that's its whole other conversation. The point is... This playthrough of Skyrim's really exposed that, like, the pieces are all there. They're just, like, put together wrong. And I think it's, like, it's a balance issue where the issue isn't that it's unbalanced. The issue is that they're too terrified of it being unbalanced. So it's, like, you know, they're worried that melee characters are going to feel like shit because, um, you know, magic characters are getting to do, like, fireball spam. But I think that's more an issue with melee being boring than it is an issue with the magic. Now, I have nothing especially bad to say about the magic in Skyrim. A lot of it... I do.
it makes sense, obviously it's going to be about spam with attacks like Fire Stream because it's just a flamethrower, so it works. And it also doesn't suffer from the stamina problem because it uses up Magicka no matter what. We have a very limited number of people who did any kind of robust magic playthrough in our lineup. It's actually kind of shocking. You don't need the restoration loop to reduce magicka cost. Only four items with fortify destruction 25% they stack linearly. Just falls behind on the damage side. Yeah, but then you're losing other enchantments is the issue. So you have no kind of health fortification, no kind of resistance fortification. Um, it's like you shouldn't need to have every single item that you're wearing have uh, fortify destruction or decrease destruction costs to make a viable destruction character. And you can probably get away with just like 75% um, spell reduction. But I mean, that's only like one thing, so it's like you're still losing out on other stuff. No, that's the thing. When I made my current character's loadout, I had the uh, two enchantments per item perk, and I have two enchantments on every single item that I'm wearing. But I think even then, the max that you can do with a with a magic character is inadequate to really make a fun build. You don't need HP if you don't get hit either. Okay. You haven't been doing the dungeons I've been doing. Literally, one Draugr with a bow can drop me in one shot. And I have 250 health, which is not a lot. I'm, I'm not saying that's a lot of health, because it isn't. But it's like, I have not seen Jizargo go down once in, like, the last 20 hours of playthrough. That's how absurdly overpowered he is. Meanwhile, I get one shot by, like, Draugr from across the room. Skyrim isn't the sort of game you can play no hit. Yeah, that's kind of the thing he's missing is that, like, he's assuming that you're not supposed to get hit in Skyrim when you're supposed to get hit a little bit. Like, on all playthroughs. Sounds like someone needs to use alteration spells. I do! You don't understand. I'm on legendary difficulty. I literally use uh, the, the flesh spells at the start of every fight. And not only that, I have 250 health and I have an armor rating of 500 because I have, like, busted Daedric gear on my hand. Like, okay, here's my build. I have the Falmer helmet on top of the Ethereal Crown because you can, that's, like, one of the few helmets you can stack with circlets. I have uh, heavy Daedric gloves and light Daedric boots. Don't ask about the light Daedric boots. They're anniversary content. But the point is, um, I, it's like, okay, so it's max tier gear that's been, like, Four times restoration loop, so it's like the cumulative armor rating is like 500. And then I have like 250 hit points, and I still get one shot from across the room, even with like the alterations. Like, honestly, the alteration spells don't add much art in the way of armor rating now. What are you doing playing legendary difficulty? Well, here's what I'm doing uh, my rule was minimum adept difficulty. Go up when you can. And so the idea is um, I'm comparing the way that the different playthroughs can handle each difficulty. And so, like, the melee character has no issues playing on legendary difficulty by himself. He doesn't even have a follower.
And I didn't use the restoration loop on the melee character either. That's the crazy part. He's just that strong. I'm not sure how the armor rating system works in Skyrim. They change it every game. I always have to I look up a lot of this stuff after the fact. Okay. Yeah, just tell me, like, give me some formulas. Armor rating. The actual protection your character will receive from the armor is dependent upon your skill. Yeah, we know that. Rating can be improved with smithing. The armor rating only reduces physical damage, not magical damage. Eat okay. Each point of armor rating reduces damage by 0.12%. Okay. Um, so their, your durability against physical attacks is proportional to 100 divided by 100 minus damage reduction percentage. This results in hyperbolic growth in your physical durability up to the cap of 80% damage reduction, giving a uh, five times multiplier to your physical durability. Thus, the more armor rating you have, the more each additional point of armor rating is worth. The graph displayed shows the multiplier to your physical durability relative to no armor based on the displayed armor rating. Assume you're wearing all four pieces of armor and have no other effects. So it caps at 80%. I mean, I, I guess it makes sense that you don't want 100% uh, armor rating reduction. So what is it, like 600 something is the max? Which I'm pretty close to when I use... um. I think I hit like 560 right now when I use, uh, I'm on Iron Flesh. I could use Ebony Flesh, I just don't like using the extra Magicka. And I have nothing to really compare it to since I'm not that well experienced in different kinds of magic systems and games. So I don't really have any major worthwhile complaints except for one major one that I'll get into later on. Magic in Skyrim takes advantage of the new dual-handed combat by letting you assign a spell to each hand like you would with weapons, but if you equip two of the same spell, you often get a special power attack that does something neat with a spell. It's like dual wielding, only instead of having four weapon subclasses, you have like 17, and every weapon type does like a completely different thing, and... I don't know, people overhype this part, like it's just... You basically have to dual cast illusion spells for them to work past a certain point. Well, okay, you're level 20. That says a lot. Um, so you have to dual cast illusion spells for them to work. A lot of it's just like the duration's longer. And then like some of it's like, yeah, you uh, like destruction's really the only one that benefits from dual casting. And um, the novice level destruction spells aren't like superficially different. Um, the apprentice level spells. I mean, they stagger if you have the perk, but they're also not that different. I guess it the difference for those is just speed. Um, and then the, like, the adept level spells, I mean, it's just like, it, it's a, a higher damage uh, version. So it's not like a, uh, it's not like a, what's that game? It's not like a Magicka game. Has anybody, anybody ever played Magicka? Uh, who hasn't been up? Fuck, this rotation doesn't make sense. In Magicka, you select a spell effect, and then you like you select a different spell effect, and it does like something completely different. So it's not like you stack the same spell effect twice and it does more damage. No, it's like you 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 cast life and then you cast water and it does like a wave of healing or some shit right anybody who doesn't complain about magic in skyrim is not a magic player which i mean no fault against you if you're not a magic player but there are literally i don't think a single person we've watched has done pure magic for their uh, video Unless it was private sessions. I don't know what his build was.
There were reviewers who thought that was how this game worked and Bethesda let them print that info. Yeah, that was the main thing from the marketing that I was like, so Bethesda allowed reviewers to walk away with the impression that like you would cast Firebolt with one hand and then you would cast like, I don't know, uh, like a frenzy spell or something and it would do like a, a frenzied fireball spell. But it's that, that, yeah, that's totally not how it works. There's no like spell combo ideas and in Morrowind, or er, not in Morrowind, but in, um, I guess in Morrowind, but not, there's no spell combos in Skyrim where you combine two effects to get a different spell. Where did Dispel go with mysticism being removed? Is Dispel still a thing in base Skyrim? I know Banish Daedra is a thing, but I don't think Dispel is actually in the base game. Yeah, it, it's all mods that add the spell magic. I was going to say, I, I've i seen Dispel spells before, but that was on probably modded playthroughs, so. Not even in the Anniversary Edition. But they did add Paralysis Rune, which is still broken. Paralysis Rune, I shit you not, it's an AoE, it's a cheaper Paralyze it is an AoE, and literally the only downside, the only reason it's an Adept instead of an Expert spell like normal Paralyze, is that it lasts 8 seconds instead of 10. It's one of the most broken things I've ever seen. It was like, oh no, I'm getting overwhelmed. I can literally Paralyze like half the enemies. The spell doesn't exist because there aren't any status effects it would apply to. Uh, you could use Dispel on, like, cloak spell effects, armor spell effects. Um, that's the main thing is, like, I need, I really want there to be a way where I can turn off the flame cloak after the fight's over. Because it's really annoying. It's a really annoying sound for something I have to use every fight. I didn't even know that existed. It's a, um, it's an anniversary edition thing. It's, it's not a good spell, by the way. And you have like three different damage types. While we're here, let me also explain just a little bit of how a lot of these magic spells were made. Trust me, this information will be useful later on. From what I can gather, Skyrim spells are made a lot like item effect spells are in Fallout. Basically, you choose your spell or make up your own, what type of spell it's going to be, and add your attributes to it. The what system the itself is incredibly user-friendly and very modular. Just as a hypothetical example, you could make a spell that is fired once and then stops on a target location that has the effect of restoring health with a magnitude of 20 HP over the course of 5 seconds. I assume he's talking about in the creation kit. With an area of so many feet diameter. Now, of course, that's not what I did. I just made this fucking mess you're looking at in the background. But the system itself is very easy to pick up and make something with. And remember, keep that in your heads. That's going to be important later on. Now, with all the time it's taken us... Uh, why wouldn't you just say that when it's important later on? Because it literally took you, like, the sum of 15 seconds. Is he talking about Morrowind? I assume he's talking about Creation Kit and he's never played Morrowind. I mean, this guy very clearly is not a magic user. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clarify. He's probably talking about how spells are made in the Creation Kit. Which is somewhat true. Flip your VTuber so it's looking at the video. Well, okay, here's the thing. I am right now physically looking at the chat. I am now looking at the video. You can tell where I'm looking based on the VTuber. To get through that conversation, we've completed the dungeon and received the Titanite slab. So we're going to head back to Whiterun and give it to the wizard. After that... I like to call it the Titanite slab. Uh, fucking Dark Souls nerd. Um... So yeah, if you haven't figured it out, I usually just stare at chat. And okay, to clarify, I have two monitors. Left monitor is just the the browser, and then I have to like tab up the notepad to see it. Um, the right browser has OBS, not Streamlabs, because Streamlabs is dog shit. Um, in many senses of the word dog shit. Oh, actual open broadcast software. Uh, on OBS, I can see the video. I'll probably do the 20-hour Skyrim video. 
I don't want to make a 20 hour video. It was bad enough with 12 hours. So I can see the video on the right monitor next to the chat. So that's usually why you'll see me staring over here instead of like genuinely watching the video is because I can see the video on both monitors. I can see everything on the second monitor. But yeah, if you're using Streamlabs, don't. They're scumbags. That, there's a bit of a comeuppance at the keep. Apparently there's been a live dragon sighting at a nearby watchtower. A guard comes in saying that it's fast and that it's big. And they all sends us and some troops in to fight it. This is actually kind of exciting. What if it's that dragon we saw in the beginning? Oh my god, it destroyed the entire watchtower. This guy just said it swooped down and- Are you gonna mention that the watchtower is like destroyed before this point? Grab two people. This is it. We hear the dragon screams echo across the plains. This is what we've all been waiting for since the promotional materials back in 2010. And I am so Damn. very ready. I'm, I'm pumped. This dragon has finally met its maker. This has got to be great. Fighting dragons is supposed to be one of the toughest things in fantasy ever since early Dungeons and Dragons. Hell, ever since Tolkien, even etched into the runes of Norse mythology, is fighting dragons supposed to be the most grand form of combat. And there it is. Mimolnir. Not who I was expecting, but either way, let's get into some epic dragon combat. Get a giraffe! Get a nope. Stream muted. I jam this. Oh no, it's the Curb Your Enthusiasm theme. I mean, he's not wrong. Dragons are one of the easiest enemies in the game to fight. It was a little, it was a little, it lasted for a long time, but I find the joke is funny on its own. Because it's, yeah, it's, the encounter is like super hype. Like, Bethesda very clearly was like trying to make the player get excited for what they were about to do. And then you actually fight a dragon and it's pathetic. Exceptionally pathetic. Let Cor let Corey come schizo live on stream, please. You guys are going on like a concerted a, a, a concerted uh, effort to get Corey live, huh? It's not that I don't trust Corey. I just expect him to say something, uh, on terms of service friendly. Approval. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, that that genuinely caught me off guard. Is a full highest rating that I can issue, ten out of ten, and it easily earns the badass seal of approval. Um, okay, so I want to state for the record, 
I had no clue that he was going to do the badass steal of approval thing. It is literally a pure coincidence that uh, that meme is in both th that this video and our streams. Yeah, I didn't do that. He did that. I literally, like, I went down, like, my head was on my desk. That's why I re returned to, like, the default position, because I, I went out of frame of the webcam. Somehow, no reviewer talks about how weapon enchantments are affected by player perks just like spells are, so cost reductions and damage increases apply fully, making them absolutely OP. I don't think most reviewers really understand how Skyrim's mechanics works. I mean, I barely understand how Skyrim's mechanics works, and I'm, like, doing a fairly comprehensive video on Skyrim. Skyrim's issue is that it doesn't explain how the fuck anything works in-game. Yeah, bro, you just got exposed. Cope. What? What? No, I mean, like, okay, hang on. L let me understand your logic here. Let's say I was intentionally, like, doing the badass seal of approval thing because I was leading up to what isn't the last stream that we're doing, right? Because we have, like, at least another week of streams to do. Like, okay, it would be funny to, like, to have that gag in every stream and then, like, have it in the video. But, like, genuinely, it wasn't, like, an intentional thing. Like, how would that expose me? Is he... Is he seriously going to respond to that? Yes, motherfucker. What? You say some shit? You clap? I clap back, motherfucker. Talk shit, get shot. Motherfucker. I'd play the song, but I would get claimed. But I love the song, Talk Shit, Get Shot. I will play a half second for you. All right, that's all you get to hear. <laughs> Any more and I would get claimed. No. Don't even kid yourself into thinking this. Dragons can be fun if you turn down the difficulty so they're not so damage spongy. Like, okay, the coolest thing about dragons is high level archery, if you use the restoration loop, you can like one shot them. Well, not one shot them, but you can like hit them really hard and they like crash land. Or like you smoke them with a fireball. That's always fun. Talk shot, get shit. Is a spectacular dragon fight. This is not. This is an oversized health bar that can fly. Yes. You want to know a dragon? Yes. 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 Okay, here's my issue with dragons in Skyrim. I think most of the dragons you fought should probably have either been getting revived at the gravesite or should have been, like, at the dragon layers. And then, like, they do the... Like, there's something I always think about. Dragon's Dogma intro. You know in the Dragon's Dogma intro? Uh, what the fuck is that? No, like the actual game intro. Before this. Like you walk out here. It shows itself. And they have like battlements set up and like they're genuine they are genuinely at war with this dragon. It would be cool if like part of like the um part of like the setup for uh just dragon encounters at like their layers is like setting up for battle and like baiting them into areas with like um with like siege equipment to fight them. Dragon fighting in Skyrim really is. It's waiting for the thing to stop doing its breath attack for half of its HP, running around trying to get a melee hit or popping off worthless arrows into the wild blue yonder. Then yeah, the most annoying thing about dragons is sometimes they just fuck off. 
but you like stay in combat with them. Did Skyrim do to dragons what Oblivion did to Oblivion Gates? Yes. Uh, dragons are like blatantly Oblivion Gates 2.0 in terms of what they're supposed to be. Then bum rushing and checking health potions once it hits half and swinging your melee weapons at it like your shoulders just got dislocated. You want a good dragon fight? Go fight Calibit in Dark Souls or Grigori in Dragon's Dogma. This doesn't even come close to either of those fights. And here's the reason. Here's the chief problem and sole cause for the issues with the dragons in Skyrim. They're generated, generic enemies. They're yes. The problem is, okay, you need one dragon shout for each word of power, right? There's, But there's so many words of power that you have to have so many dragon encounters so that you can unlock all of them. I always thought... You have, I brought this up last stream. You have a radiant system for making events happen based on what the player does. Why aren't the dragon encounters based on when the player learns words of power? Instead of, like, just when you fast travel. <laughs> They're not carefully crafted boss fights with unique mechanics or attacks catered to each individual dragon. No, they're calculated by the engine to match your level, made in such a way that they can be chosen from a leveled list of samey, cookie-cutter encounters that change their skin every 10 hours. It's like... Yes. It can be spawned in a complete random instead of having to be carefully placed around the map. The problem with the dragons in Skyrim is that they're just another enemy. They're just a big spell-casting lizard that can hop around on rooftops. Yes, are they animals or are they sentient creatures that can actually take over the world? They're not these devastating world eaters or these city ruining monsters. I like, um... I know this is modern, so people hate me making this example. I like this guy. In this Valheim. No, 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 not a tutorial. Just fight the fucking guy. Because, like, a big factor in fighting this guy is that you have to set up the area to prepare to fight for him. He, he used to be really busted, though, and super unfun to fight. But yeah, it's like, you have to, like, sail to the mountain that he lives on, and then you have to set up the arena to fight him in, and then you have to get the three dragon eggs, which are, like, all super heavy, to summon him. I think it's just a, it's a, it's a cool fight, because it happens once. And contrasting to what the making of Skyrim wants you to believe, they are not that big for fantasy dragons. They are just so... <sighs> Especially once you get dragon rent and can basically never have to deal with them flying ever again. Yes. That's the issue with dragon rent, is that, um... Well, I mean, you kind of need it, because, like, there's so many instances where they would just never land... Is there a worse game with dragons in comparison to Skyrim? I guess, like, World of Warcraft? <laughs> <laughs> like, you get just into tab targeting? The worst part is, even, that there are specially named dragons. The, the wyvern thing is such old news. Nobody gives a fuck if they're not actually dragons. That's what the game calls them. That's what I'm going to call them. <clears throat> I don't give a shit. Hey, you asked me for a worse example of dragons. World of Warcraft fits the bill. <laughs> dragons, and select like dragon spawning areas, and they're still just normal dragons. Think of all the hype an Elder Scrolls player would have had to have had, an Elder Scrolls veteran even, would have had to have had, seeing that dragons were finally going to be in an Elder Scrolls game. Only to be met with flying salamanders. <sighs> I yes. Either way, once we're done killing Lizard O'Malley over here, we figure out that we have the power to absorb dragon souls. We're the dragon born, a hero of myth, able to kill health by, I mean, dragons like Noah. It would be interesting. Here's their issue. 
Alduin is like exactly the same as every other dragon. He's just a reskin, right? I think that's an issue. He either needs to be bigger or he needs to be like a genuine uh a genuine dragon encounter. I like that there like occasionally in the chat there'll just be some guy who like puts in like uh talking about fucking the the sh shandification thing. Uh <laughs> I don't know why. Why do people participate in the chat if they're, like, not live? Like, that guy is, like, at least an hour and a half behind. So it's like, I can't respond to him because he's not going to see that I read his message until, like, 90 minutes from now. <laughs> Other. We can now use the Thum, which is another new big addition to Skyrim. I'm not going to spend too much time on the Thum because it's essentially just a cooldown power like those in Oblivion, but the way it's broken down into three parts and needs to be collected is fun in my opinion. Collectibles are always not- I was impressed the first time that I exited a dungeon with a shortcut. And the hundredth. That That's the energy I'm getting from this. Like, oh, there's three tiers, but like the cooldowns are super punishing. At him in chat. Yeah, I guess that would be the way to get his attention. Yeah, or like, bringing up the jargon thing. Not a bad thing in these big open world games. Then I like just the sense of progression from getting one word to the next word to the next word. Okay, so that's the issue with the live streams, is if you're, if you're here live, um, and I, like, and you have to leave or do something, then you either miss like a, a shit ton of context or you just like get behind. So I, I, I don't understand that feel. Um, It was like the same thing with the premiere. There was like, I want to be live with the chat, but I can't watch all 12 hours of this video. So it's like, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a pain moment, but you know, after the stream's over, then it won't be and finally having the full shout and whatever cool power it does. Once we start heading back to tell the Jarl the good news, we get screamed at by a bunch of old people calling themselves the Greybeards, who are summoning us to their fortress. But before we go and figure all that part out, we head over back to Jarl Balin, who rewards us for our kill with the title of thank- Balin. 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 Jarl Balin. 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 Swag. Name and a companion and an axe. Lydia is supposed to be the first companion in Skyrim. Based on what? Oh, wait, I did the thing. Based? Based on what? I mean, you could e you could equally say that Findel is also supposed to be the first companion. Depends on whether or not you do the quest in Riverwood. I don't... And that's the thing, is, like, I don't think once in the entire, like, shit that we've... That we've read about Elder Scrolls... Seen a thing where, like, Todd Howard was, like, sitting down and he was like, Yeah, you were supposed to get, like, Lydia first, but there was, like, a lot of people who weren't getting Lydia. And, uh, it was really, like, harming our ability to, uh, tell the story. <laughs> All right, let's tell him. What does he think that... What is he basing this off of? And an axe. Lydia is supposed to be the first companion in Skyrim, which does companions rather differently than Fallout and a bit differently from Oblivion, not to mention other RPGs like Pillars of Eternity. In fact, it's a little bit more like Morrowind than anything. Really? Okay, I'm gonna... Uh, I'm gonna hard disagree there. How do I approach this one? Morrowind didn't have companions. Morrowind had escort quests, and that was like the extent of it. And you could like command humans, but they weren't like really like mechanical companions. 
Oblivion had companions, but it was mostly just like you're telling a mage's guild apprentice to follow you around. They don't carry anything. They don't do anything you tell them to do. Fallout 3 was where like the actual companion idea really forged into something useful. And then like Skyrim was like a step back because it was less like character companions and more just like generic NPCs. To the point that like you had one companion in Tribunal. You mean like the pack rat? The hired merc in Tribunal? Oh, okay. I had no clue about that. But I mean like I don't know, that's, that's kind of... It feels like a stretch to say, in my opinion. But yeah, it's like, don't use companions in Morrowind. You don't want to use the fucking Morrowind. You really want to lead some guy through, with, through the Morrowind pathfinding? Like, what if you're doing House Telvani quests? You could get your boy stuck in the Mushroom House. Well, I had this thought. Um, Skyrim companions are so generic, right? They are literally just NPCs that follow you around. So why isn't it just that... Why can't you just make a companion out of literally every NPC? Because most companions don't have like specialized dialogue for literally anything. None of them will comment on anything that's going on in the story. So it's like, you really could just make literally every NPC in the game a possible companion. And you would have to add like a grand total of like 20 extra lines of just all the NPCs going, ooh, ah, whenever you like, um, whenever you like find a tower under the earth that tells a, a, a grand, a grand story. Like that's how not notable the companions are. Like the notable companions in Skyrim are Jazargo, because he's a cat, and De Dictherius, because he's an Argonian. Like, it, 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 it's a unique racial companion, basically, is what makes a companion special in, in Skyrim. Like, the only one of note is Serana. And even then, like, Serana is, like, half of a Fallout companion. Zargo isn't the only Khajiit companion. Oh yeah, there was there's the, there is the other guy that's a warrior. So I, I guess never mind. Jazargo is special for other reasons though. He's probably the best um companion in the game. Because he has magic and he scales forever. Skyrim has very shallow companions. If there are companion quests, I haven't found them, and I've looked around, trust me. The companions don't really have anything to offer aside from their carrying capacity and their primary skills. And there aren't really that many special recruitment requirements that I've found for a lot of them. Yeah, it's like, you do some guy a favor, and now he's willing to FOLLOW YOU TO THE DEATH! That's why I always thought that, like, the Dragonborn must have, like, bend will before he actually gets the shout. That he's just, like... He's such a seductive, or she if you want to, they're such a seductive individual that like, just a minor favor removes all need for self-preservation. So the best and most notable thing about them is that they are- Oh yeah, that is kind of the premise of Knights of the Old Republic too. ...are very varied, and there are a lot of them. So, you know, at least we- Well, yeah, and it's like, some of them have jobs. Like, Findel has a job. We have the variety. And I I'm willing to hand wave all that stuff just because there are a lot of them, and Skyrim is a special case example that I. Okay, so you're willing to. Oh my god, what? varied and there are a lot of them that many special recruitment requirements that i've found for a lot of them so the best and most notable thing about them is that they are very varied and there are a lot of them so you know at least we have the variety 
And I, I'm willing to hand wave all that stuff just because there are a lot of them. And okay, so Skyrim companions, they get the they get the clear bill because there's like 50 fucking generic Nord companions that you can recruit. Findell's probably paid by the hour and chopping wood all day barely makes enough money for food, especially if your speech is low. Not uh, No, not really. A, a day of chopping wood can make you quite a bit of money. They pay you decently to chop wood. Like, if you chop wood for an IRL hour, which is like eight hours or something in game, um, you'll walk away with like a couple thousand gold. But you you forget, Findell is a homeowner in, in Riverwood. How do people have who run mills have that much money? Well, it's it's two hundred gold for twenty sawed logs, which they have an infinite supply of. But yeah, if you actually scrutinize like the uh, the honest jobs that you can get, um, it doesn't make sense that there's literally any poor people, or it doesn't make sense that these mills can stay afloat. Well, and it's like, who is the mill selling the firewood to? Like, why does the mill need so much chopped firewood? There's only one inn in Riverwood. Like... Riverwood has to have enough fucking chopped firewood to supply, like, the entirety of the hold. But it's like, where's the carts of just firewood going around everywhere? Like, that doesn't make sense to me. They, Everybody who uses firewood would source it locally. So it's like Riverwood's mill is just supplying firewood to Riverwood. Skyrim as a special case ex like okay why would you pre-chop the firewood before shipping it though that would just make more issues you would just ship lumber to places and then they would chop their own firewood assuming that they don't just cut the trees themselves example that I'll get into later but one thing I'm not going to hand wave away is the lack of functionality these companions have. There are no commands for what equipment you want them to have, what di Sure. But not really. Like, what equipment you want them to have? Literally, Jizargo had a better progression than my character, because he actually got armor and weapons and stuff. If you want them to have a specific weapon, you could just give it to them. I assume what he's talking about is um, in Fallout, you can specify whether a companion uses um, uses ranged or melee or what have you. But honestly, like, is that really, like, is that as big a deal as they're not being really, like, um, any unique companions? Didn't they add favorites and anniversary? What do you mean favorites? Favorites for companions? I don't know. Let's find out. They were talking... They, they did have favorites, I think, for the companions in the mod video. I don't know if they actually implemented it. Because I've never thought to try and favorite something with a companion. You're that one from the college. Uh, uh, Khajiit guards your back. I know you can't see it. Jezargo only has so much room to carry things. No, there is not a way to favorite. Khajiit will follow.
I think it's weird that they mill stuff for Whiterun in Riverwood. It seems more prudent that where the um where the Haunting Brew Meadery is, sh that should be where the where the mill is. Because you don't you don't send chopped wood down the river; it's gonna rot. You send full logs. Chopped wood has to be transported by cart. Distance you want them to keep. What fighting style they should use? Nada. Remember how Fallout New Vegas had that nifty companion wheel that expanded the orders you could give your companions exponentially? Yeah, mm -hmm. wave that away. That's gone and there's nothing to replace it. We're just going to roll with Lydia for now because sword and board is nice, but two sword and boards is better. Now that we... I think you should always get a companion that complements your playstyle. So if you do sword and board, you should have a ranged companion. And if you're ranged, then you should have a, uh, a tank character. Maybe it's because they're closer to Falkreath. Okay, the logging camp should be where Riverwood is, but the mill should be near the city. If someone needs firewood for their house, you don't sell them a full tree's length of logs. Yes, I understand that. But you also don't ship recut firewood. The mill uses river power. Okay, but there's a flowing river by Whiterun. Like, literally, the waterfalls continue to where I'm talking about, which is where the Haunting Brew Meter is. Why are you obsessed with this decade-old subpar game? Because it's fun, and because people like it. It's called content, my guy. We have Lydia. It's time to go ahead and climb a mountain. And yes, we can climb this mountain. Up to the Dragonborn retirement community that the Greybeards live in. Greybeards... T um... Excuse me? Curious if you've seen ESO's three-hour interview with Ted Peterson. First half's about the Wayward Realms, but the latter half's a pretty deep dive into Elder Scrolls lore. No, I haven't seen it. I've, I've seen it recommended. I haven't seen it. What is the obsession around Bethesda games anyways? What's the attraction that draws millions to watch hundreds of analysis videos on this one game? Was this one specific game company? I can answer that question. The Elder Scrolls V, Skyrim. The sales climbed to 20 million after two years, and in 2016, the game director, Todd Howard, confirmed the game sold over 30 million copies. So it's popular. People are looking for this kind of content, and then these, and then a lot of people try to provide that content. Because that's sort of the game on YouTube, is you predict what people want to watch and you make it for them. Also, uh, like, nobody in chat talked about this. Mountain. Up to the Dragonborn retirement community that the Greybeards live in. The, dra the Greybeards are not Dragonborn. Um, actually... Greybeards teach us about the Thum and give us a few new shouts that we can use for our little nefarious adventures, and tell us to go use them to retrieve the Horn of Jurgen Windcaller, who's some dude, sending us through another dungeon. And where you hear dungeon, I hear opportunity to have shitty editing for 20 minutes. So we're gonna talk about dungeons while we do this dungeon, and yes, I am going to say the word dungeon as many times as I dungeoning, please. Alright. Uh, five minute piss break. Back at five after the hour.
I was, I should turn off the VTuber thing. Um. While I'm away. Because it is kind of creepy. Is he shitting? I was gone for two minutes. In that two minutes, I got something to drink. So, no. Is a full, highest rating that I can issue. 10 out of 10. And it easily earns the badass seal of approval. I'm always watching you, chat. Hang on. I think the VTuber software fucked up. No, I would disagree. Serana is not the first companion for most people. Most people don't rush to do Dawn Guard. I mean, who knows what the first companion is for most people, but I would imagine that it's not Serana. Do most people take a companion? Well, basing it on the videos we've seen, I would say no. Wouldn't it be Findel? I would imagine it would be Findel. Findel or Lydia. Uthgird? Yeah, I can imagine Uthgird being a thing. That depends on if you go to the Bannered Mare. What's the best NPC to marry? Yasolda. You get you marry Yasolda before you do the Sanguine quest, because it's funny. Just she's the one who sells you the engagement ring during the Sanguine quest. <laughs> also, somebody probably should have pointed out that um they don't do the engagement ring thing in Skyrim. Also, they straight washed my character. They said that I was marrying a man when clearly my current character is a lesbian. My character's no hetero, okay? She has sex with Jazargo, but like. <laughs> but she says no hetero afterwards, so it doesn't count. No, it's not a cloning defect, okay? I'm a clone of a straight man. I'm a clone of a guy who liked sex with women. That means I also like sex with women. What happens in the Sanguine Quest when you're a female? Is it still a Hag Raven? Yes. Although I speech checked my way through the entire quest. Okay, that's it. Time to lay off the tray. <laughs> Touch grass now! Water! 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 
Shame to the people who haven't seen all the streams and don't know the water thing. Are you here for the synth? Uh, I'm here to pick up an order. Two large. So I can drop in MP4s, is... but Fuck they you. don't play sound. Are you here for the synth? But it has sound, it just didn't play it. Or if it did, I didn't see it. Are you here for the synth? Oh no, it is playing sound, I just can't uh, hear it. I'm here it. to pick up an order. Two large pepperoni and a calzone. Name is... Fuck you. Interesting. Why can't I hear it? I'm going to play Warframe, Plat Pat. Which frame should I play? I haven't played Warframe in a long time. I don't know who's good. I liked Ember. She's not good, but she's fun. Okay, so I put that in. And let's see. I add... A video to it. God, this is so much work. I'm not even sure. Most of these videos would not be safe to play on the stream. That was sort of the thing was, I was like trying to figure out how you play videos through OBS, and it was like total shit. That's why we're watching the stuff on YouTube this time. Also, Frost is an actual wheelchair frame. Fuck off, chat. Frost is only good for the defense missions. All right, we're well after five after. Let's uh, get this bowl rolling. How many times is I dungeoning, please? Grinch. Skyrim marks a fairly major turning point in Bethesda's dungeon design. It's their first game to have had dedicated level designers in Oblivion, and was the first of. Mm. Oh, that stings. I forget that you guys are talking about the the frame frost and not the horse frost. Yeah, I'm really bothered that people like bought that lie that um that like Oblivion didn't have level designers. When again, pull my Oblivion spreadsheet. What does not having level designers mean? So the the popular theory is Oblivion had no um Oblivion had like all the dungeons were made by like one guy, right? So here's a guy I showed him off in the video. Senior artist and level designer, April 2003 to February 2006, which means he only worked on Oblivion. Creator of the Oblivion Plains, a series of levels consisting of 13 worlds that wove together dozens of interior and exterior levels, designed a random dungeon system for the Oblivion Plains. Responsibilities included modeling and textures, design of creation and combat, and there's there's a show more, but it's not in the archive. Um, so that's one level designer. Let us load up the next one. Okay, so the way Oblivion 
the way the Oblivion game gates specifically work is there's seven types, and each time you go through the gate, it picks one of those seven types of Oblivion gates. But they are they are like genuinely engineered. No, these guys were dedicated level designers. There were six dedicated level designers who worked on Oblivion. I think he meant dungeon-only level designers. Yes. Here's this guy. Uh, I designed and built over 60 dungeons using pre-existing art assets for the core product. Responsibilities included AI scripting, scheduling, layout, building, lighting, cluttering, trap placement, encounters, trap and activator scripting, and AI path building. Anytime he says AI, he's referring to the AI that's in the, in the dungeon. I also created and polished more than 100 dungeon exteriors and modeled, textured, and animated no numerous in-game assets including world props, doors, containers, traps, furniture, and town buildings. Oh, but you're thinking, oh, that's only two. Here's number three. I'm not going to read this one, but this guy has like a whole post about what it was like to be a dungeon designer. This is Michael Ryan. And then you have the guy from the documentary that was also a dungeon designer, so that's four. Wait, I heard years ago that it was all procedural. No, all the dungeons in Oblivion are handcrafted. The world initially was procedural, and then they went through it and um, modified the procedural world into a more handcrafted world. But the dungeons themselves were manually put together. But then, like, when Oblivion, or when Skyrim's marketing came around, Todd Howard told this lie, and it was a lie, that there were only two dungeon designers who worked on Oblivion. And that Skyrim will be different because we've got a whole team now. Did they procedurally... No, they actually manually handcrafted Skyrim. They didn't, like... The workflow didn't work for them with Oblivion, so they just went back to, like, handcrafting the world. Your fate is in the chat's hands. No, it's not... Of what's becoming a new trend with Bethesda's dungeons. In the time before Elder Scrolls V, dungeons in Bethesda games usually weren't made so much with level design in mind, but in such a way that they portray either a story or reasonably look like what they're trying to be. It's a hard thing to explain, but let me try and use some examples. And by examples, I mean hypotheticals. Instead of making a dungeon that was themed after, say, a factory, that worried about things most games do like enemy and loot placement and making sure the player can't get lost and get through the area smoothly, but those the level designers would focus more on just making the level seem like an actual factory, at the expense of actual level design. You can kind of say they focused more on authenticity, at least until Skyrim, which is more focused on game design. Now on paper, this isn't a bad thing at all. If anything, Bethesda needed to focus more on the gameplay of their dungeons and can also have benefited from smoothing out and better- Which isn't even necessarily true. A lot of Fallout 3 dungeons are, um, are not just like, oh yeah, this is just a factory and that's it. Like, for instance, I like to, I like the, um, the supermarket one where they have like the shelves that you can get on top of to navigate around the area. Like if all they were trying to do was replicate just a supermarket, then that wouldn't have been in there. They're directing the player. Anybody who's uh, you know, gotten lost in one of the vaults in the 3D Fallout games, you know, unlike me, I've never done that before, you'll understand why I say this. However, what these new dedicated level designers have done is make every single level a long line that either loops around on itself or ends in an exit which is a very nice, convenient touch that makes all I loved it the first time. I loved it the hundredth time. Is Will still gone? Damn it, Will's still gone. So it's, harder to, it's harder to pull up the clip. I don't think that's actually going to stop me.
Oh, I didn't put a timestamp. Damn. All right, so it's not going to be very difficult to find for a joke. Well, the levels seem less open, less authentically like a dungeon or a fort or a whatever it's going for, and more just like a level that's themed after those things. And like I said, they often don't leave as much explorable space to the player, so it can get a little bit boring running through these lines day in and day out. Yes. Alright, so, um... One thing I noted yesterday was... I did the dungeon, um, Valthum. Uh, because I was getting the Dragon Priest masks. And Valthum is the one where you have to get the three opaque vessels. Um, and then you fight the Dragon Priest at the end. You, like, pour the vessels of blood into it. You sit on the throne and the Dragon Priest shows up. If that, if you've done it, that should jog your memory. Well, I missed the second vessel the first time. Uh, that dungeon's full of, like, it's a straight line, but occasionally there will be, like, a two-way intersection. And the, the two-way intersection just goes off to, like, one room, right? So it's like a straight line that's like really... F it's like a hair that has a, like a lot of split ends. Um, so I missed the second vessel. And... Um, no, it is linear. Because I got to the end, and I only had two. So I had to run through the entire dungeon again. Everything's already dead. Everything's already looted. All I'm doing is just backtracking through the dungeon. And it made me realize... Skyrim's dungeons are designed to be to not need you to backtrack. That's pretty obvious, right? But when you do have to backtrack in Skyrim's dungeons, it is awful because there's nothing to do. Whereas when you have to backtrack through like an Oblivion dungeon, you might see like new areas that you didn't explore. You might see like a hidden thing that you didn't loot before. That doesn't happen in Skyrim because you can't mi you can't really miss anything. So, the times where you do have to backtrack through a dungeon, you're just running. But yeah, I, I would... I think a, a hair with split ends is an excellent way to describe Valthum. I'd also like to address one of the mission statements Bethesda had when it comes to dungeon design in Skyrim. In the making of Skyrim that I've already mentioned, they said that their plans for dungeons in- Which is a terrible documentary. By the way. But if you're thorough in Oblivion, you still always have to backtrack. Sure, but you also have, like, movement skills in Oblivion. So it's like- um, it doesn't even take long to backtrack in, in Oblivion. Like, people really overemphasize how much, like, backtracking you have to do. I never noted it, noted it as, like, an issue with the dungeons. My issue with the dungeons was almost always that there were way too many damage sponge enemies. In Skyrim was to have each one be unique and memorable. And as much as I'm sure everyone wants me to say, I think they failed totally, I don't think I can say that since they didn't totally fail, and I wouldn't say they succeeded either. I'll say, rather, that they have succeeded. A lot of dungeons I couldn't remember to save my life, but a lot of other dungeons do have something neat going on, and I can even remember one by name, which is a pretty big deal for me since before this video I could not fathom how much I didn't care about the Elder Scrolls. One thing I've yet to see, however, is any risk-taking dungeons. Dungeons that do something that's a bit out there to separate themselves from the rest of the dungeons. In this game and in other games. For example, or I guess for hypothetical, a dungeon with no enemies. You'd think, hey, that sounds really dumb, but I think that can be... The, the closest you get is, um, Yingle Barrow. No dungeon enemy meme? Yeah, what is with it, with the no dungeon, the no enemy dungeon? Like, why are there so, like, why is this the second video we've watched where somebody thinks that a no enemy dungeon would work? Like, this is the game where every puzzle is super basic, and you're telling me that you think they could actually pull off a no enemy dungeon? What would it be? 
you can't do platforming because platforming in Elder Scrolls sucks. There's no mechanics around it. You can't do puzzles because the average person can't figure out puzzles. Twilight Sepulchre is an almost no enemy dungeon, but it ha it does have enemies and it's really boring. Trap filled. Traps are really easy to work around in Skyrim though. So I was like, defend my honor. I found your no enemy dungeon. I learned when to stop arguing, though. I don't think Lonnie even gets Lonnie sometimes. Used to great effect with the right atmosphere. I got really excited because I thought I had found a dungeon that had nothing in it but a story and some neat environments that was a little bit creepy and depressing, but after a short walk I was back to taking out mages and skeletons. Okay, so he's in Illinalta's Deep, which is the uh, Azura Star dungeon, and uh, not only is that dungeon spe specifically stated to have enemies in it, um, but like, no, you walk 10 feet and you fight the first skeleton. like every other dungeon. Another thing I've noticed about dungeons is that a lot of them are defaulting to Drogar and bandits. Not all of them of course, but I saw these two enemies plus or minus skeletons more than anything else during any of my dungeon crawls. Un um... Dwemer dungeons? Balmer dungeons? Conjurer dungeons? I mean, you can find these places. It's not difficult. The Dwemer dungeons literally have a different exterior. Another another thing I've noticed about Skyrim Dungeons is that they all are surprisingly well lit. I have a feeling, or at least I had a feeling, that at one point dark or pitch black dungeons were planned for the game because of the inclusion of spells like Mage Light. Oh, that's totally the reason. It's not because there were light spells before that point. I think there should be more non-combat su substantial content in Skyrim, so I agree there should be more enemy-less dungeons. Sure, but you have to start with what the mechanics of the dungeon are going to be because I, i've got i got bad news for you if the dungeon is literally just i walk into a room and there's a journal and i read the journal about the tragedy of this dungeon and then i walk into the next room and there's a journal and i get more story about the tragedy of this dungeon i'm sorry that's going to be a terrible fucking dungeon They did show it off in, a, in promotional videos. What you're referring to is probably when they shoot the like the mage light thing down the hallway in Bleak Falls Barrow, and it's not that much darker than what's in the game currently. I always liked doing lighting mods though for for stuff. I think that's a pretty um, good thing to add to the game. Those would likely involve puzzles. Uh, <laughs> you really want to, you really think, you really think they're going to make a dungeon of just puzzles with what, with what they have access to. Cause we were talking about it before. What we were talking about before was, um, with, uh, fuck, I got thrown off there. There's no puzzle mechanics. For them to really build off of. I should do it in order. So. There's not really any way for them to make more complex puzzles. There was a guy who like contacted me. and was like. Um, I like design escape rooms. And like the average person is stupid. Which I get. Okay. I understand that. The average person is stupid. Um, but you know. You can't do complex puzzles because literally all all Bethesda has access to is press E to interact and pressure plates.
So it's not like, um... Why is this a kid's video? It's not like this this game, which actually has like mechanics that it can build puzzles around. You can do a lot with pressure plates and buttons. You can't do everything. But it seems that this never made it to release, and my suspicions were solidified when I noticed that Dark Dungeons were on the list of things the team wanted to do with Skyrim that they did get done in the Game Jam week Bethesda did. Okay, that's not necessarily like stuff they wanted to do, that's stuff some guy wanted to do. After Skyrim's release. They didn't just like fuck up, oh whoops, the brightness is too high. Well, I, I guess we'll just have to like, we'll have to work in the, the several months needed to do Dark Dungeons next time. No, it's like explicitly a design decision to not have Dark Dungeons. What's wrong with enemies? Fallout winks the environmental storytelling thing. Because the, um, the form that environmental storytelling takes is you walk in a room, there's a journal, you read the journal, you walk into the next room, there's a journal. You read the journal. And it's like, if I wanted that, I would just read a book. Just saying, but if you open up the hood on these games, it's incredibly easy to make a dark dungeon. So I doubt that the lack of inclusion of such things wasn't because of an engine limitation as much as it was just a design one. So to shorten all this, dungeons are kind of- Whoa, he owned me. Hit or miss. I personally would have preferred if more time was placed into making them feel like the location that they each take place in, instead of worrying about how well I'll move around it. Though I do appreciate that Bethesda was at least trying to correct the problems levels in Fallout 3 and New Vegas had. Oh, and apparently they were able to get those fire arrows working in the game jam. That's nice. Alright, so we've made it to the Horn of Jurgen Wind- God damn it, I've been bamboozled! Okay, so some wily fucker who's about to get a good old fashioned head smashing has run up and stolen the shit I need. And wants me to meet them at the Sleepy Giant Inn. Turns out it's Delphine, that lady from when we gave Ferengar the Dragonite Slab who was all hooded and conspicuous. What a surprise that isn't. Okay, so Delphine takes us to- How many people noticed that it was Delphine? I mean, it's not very surprising, but I wouldn't say that it's like- Oh yeah, everybody knew it was Delphine from the Riverwood Inn. To her secret lair and does a bit of exposition and with a lot of detail so let me tackle everything i need that's a no he does not sound like Solfak. everybody sounds like everybody to uh the casual audience but i guess i have to say it just doesn't quite feel like the thieves guild oh man they sound so similar you know? Like, it's one of the more compelling guild stories, don't get me wrong. An important one at a time. He genuinely sounds more like Dishonored Wolf. Shit about them. There's no Garrus or Rex, no Liara or Tali, no Joker or Ken That's what Dishonored Wolf sounds like. Okay, first off, Delphine tells us that she's a blade. He sounds like Civvy. You best be shitposting. Everybody... I, I do know that everybody gets accused of sounding like Leafy, which is really dumb because he sounds like nobody. Yeah, this is definitely who he sounds like. 
We get to see Kyle's childhood home when it's populated by sand people who give you the best addition to this game and the series, the Wookiee Bowcaster. Yeah, he really sounds like Civi-11. Make it more absurd. What's the most absurd comparison you can do? Now, I'm not an expert, but after playing Oblivion, it was to my understanding that the Blades were all about protecting those with dragon's blood, which is why they cared so much about protecting the Emperor in that game. And now in Skyrim, apparently, they've shifted over to becoming a dragon bounty hunting service or something. Which isn't a huge stress, considering Skyrim takes place like 200 years after Oblivion. But what I don't get is why they are hunting dragons if dragons have only just now been returning like they did. They just hunt skeletons. For if I could face palm, I would. Like, how do you actually fuck this port this point up? They draw so much attention to, like, why the Blades are the way they are. ...service or something? Now, I'm not an expert, but a surprise that isn't. Okay, so Delphine takes us to her secret lair and does a bit of exposition. And with a lot of detail, so let me tackle everything I need that's a, an important one at a time. Okay, first off, Delphine tells us that she's a Blade. Now, I'm not an expert, but after playing Oblivion, it was to my understanding that the Blades were all about protecting those with dragon's blood, which is why they cared so much about protecting the Emperor in that game. And now in Skyrim, apparently, they've shifted over to becoming a dragon bounty hunting service or something. Which isn't a huge stress, considering Skyrim takes place like 200 years after Oblivion. But what I don't get is why they are hunting dragons if dragons have only just now been returning. Like, they did they just hunt skeletons? Or, like, what am I missing here? All right, so you're missing a big part of it, and uh, I really hope the next sentence is him. Go is like the epic twist where he actually understood the story all along. However, the rest of the blades seem to make sense to me, and by they, I mean you know, the one of the two of them that are left, Delphine and her friend. Delphine found me because I. Yeah. Okay. So, why are the blades dragon hunters? It has to do with the Akaviri. It has to do with, you know, it's like. Them being the Emperor's bodyguards was, like, a side mission to their original objective. Like, and the thing is, this is not, like, Oblivion lore. This is literally Delphine. It's, like, impossible to not have Delphine tell you that the Blades were originally Akaviri Dragon Hunters. Like, that was a thing that they did in the past. But it's like... Okay, so the Blades like serving Dragonborn, right? Seems like they would also be interested in dragons by proxy. Totally just sarcasm. Yeah, I'm sure... I'm sure in five minutes he'll explain that he actually got it. I'm a dragonborn and therefore have dragon blood, which means the smartest thing chat has said is that um, the blades want to kill Parthenax because w killing him while the dragonborn is alive is literally the only chance they have to actually do it. Like, that's literally the only smart thing to come, come out of chat. Why bother fe feigning this level of ignorance? Well, yeah, that's why I don't think he's feigning it. Delphine and her friend. Delphine found me because I'm a dragonborn and therefore have dragon blood, which means that they return to their old purpose, and eventually they start to rebuild if you do a certain thing I'll do later. Now, see, the reason I uh, bring this up is because I've heard somehow this is like a retcon or breaks the lore in some way, but after reading through a wiki page and going back to Oblivion a little bit, I, I really don't get how that can be the case. Uh it's a retcon, but it's like a soft retcon. Um, there's different kinds of retcons like it's not really contradictory as much as it is just they added new details to the blades that didn't really exist before
I, I don't know, maybe I'm just not literate in scrolls. Okay, the other thing Delphine tells me that's important is that she stole the horn. But we already knew that. But I don't get how she did this. Like, the dungeon was sealed up on the safe side, and she didn't bother killing any of the dudes I had to go through on the side that I went in oh, on. Oh, that's your issue? So how did she get this thing? Did, did she sneak through? How did she reset the big water mechanic thing, like, the, with the statues? How did she reset that? Did she push them back in? How did she know I needed this? It's not, you, your issue's not the whirlwind sprint, the part that literally needs a dragon shout to get past. No, no, she just, she had three ten-foot poles, and uh, that's how she got it done. Like, your issue is she snuck past the Draugr and she reset the water thing. Which, for all we know, just sinks back into the ground after a while. Like, again, if she's sneaky enough to be able to get past the Draugr, one can assume that she's also sneaky enough to not set off whatever motion sensor they have in that room. Delphine mastered the art of propping a stick in the door. But she was very deliberate to make sure that she didn't, that she like got rid of the stick after she passed. Even though it could very well be possible that she could get stuck doing that. This may be a stretch, but is it possible she took some extra people to just stand at the pillars for three gates? I mean,. I guess that's one way she could potentially solve it. But who would those people be? Would she would she Okay, it, but okay, so then those did those people sneak past the Draugr? Cuz Delphine sneaking past the Draugr makes sense to me. She's an intelligence agent. Delphine getting other people getting like hired mercenaries to also stand to also sneak past the Draugr? Old Blade friends? He never... No. Esbern never leaves the Riften thing. In fact, Esbern survived. Or is surprised that she's even still alive. So, no. It's not Esbern. Invisibility spells. Man, these are like the most capable mercenaries in the entire game. If, if I'm to be believed. I'm surprised that the the player never runs into them. Three mercenaries that like can all cast invisibility or have invisibility potions that could last long enough to get through the entire dungeon. It's not a pressure plate though. It's it you have to run past these pillars to open the gates. So it's not she can't trick it with pressure plate. She, like she can't do the bag of sand trick. They retired after that last job. One last heist. For all this money that Delphine has. Maybe that innkeeper friend? He's not an adventurer, though. Some, like His job is to run the inn when she's gone. So he, he wouldn't go. And also, he's just some guy. Okay, guys, she threw a rock past the pillars. How strong? It would have to be a big rock. So is she like, like 500 strength? Conjuration. Hmm. But she doesn't know. She like doesn't know magic. Apparently. Telekinesis. It wouldn't work for the... Again, it has to be a big object to set off the sensors. Nah, Hirokovach was more than just some guy. There we go. Someone figured it out. Good job. You figured it out. It's called... Bad writing. If you ask her that, she actually has an answer to this. She says she... 
Literally, all they have to do is have Delphine steal the Dragon Stone. Because that's far more plausible. Like, literally, wouldn't it be interesting if the person who stole the Golden Claw from the Riverwood Trader was Delphine the entire time? Wouldn't that be really interesting? Or, like, she was the one that hired the bandits to uh, explore the place? Actually, I'm going to put that down in my notes because that is interesting. Did Delphine steal the Golden Claw slash hire the bandits at Bleak Falls? So that actually sounds like an interesting plot point. Not that there's anything to base that on. She knew the great. You can't. Okay, but here's the thing with the secret entrance: is it's a one-way, um, it's a one-way stone wall that would be impossible to. It's impossible to go through the back door without having gone through it first. Like, people bring up the back door thing, but it's literally impossible. ...beards were needed because they're... Reset that? Did you push them back in? How did she know I needed this? If you ask her that, she actually has an answer to this. She says she knew that grade beards were needed because they're predictable. But, uh, yeah, like, how would... She, how would they know... Or how would she know where the Horn of Jurgen Windcaller is? But if there hasn't been a Dragonborn in, like, a fucking while, how did she know they would do this? What? Okay, so I like these I like these uh, questions he's asking. How did Delphine know about the Horn? I mean, okay, so we'll assume... The last person to get the Horn of Jurgen Windcaller was probably Tiber Septum, right? So, that was about 630 years before Skyrim. And I mean, maybe it was written down, and so it's like information that the Blades possessed that like the way, like part of his thing was like he had to go get the Horn. Yeah, you didn't come across as a jerk. I was just saying that, um... I was just bringing it up. What's predictable about it? I thought she might have tried to have spied on us while we were in High Throthgar and doing, you know, all the shit with the Thum. But that can't be the case because she said she needed to make sure this business with the Greybeards wasn't a Thalmor trap. And if she had spied on us... Yeah, I like the... You know who's working with the Thalmor? The Greybeards. Thanks, Delphine. To be fair, she probably didn't have much to do for all these years, so this was the one lead she had. What? But why? Like, okay. Why, in a world without dragons, and in a world without any new dragonborn being born, would Delphine actually go to the effort of, like, researching the Horn of Jurgen Windcaller? Shouldn't she be more interested in, like, the Thalmor operations that are going on in Skyrim? Like the Markarth incident, or the Stormcloak Rebellion, or um, the fact that there are literally Thalmor in Skyrim. Like those guys that patrolled Understone Keep. She ironically thinks Helgen was attacked by the Thalmor. Yeah, like, she's kind of a one-note person, if, you've, if you haven't noticed. She's kind of a bit focused on the Thalmor. I mean, well, she wouldn't be far off. Helgen almost was an inside job. If Alduin hadn't showed up, it would have been uh, gotten fucked by the Thalmor. Uh, she'd have heard us and seen us and the Greybeards using the Thum and them directing us to go, you know, get the thing because we're the dragon dude, not because Thalmor... She heard Greybeards called the Dragonborn since she's a Dragonborn too. Right, but... We're going to work with the assumption that the player immediately goes up to High Hrothgar, which doesn't leave her a lot of time to figure out what the horn is, what significance the horn is, and then proceed to set up a plan to uh, steal the horn. Because that's the part you guys forget. Delphine, for all Delphine knows, she doesn't know what kind of um, what like, like kind of traps or obstacles she'll face in the fort. So if she brings people with her to Unstengrav, that seems like a plot hole. 
Because why would she involve people unnecessarily? She wouldn't know about the whirlwind sprint trap. She'd have to come back with people. Which is just more time it would take for her to, uh, to... More time it would take for her to pull off the theft. My best guess is, like, she's got invisibility and, like, she she was, like, following the player and then, she, like, she ran ahead of him as soon as he got past the thing or something. More. Did she, like, magically know where to go, what to get, and how to get it without so much as leaving a trace? Ah, uh, I figured it out. Delphine has the clairvoyance spell. That was the answer all along. Why would the Thalmor even think to bring out the blades like this with the gray beards who would have never have even agreed to wait a minute, hold on. Yeah, she's just paranoid, dude. Hold on. Aren't the Thalmor part of the uh what was it? Oh shit, the war! BRB Delphine, I gotta go save Skyrim! Okay, so I know you guys probably wanna see where all this dragony shit is going, but if we don't take care of this whole, you know, war thing that's been going on, we might not ever get a chance. That's right, if you haven't played it yet, the Civil War in Skyrim isn't actually a part of the main quest. I mean, it gets mentioned, but the actual war is a side quest chain, of all things. It also seems like it- Yeah, I wouldn't say it like that. It's like, it's like a faction. It was to some degree an afterthought. Here, I'll show you by example. Trust me, I'm not making a baseless accusation. Okay, so in Skyrim, we all know about the warring conflict that's going on. Imperials- no, seriously, why hasn't Delphine joined the Stormcloaks? They would really like someone who can commit espionage against the Thalmor and the Empire turn their back on the Blades. Yeah, that's kind of a weird thing. You would think that uh, Delphine would be very interested in this Stormcloak conflict that's going on. I'll, I'll mark that down, actually. Why wasn't Delphine throwing in with the Stormcloaks? What truce thing? There wasn't a truce until the player makes it. Whoa, I'm physical again. Oh no. I'm also an orc. <laughs> I'm not a goblin. Delphine doesn't want to be caught. She'd rather be hidden. Yeah, most spies don't want to be caught, but that's the service they provide is clandestine operations. This is so backwards. Why would you be doing the Civil War first before stopping Alduin? In fairness, you don't really know how if you can even stop Alduin until a decent way into the main story. ...are encroaching a bit too much on the Nord's lands, and some of the Nords have taken up... Unless, like, the implication is that, like, Oh, Delphi knows that Ulfric Stormcloak is a glowy. But even that, even that's dumb. The banner is Stormcloaks to stop them. I'll get into the morality of these two factions in a bit, and by a bit I mean a while. But for now we're just gonna sign up with our good buddy Roloff and join Blue Team. Joining Blue Team requires us to go and meet with our old friend High King Ulfric Stormcloak. Now you'd think surviving Helgen and you know being the Dragonborn would be enough to join Ulfric's cool kids club, but apparently that's just not cool enough for him. So to show him we're cool, we're gonna have to go to a cool place and kill the coolest enemy in the game, the Ice Wraith. Get it? Which, by the way, is one hell of an entry requirement if this is how they recruit normal dudes. Uh, well, actually, um... Actually... Killing Ice Wraiths is weird. Um, there's, like, a lore thing where, like... Part of like the Nord Nordic uh, coming of age ritual is that the mi Nord men are supposed to like go fight an ice wraith. That's like part of their um... yeah coming of age. I mean, it's better than the Imperials who ask you to wipe out an entire fort by yourself. But it's like, the thing is, hang on. You're not joining like the, uh, the infantrymen, you know, you're, be you're doing a job in order to become an officer in the military. 
Don't you think a fully grown Nord has already done this? Yeah, but the player's not a Nord from Skyrim, is the deal. If you're a Nord, you're not from Skyrim, and you might not even be a Nord. It's just a way of showing that, like, you're a mature... You, that, like, you're part of Skyrim's kind of cultural heritage. Entire fort, it's like 10 bandits. Okay, dude. Here's the sword. Go fight 10 people with swords. Go do it. What's what's your hesitation? You're a badass. You're a hot, sexy badass. Go fight those 10 guys by yourself. After we kill the ice cube, Ulfric's... Remember, ice wraiths aren't a terrible a terribly big threat to nords because they have 50 percent frost resistance that's why it's part of like their initiation friend galmar tells us we need to beat the imperials at getting something called the jagged crown which is some ancient nordic treasure in a place called korvenyand this mission is actually cool because we coordinate with our force i don't know if there's special jet if there's special dialogue i think if you're not a Nord, Ulfric will refer to it as, like, anybody who, um, you know, there's anybody can fight for Skyrim to belong to the Nords. It's sort of like, um, you know, just believing that your homeland belongs to you. So it's like, on principle, other races can join the Stormcloak Rebellion. as like a real army and kill Imperials and shit and Roloff's there. So basically this is the whole package really. After that we have a little bit of politics where we're tasked with giving Jarl Balgriff an ultimatum. Either he joins up with the Stormcloaks or we're gonna take him out. This is actually kind of a bummer on my very first playthrough of Skyrim way back in 2012 or 13-ish. Because I liked Balgriff and on that character I had spent a whole heap of time in Whiterun and he tells us we're gonna go with war. Once we return with his message back to Ulfric, he tells us it's time to take over Whiterun. He's I wonder why they didn't decide... I assume it's for the sake of having a battle at Whiterun. But I always wondered why, like, Ulfric wasn't a variable based on the player. There's a funny Periite line I'm going to use where it's like, um... You ask him why he's sending you to kill some guy, and he's like, That question is impertinent. The elf must die. I think it's a really funny line. He sends us back to help with the offense, which turns out to be one of the coolest quests in Skyrim. There's catapults and Imperials and guards and Stormcloaks battling out in the city. We're storming the walls, the keep, shit's burning, there's artillery hurling all over the place. The whole thing is just fucking awesome. It even... I mean, I... It's a lot better. I think it's a lot better if you're on the attacking side than the defending side. Ends with Bulgruff leaving the player to question if what they're doing is such a great thing, considering the Jarl even surrenders so that no one else in his city has to die. All I ever wanted was to keep everyone safe. A true baller. The only part about this quest that... I think he's entitled to his opinion that um, that it's the best quest in the game. I don't think it's that much of a stretch to say. Which is more underwhelming, New Vegas Hoover Dam battles or Skyrim City battles? Oh, Lord, Skyrim City battles, come on. All of them combined is worse than Hoover Dam. Is bad is that we have to replace Yara Balgrove with some old fuck named Vignar who's probably gonna die in like, you know, 13 minutes instead of letting Balgrove keep his office. Also, fuck the Grey Mains. <laughs>
This quest right here hypes you up for the rest of this quest line. There are a bunch of cities in Skyrim, all of which align one way or the other, and I couldn't help but think of all the places I was going to get to rush in and burn down with my fellow Stormcloaks. However, the next mission I got was to destroy a fort, which at first I thought was just to help pace out the city sieges, so you're not, you know, just constantly going in and burning cities so it doesn't seem like a repetitive kind of thing, you know? But it turns out that instead of sieging the nearby town of Falkreath, we just take it over off screen while we took out the fort. Yeah, I always thought it's weird that um, the battle, like, you take the fort and that means that the city just surrenders. I'm like, what kind of Nord fucking thing is that? Why would he ever keep his office? Well, his complaint isn't that Balgriff was ousted. His complaint was that Balgriff was replaced by Vignar Greymane, which I would agree with. Some of the Jarl replacements are, like, better than others. You make some cities better on each side, and you make some cities worse. Yeah, like, who are these Nords that just, like, Oh, we lost our fort. Time to surrender. Now, I can't say for a certain, but according to a modder, apparently there are supposed to be battles for a bunch of the cities in Skyrim but they got cut. And instead, we're left with a quest line that features up to seven different fort conflicts. It's probably... And only three sieges... It's probably more likely that they just weren't finished. Because I can imagine a lot of, like, design anxiety around having a battle at each city with, like, NPCs getting killed. Because, like, remember... Um... So, okay. Here's the thing. Remember the blood on the ice incident with Salt Factory? So that only happened because he did the quest after the civil war and the guard that you're supposed to talk to had died so he reloaded an old save and then once he finished the quest he stopped playing that save and that's why he didn't find out about the quest continuing so i can imagine like that's just one example of like things that can go wrong with having the battles and i can easily understand why they probably wouldn't want to do that for all the cities not saying they shouldn't, not saying they shouldn't, you know, figure out how to make it work, but I can easily understand why they would want to limit it, limit it to um, the Whiterun battle and the battle for the enemy's capital. Total, since Whiterun's is repeated and you're just placed on different sides of the conflict. Meaning that if you want to sack towns with your horde, the best you're going to get is two sieges on the Stormcloak sides. Or you make a horde of people with the Ritual Stone and then... Just go around killing everybody. This is the soul of disappointment. The worst part of it is knowing that somewhere there might be traces of more battles left around in the code or Bethesda's office or on you know, planning boards or whatever that never saw the light of day. That this entire... Oh, they, they did see the light of day. That's what the... That's literally what the modder that you're talking about added was those cut battles. And they're buggy. Can't they just hide quest important NPCs during the battle? One would imagine. But I mean, like, even then, like, stuff falls through the cracks all the time. There's, like, you're adding a lot of variables to the testing that Bethesda might not be capable of handling with the team that they have. And he deleted the mod because Trump. <laughs> Did he really? That's like a... Okay. A guy I don't like got elected, so I'm going to delete the mod. Delete my mod. Their war boiled down to fort fighting to make way for the dragon storyline. No, trust me. The, 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 um, the civil war is extremely disappointing. I was going to have a big analytical speech about why this is bad, but really there isn't any analyzing to do. It's just depressing. So, basically, to sum it up in as few words as possible, as simply as I can put it, in layman's terms, better than I could have said it myself. Stop. Stop.
I was hoping that was like royalty free drum roll, please. Oh, I'm sure there's somebody who's who, who somebody else who can do it. War. Yeah. What is it good for? All right. Notice, this is the second part of a multi-part series of videos. You won't really know what the fuck is going on unless you watch part one. Watch part one by clicking on your screen. Okay? Okay, I'll click on my screen. We good? Why isn't part one playing? <laughs> yeah, I know this thing, you can get it. The, I think they have to do that manually, though. I mostly worry about the auto content ID. Press any button? Okay. Press his power button. What the fuck? Why did they go after music? Because they can steal the ad revenue from any videos that use it. Although... No, wait, this video did get claimed. Never mind. We good. All right, now, where was I? Let's see here. War, now Thalmor. You didn't really finish the Civil War. Delphine, yeah, that's right. So Delphine tells us about the blades, about how she was a blade, and about how the dragons in Skyrim aren't just coming back or from some other location, but that they're actually coming back to life itself. The dragon stone that we got for her is apparently a map which details the locations of many dragon burial sites, and a lot of the important ones. Apparently the dragon stone also has some kind of numbered list of which dragon sites Alduin is going to be interested in reviving, because she happens to know exactly where he's going to be next. Maybe the tablet has some kind of like table of command that tells us who's the most powerful dragons, or maybe the dragons can only be revived in some sequence or pattern. I don't know, it hasn't really been explained yet, but I guess you can come up with a reason in your head. No. You don't have to go that far. You can literally, when you have the dragon stone, you can actually just inspect it. I think you can even get it back. Oh no, that's an island, for fuck's sake. Fucking dragon stone from Game of Thrones. God damn it, I look up dragon stone map and it's just, a, it's just more Game of Thrones. Skyrim, Jesus. Nobody likes Game of Thrones. So when you look at the actual dragon stone, you can see, uh, it's, it's hard to see, but the, there's the little divots in the, um, in the tablet that marks the dragon burial sites. And so what she based it on, she actually says in the story, is that, um, the pattern seems to start in the southeast because she was visiting the tombs and some of them were empty. And going by the logic of, like, the direction that they're taking, assuming that, like, Alduin's just going from site to site and doing it. In between like sucking up souls and sovereign guard is that um all you have to do is like go to the next one that hasn't been taken yet and you should eventually run into alduin and it works oh, oh yeah you could go uh pattern skit she is like a paranoid schizophrenic too so the thing I don't get is how Delphine happens to know exactly when Alduin is going to go to these burial grounds. It well, okay, so her her plan that like she kind of alludes to is we're going to go to the sites, see which ones haven't been taken but are likely to be visited next by Alduin and like just kind of camp it camp it out. And then like you just happen to show up when Alduin does. I mean, well the thing is Skyrim's contemporary borders are land borders, so it's not really that 
biggest stretch. Do schizophrenic? Yes, yeah, schizophrenic see patterns in the numbers all the time. The paranoid schizophrenic has seen a pattern in the numbers. Doesn't have like a clock, does it? Can they only be revived at a certain time? Is she clairvoyant? I mean, that would make sense. She was paranoid. Oh, he said the words. I literally asked that earlier. Apparently pretty clairvoyant last time. You know, I don't even know. Who cares? We go out to Kynesgrove. Well, why'd you bring it up then? Which is this town around the new dragon burial site, and find Alduin casting a B-Rez on some other named dragon. Alduin insults us a bunch, brings his friend back to life, and flies away. Then we kill his friend in what is actually a really well-authored dragon fight. This dragon uses new telekinesis magic and long sweeping attacks, and his area is a nice and spacious crater, which he jumps away. Wait, what? What was that? Well, that's Calamite. This is Dark Souls. Oh, shit. Pick okay, so we kill up. the new dragon, same old, same old, and regroup with Delphine once more. Delphine suspects that the dragons returning have something to do with the Thalmor, which is some elvish government, there's some big issue between elves and humans. Basically, the Thalmor may as well just be Nazis, as far as I know. They often outright say stuff like, Don't you see? Elven supremacy is the truth! And after doing a little reading on these guys, they're kind of assholes. In fact, elves in general in Elder Scrolls are kind of assholes. So we're just gonna call these guys the asshole faction. Might be something you want to look into if you're doing any kind of analysis. He was mostly talking about the, the gameplay. He wasn't talking about just, like, in general. Gosh, epic mic drop moment. You don't know Elder Scrolls lore. While we're on the topic, it'd probably be a pretty good opportunity to get Skyrim's factions out of the way now that we know who our major players are. Now, those of us who have played a lot after, of Bethesda games... After, the civil, after you do the Civil War, you, now you're going to talk about the factions. ...know that in the game preceding Skyrim had a pretty piss-poor example of how to implement a war into an open-world choice-based RPG. That game, of course... Yeah, where everybody's motivation was exactly the same. ...was being Fallout 3, which also featured a conflict... Like, literally, isn't Fallout 3 about how everybody wants to turn the water purifier on, but everybody's fighting over who gets the honors of actually pushing the button? <laughs> ...between two factions, just like Skyrim. Thing is that Fallout 3's factions were terrible. They were one-dimensional, were led by people making an unending stream of poor decisions. I don't know, Fallout 3 is my least played Bethesda game of the 3D era. Um, I really don't like Fallout 3. And you couldn't even join one of them. So, at the very least, compared to that game, Skyrim's factions aren't all that bad. I don't think they're amazing by any means, but they are at the very least competently written. And after having read all their backstories on Lokia, I feel like the only way to give each one and the factions overall a fair... I mean, that was the whole point of the space race. The whole point of the space race was who got to push the button on the moon? Man, I thought the whole point of the space race was developing technology so that we would have more advanced weapons that we could use against the enemy. Knows what I know about the space race. It wasn't like building satellites to spy on our enemies was a big thing. Yeah, I know, like, the if you... Like, the Enclave wants to be able to control when the button gets pushed. That's basically, like, that's the delineation of it, is... The Brotherhood wants to push the button. The Enclave wants to have control of the button. Their shake would be to give each one of the factions their own subset. But it's like, why would the Enclave bother enslaving the population of the, uh, of the Wasteland? Like, fuck all people live there. Everybody who lives there is a degenerate. And the only reason that more people don't live there is because all the water is irradiated, you dipshits.
segment of the video. So yeah, we're, we're going for the, the fragmentational thing again. The first team who has lives invested in this fight is the blue team, also known as the Stormcloaks. The Stormcloaks are a congregation of passionate, angry rebel Skyrim-born Nords who are tired of the Imperials treading on their land and enforcing their laws on the people of Skyrim, and also have a disdain for anybody who isn't a Nord, with elves being the receivers of most of their racial hatred. The short version of the Stormcloaks' history goes as follows. Ulfric Stormcloak was a military leader commanding an army of soldiers under the banner of the Empire before his rebellion. After the signing of the White Gold Concordat, which is a whole other business we'll get into later, Ulfric Stormcloak was in charge of retaking a city called Markarth from a group of tribals known as Whoa. the Forsworn, who had invaded the area. Thank God, someone finally mentioned it. I was going insane. All these fucking people keep leaving out that, like, the Forsworn Rebellion is super important to the story of the Civil War. Now, Ulfric and his army did succeed in taking back the city, but they did so under the agreement that once they had done so, the Empire would lift the ban on Talos worshipping that the White Gold Concordat had placed on the people of Skyrim, which is a big deal for the Nords because Talos is one of the most important figures in their culture, and in their religion, and their folklore, and all these other things. Basically, Talos is the Nords' big deitic figure. However, due to pressure from the Aldermary Dominion, which is the faction that owns the Thalmor and is made up of the Elves, the Imperials took back their agreement with Ulfric, rounded him and all his buddies up, and imprisoned them. During his time in the Clink, Ulfric learned that his dad had died, and he is now the heir to the title as Jarl of Windhelm. Ulfric thought that his dad was a pretty worthy cause, and busted out of prison with a smuggled eulogy, and made his way to his home of Windhelm. Now mind you, this isn't what started the rebellion in full. That trophy goes to Ulfric Stormcloak's duel with High King Torig, which flipped the switch on many of the citizens of Skyrim. The Nord version of the story is that Ulfric did indeed kill King Torig in a duel, and that this was just an example of honorary combat in the ancient ways of the Nord people. The Imperial version of the story is that Ulfric murdered Torig with his voice to usurp him. I bring up this little tidbit because we'll talk about it in a little bit, don't worry. Now, after Ulfric defeated Torig in a duel or murdered him or whatever you want to believe, he went back to Windhelm and before he knew it, the rebellion was on. Between their hatred of the Thalmor, their hatred of the Imperials and their laws, and the general frustration about not being able to worship the religion they want to worship, a metric fuckton of Nords swore allegiance to Ulfric, and thus the Stormcloak Rebellion was born. Yeah, I'm... I'm unclear on that. Um... I thought Ulfric had resisted arrest. The second team to partake in this Blood Bowl is the Red Team, also known as the Imperials or the Empire. The Imperials are a much larger organization in Skyrim, who believe that because Skyrim is an Imperial province, it must follow its laws and doctrines, even those put in place by the White Gold Concordat. And without getting into the entire history of the Empire, which is not only unnecessary, but would take a fucking while, that's all we really need to know about them for now. That's the Wait, what was the history he gave us? The second team to partake in this Blood Bowl is the Red Team, also known as the Imperials or the Empire. The Imperials no, are, no one escapes Sid in the mine. are a much larger organization in Skyrim, who believe that because Skyrim is an Imperial province, it must follow its laws and doctrines, even those put in place by the White Gold Concordat. And without getting into the entire history of the Empire, which is not only unnecessary, but would take a fucking while, that's all we really need to know about them for now. That's their stakes in the conflict that matters. There's more stuff I would mention about them. Like the Septums, the Medes, the Great War. The final team, also known as, uh, I guess, Gold Team, are the Thalmor, which is an extension of the Aldemary Dominion, which is the government of the Elves. The Elves seek to unite Tamriel, which is the whole continent that Skyrim is connected to, under one supreme single government, which of course they control. As far as the conflict in Skyrim goes, the Thalmor obviously have a vested interest in crushing the Rebellion and the Imperials, though obviously more so the Imperials because they want all of Tamriel, and the Empire kinda owns a lot of it. And they are responsible for the White Gold Concordat and the banning of Talos worship, by extension. As far as the war goes, they don't really do much aside from some evil shit like interrogations and racism. It should...
Yeah, I don't think it was Sidna Mine. It be immediately evident that these factions are more well written than Bethesda's previous affair, simply because you have at least the slightest modicum of a reason to join either of your two choices, and because they are in totally black and white, and also the fact that you can choose. Obviously the Imperials are partially in the right because Skyrim is a province of theirs, but they're also kinda in the wrong because of how they betrayed Ulfric and forced their laws on people who aren't totally connected with the Empire, and Ulfric- Whoa. Mr. Caption is pro imper Oh shit. Pro-imperialism? Yeah, the Aldbury Dominion is just a dominion of, uh, of, uh, High Elves and Wood Elves, and then they control elsewhere, which is cheat. Also, you know, kind of bend their knee to the Thalmor a little bit. And same for the Stormcloaks. They're in the right because of how their culture is being bullied out of them by the Empire. Whoa, you can't say that. And they're also kind of wrong because of how rampantly racist they are to pretty much everybody. The th He keeps teasing it. Please. Say it. I'll say it. Ulfric Stormcloak is racist. Say the line, cuck. Thalmor are more one-dimensional, but they aren't really a major faction in Skyrim, and sometimes there isn't anything totally wrong with having a clearly defined good or bad guy. Cooper, what are you doing here? Get back to your guard post! The only real issue I take is with the Stormcloaks and the aforementioned rampant racism. I'm glad that they... Rampant racism. Go on. I have a major flaw, don't get me wrong, but I think that having them hate everyone who isn't a Nord doesn't really make much sense. He said the line. That's why they allow Dark Elves to live in their city. That's why he didn't seize all the Dark Elf property as soon as he took over his Jarl. For the war effort, you know? How come the Dark Elves aren't having to house uh, Stormcloak soldiers? I mean, if Stormcloak soldiers are joining from all over Skyrim, there can't be enough territory that the Stormcloaks hold to actually house all of those soldiers, right? Ah, see? I didn't get it the whole time. The reason they accepted all those Dark Elf refugees has to do with the fact that they actually wanted the opportunity to be racist. See, they wanted to invite the Dark Elves into the city so that they could, so that they didn't have to go so far to actually racially berate them. Used to be you have to cross the border to, uh, to lynch a Dark Elf, but now, now you can just go down to the Grey Quarter. Yeah, but he's fighting the Imperial government, who refuses to really kind of be tolerant of Nordic culture. And he's also fighting the Thalmor, who are racial supremists who practice eugenics. As I understand it, their main beef with the Empire stepping on their homeland is about Talos worship being banned. There's obviously more to it than that, but that seems to be the thing that has manifested a lot of the Nord's main issues with the Empire. Mm -hmm. So why don't the Stormcloaks accept non-Nords? Are they all just unanimously agreed that Nords are the only ones allowed in? Why not accept anyone who's not an elf, Skyrim born, and worships Talos? By only accepting Nords, they are ham- I mean, there might not be very many non-Nords who are, you know, chomping at the bit to join the Stormcloaks. Also, like, he has this weird perception that, like, 
Skyrim is for everybody. So it's like... Oh yeah, no, there's like an equal proportion of every single race in Skyrim. And it's like, no, half the population are Nords. So the vast majority of both armies are Nordic forces. But like, you don't know that there's an issue of like... You know, there's no scene of a of a of a Dunmer woman who was just wanting to join the Stormcloak Rebellion, but she got rejected because she had gray skin. I mean, they let me join, and I'm a dark elf. stringing their ability to grow an army by quite a fucking lot especially considering they're a small rebel force who should yeah i'm sure every day there's just so many dark elves that are chopping at the bit to join the stormcloak rebellion all those foreigners that wanting that are wanting to join yeah it's like skyrim isn't supposed to be as multicultural as it actually is like that seems to be a gameplay concession the bulk of the population are meant to be nords probably be looking for anything they can get Maybe this is an intentional flaw with the Stormcloaks, but I haven't ever seen this brought up anywhere in-game or even out of game, so I doubt that. You also didn't see, like, again, the the poor the poor Dunmer woman who just wanted to get ahead in life and was raising three kids by herself being rejected from a job with the Stormcloaks. And I also find it just a little... You're like, yeah, like the... Hell, they allowed foreigners inside House Redoran and House Telvanni. Well, I guess House Redoran's the big sticking point, but I mean... But unbelievable about how the whole Stormcloaks, the whole thing, don't accept Bretons or Argonians or whoever. If I, if I had been the guy on the Bethesda writing team charged with working on the Stormcloaks, I'd have changed their racism just a bit to make them seem less uh, idiotic. And maybe slightly more of a valid choice for the... But again, like, he's really reading into it when it's like... I mean, you also don't see any Dark Elves serving the Imperials, which I think is a big sticking point. Because you'll see, like, Dark Elf farmers who are like, Yeah, I'm on my way to join the Empire. But then all the soldiers are just, like, Nords and Imperials. Hell, there are somehow no orcs in the Imperial Army or Red Guards. Like, why doesn't he bring that up? Uh, the Imperial Legion is just as lacks just as much racial diversity as the Stormcloaks. Stormcloaks are unpalatably stupid and racist, unlike the based Imperial colonialists and the elf Nazis. Yeah, like, there should totally be tons of orcs in the Empire at this point. Given that Orsinium's not a thing, and they tend to... They tend to join the Empire to serve... Like, at least as smiths. There's a legate. Oh, yeah, I remember there being an orc legate. I think that's it. Well, I mean, it's just... If you can read into there not being a very diverse army for the Stormcloaks, can't you equally if not more so read into there not being a diverse army for the side that wants diversity players allegiance keep them racist against imperials and elves obviously but i will be surprised if he brings it up during his imperial section
But any Talos worshipping Bretons, Argonians, Orcs, and Red Guards, I think they could be given the pass. He's also assuming that like the core of the conflict is about Talos. Um I would hate to say what this is in sp what this is based on because it's highly political in real life. But there's a wide number of people who say that the Civil War wasn't just about slavery. It was about federalism and the role of the federal government, right? Now I'm loath to say that. So I'm just like I'm going to allude to that, but I'm not going to make it clear what I think the, actual, the Civil War was actually about. But the point is, wars can be about multiple things. Like, if you listen to Ulfric's main speech here, the main thing he's complaining about is that he came home to a land that seemed to be just full of strangers. It wasn't just the banning of Talos worship. It was that the Jarls were all, like, cozying up to the Imperials and that, like, the Norse were abandoning their cultural heritage. Yeah, I wasn't going to say the states' rights thing. But, like, if you look at the basis of the American Civil War, it started during the founding of the U.S. government with the conflict between what the actual role of the federal government was. That's what, like, the Federalists versus, um... I forget what the other side was called. But, like, that's what, like, the Federalist papers were about, was establishing what the role of the federal government was. So, like, the ba that part of the Civil War had existed in America for, like, almost a century, if not a full century before the actual war happened. But, like, yeah, slavery was part of the issue, too. But it's just, like, my point is, civil wars aren't just one issue sort of conflicts. This way you can have the racism and make the Stormcloak seem like an actual rebellion scrounging soldiers around wherever they can get them, and it would make the war seem at least a little bit more visually interesting by having it be more than just blonde dudes fighting brunette dudes. But like I said, the very- Well, I didn't say anything about slavery, so don't read into it. I just said that the Civil War was about more than just that issue. The very act of them having a major flaw is a plus. Now we're still on the topic of the war in Skyrim, and while I dealt with the major issues the questline has from a gameplay perspective, let's talk about the whole rest of the war. Or perhaps the whole rest of the lack of a war, is a more accurate way to put it. Now I can only speak for myself and the two friends I asked about this, plus the two people I asked on Twitter, but I cannot for the life of me find any instances of Stormcloaks and Imperials naturally fighting each other out in the world. It happened to me last night, actually. Um, it's a very rare kind of kind of radiant event that will happen but they will absolutely have skirmishes it happened to me in Falkreath hold and like the snowy part in the south um like this squad of imperials rolled up on these stormcloak guys and started fighting Oh, chat is always just a can of worms waiting for me to say something political. They're waiting for their opportunity to make their voices heard. It's quite difficult to get the rank and file to fight for a variety of complex and nuanced reasons. Sure, but... Most of the ideological part of the war is for the benefit of the officer corps. And for encouraging, you know, the people who are actually intelligent and understand the philosophical underpinnings of the conflict to, to have a reason to fight. I've played this game for 196 hours at the very moment of this recording, and I have never, not once, seen the armies fighting outside of either scripted sequences or something I set up myself. I mean, you could look it up. You know, asking people on Twitter is, like, notoriously a bad way to find out if stuff is true in a video game.
It seems I'm not the only one either, because a video search for Stormcloaks and Imperials fighting only brought up a bunch of people uploading videos of fights in which they set up. I even went as far as to sleuth around r slash Skyrim and didn't find diddly shit. And I would have asked V too, but honestly I'm not in the mood for Todd posting. And to be completely honest, I doubt they would have found anything. Maybe- Oh come on, they're a bunch of autistic deckbeards. I guarantee one of them had like 5,000 hours in Skyrim at that point who could have told you every single Radiant event that you can encounter. It's rare, but like, I like how confidently he's making the case that it doesn't happen. Oh no, it's absolutely a thing. I have it in my footage. Um, my most recent recording, or not my most recent recording, my second most recent recording at uh, three hours and 49 minutes. I would show you, but uh, I don't have that set up. Or, well, I can, I can have you listen. So that would be this session at three forty. It'll be right before. Bye, it. Fam. I think it was when I was running to this dungeon. You'll have to trust me on this one. Actually, shit. I can take a picture. But where did where did VLC send the picture? It's gonna be a whole other question. Ah, here it is. But yeah. I think it depends on the region you go to. I think it happens more like on the, in the hot zones like Falkreath, Whiterun, uh, The Pale, those places. I also ran into a skirmish of Forsworn and Imperials, which I thought was interesting. You guys out there have found some instances of Stormcloaks and Imperials duking it out randomly in the world, but you're in the minority. This is a major flaw of Skyrim's war, because it makes what is supposed to be a huge event and seem like something that's happening far off in the distance. It's a lot like how people normally deal with wars and events in other countries. Skyrim talks a lot about its war in NPC dialogue, but it never shows the war or its effects happening unless you start the questline, and even then it only shows what happens inside of the cities. The closest you get to actual wars happening out in the world are these patrols of Thalmor and Imperials carting prisoners around which can be interrupted. Allow me to compare this to another game that features a big ass war between two factions and was also made in Bethesda's engine, New Fallout New Vegas. In Fallout New Vegas not only do people talk about the war between the NCR and the Legion, but you actually see it unfold before your eyes even if you don't touch the main quest line. New Vegas, in addition to just having a bunch of people talk about stuff, also features events that happened in the aftermath of other events caused by one of the facts. Well, okay, I'll ask chat. I'll ask chat. We got some people in here. Have you ever encountered Stormcloaks and Imperials fighting out in the wild of Skyrim? Actions like the NCR camp at Camp Searchlight or the interrogation of Silas the Centurion, but also features concurrent events that are happening right as the player steps into the world, like the two NCR hostage situations. Okay, but if it happens in a if something happens in a modded playthrough, that doesn't mean it's not part of the base game. It's a base game event. Situations at Nelson and in the quest Anywhere I Wander but also has instances of these factions, not to mention other factions, getting into small squad-sized fights around the wasteland. That's not to mention all of the small camps and ma- Yeah, so I'm sorry, but your sample size of uh, five people wasn't adequate to make a point that, like, it's not 
prolific enough. No, okay, so his point is that he never encountered them actually fighting. He doesn't know if it happens. So he asked his friends and he asked people on Twitter and he got like four responses and they all said that they had never seen it. So I'm showing that not only have I seen it in my playthrough, but there are people in my chat who've also seen it. So th then the question becomes, okay, so it happens, but it's not common because th all those people didn't see it. But like the results of the poll was 60% of the people in here said that they had seen uh, the Stormcloaks and Imperials have skirmishes out in the open world. So it's common enough. He just had like a freak occurrence where everybody he asked had no input or um, had never encountered it or, you know, could be lying or not even like a not even like a malicious like, yes, I'm going to epic own them style lie. I mean, like, you know, maybe his friends forgot. Maybe his friends had the event happen for them, but they hadn't like run into each other yet. So like. He's, they saw a Stormcloak patrol, but they didn't actually see the battle. Major bases dotted around the wasteland, all of the things that happen in the main questline, or the fact that Fallen New Vegas features multiple other factions, one of which being a set of alternate endings for the game. My I believe I would refer to the... Hang on. I believe New Vegas comparisons are inhumane when <laughs> for Skyrim. Like it, yeah, you can say a lot of things about New Vegas being better than Skyrim. It's said so frequently that contrarians will actually comment like, "Oh my God, I am so tired of hearing people compare Skyrim to New Vegas." That's how common. The uh, comparisons are. Do they ever address how the Stormcloaks get funding? I understand resources from their hold, but that seems too small compared to the Empire. Well, they are able to re source everything locally. The Empire has to ship everything. Mind you, this is Fallout New Vegas, a game that was made in just a year and a half to Skyrim's three years. Which is actually five years if you count the initial. Yeah, sure, but also I should put down that he made a New Vegas comparison. Uh, sure, but I mean that can be like different priorities in development. So it's like they wanted to capture the war thing, and so they did it in a different way that was much more blatant. And you could say that's better, sure, but that doesn't really have anything to do with development time, as much as it does. They just approached it from a different angle. Everyone's always praising Obsidian for New Vegas, and then Obsidian got to make their own game, and everyone played it for two weeks and dropped it dead. Well, that would, that's an issue. There were, like, key people who left that weren't there for... that were there for New Vegas, but weren't there later. No, I don't think it's out of the question, too. Compare it to New Vegas. I don't think it's unfair at all. I'm just saying that there are contrarians out there who are so used to hearing the New Vegas comparisons that they actually like. That they'll just like, before they even watch, like, there was a guy who accused me of making too many, like, New Vegas comparisons in my Oblivion video when I don't even really recall ever mentioning New Vegas once in that video. Like, the only time I've mentioned New Vegas outside of the streams and the one meme in the Bioshock video was when talking about the tutorial in Morrowind. Initial development stages. I seriously do not, for the life of me, understand why this is the case. It's All right, so I'm going to make a deal with you guys. I have to finish. I want to finish this video before I hit 12 hours. So I'm going to speed it up to like 1.25 times. And then um, if I'm still not going to make it, because we're like almost six hours in and we're not halfway through the video, then I'll have to speed it up again.
It's not like placing some Stormcloaks and some Imperial Legionnaires on a road or near a camp or in the woods or something is difficult. Hell, you're, I... You're really dedicated to this point, but, um... Yeah, you're, you're wrong. You know, no, I will do it. Hold on. Yeah, see, I did. It took me 15 minutes. I shouldn't have to say this, but if you're gonna have a major war in your game, it's probably best to show it I happening. I understand this feeling. Especially since this war is supposed to be happening in the very country the game takes place in. Treating it like it's some far-off conflict in some other country doesn't work because it isn't far away. It's in people's front yards. Luckily, however, this seems to be a point Bethesda is fixed in Fallout 4. I can at least remember that game having little fights brew in between its major players, so hopefully it's now a non-issue. Hopefully. However, to end out on a positive note, one last thing I actually really like about the war in Skyrim is the fact that it probably indirectly, or even accidentally, deals with misinformation. Now, I've never been to war and would personally like to avoid it if I could, but I imagine that a big part of war, whether it be for the patriotic civilians, or for certain battles, or the motives of soldiers, or whatever, is misinformation. Having the Stormcloaks and Imperials fight each other, and not the Thalmor, all because the war has gotten so bogged down in nationalism and telephone-style obfuscation of the facts, is not only kind of funny when you think about it, but is a really cool extra facet to this already decently written conflict. I mean, if you sat down Ulfric and Tullius and told them that the elves did it all, you'd probably have a pretty hilarious dialogue sequence where they both realized that the fighting was kind of for naught. Um... They're not stupid. Tullius knows, like, I feel like he didn't do the Imperial side, which maybe he didn't, but um, Tullius is not dumb. He explicitly states that the real enemy is the Thalmor, and that um, ending the Stormcloak Rebellion as fast as possible is important so that they can prepare to fight the Thalmor again. All right, I think we've spent enough time dawdling over the war, so we can finally count that as a finished topic. Now let's return to the main quest. After we kill the dragon at Kynes Grove, Delphine tells us he wants to dig up some dirt on the Thalmor, because apparently they might be involved with the whole dragon thing, because they benefit from dragons fucking up both the Empire and the Stormcloaks. Makes perfect sense, right? So to dig in on the Thalmor, we're going to crash a party they're having with a bunch of big names from around Skyrim. To do so, we need to contact one of Delphine's contacts, uh, uh, who's buddy-buddy with some of the Thalmor, and works in their embassy. That's right, I said embassy. They have an embassy, like an actual foreign government. Just saying, but as somebody who's played a lot of games with factions in it, it's kind of surprising. Actually, that, that brings up another point about Skyrim that- Morrowind had embassies. I don't know why the- It's, it's weird to me, like- were embassies a thing kind of in that time era in our own world? I doubt, like, okay, so the point of an embassy is um, if you're, like, a extra national and you're in a country and, like, you need to get out of the country quickly or what have you, you, like, need to seek refuge or something, then the pur purpose of the embassy serves is to assist you in whatever way you need to help you get back to your home country, in addition to the ambassador ambassadorial uh, responsibilities that an embassy has. It's weird to me because we don't actually really see any citizens of the Aldmeri Dominion in Skyrim. Or at least we don't meet... I don't, I don't recall meeting anybody outside of the military forces there who claim to be, you know, citizens of the Aldmeri Dominion who are visiting Skyrim. I figure, like, ambassadors were common, and so you might have, like, the the embassy might be, like, an office at the castle that belongs to, like, a foreign dignitary, but not, like, an actual dedicated campus embassy with, like, a fence and a dedicated military force. Like, I feel like the way the Thalmor embassy is presented is a much more modern representation of what an embassy is, and it's especially weird that the Thalmor embassy is... Like, not in a city? Like, they're in the middle of nowhere. I'm surprised that they don't get attacked. I think the implication... Oh, no, that's, like, explicitly the implication of the Thalmor Embassy is that they they're literally torturing Skyrim's civilians in the basement of the Thalmor Embassy. 
The tutorial of Morrowind was an embassy? No, it was a census office. The embassies were like, um, they were in Ebonheart. There was an Argonian embassy, and I think the other one is a Nordic embassy? Hang on. I remember the Argonian one because it's tied to the anti-slavery stuff. Argonian mission. They were called missions, but um, they were embassies. Yeah, there's the Argonian mission and the Skyrim mission, which are both embassies because to Morrowind. The embassy is a short walk away from tutorial or from solitude. Yes, but you have to remember that that short walk actually is meant to represent a longer distance. Like again, Tamriel is not smaller than New York City in the actual like in that in the actual world. That's just a gameplay thing. Like, the Thalmor Embassy should be in Solitude. Or at least near, like, closer to Solitude. Like, within range of, like, within visual range of the port. Didn't the Stormcloaks not storm Solitude because of the wedding? The wedding is such a weird fucking thing. Don't even talk about the wedding in context. Like... There's no way the wedding doesn't happen until after the war. The reason they don't storm Solitude is because they don't have any territory near Solitude. They'd have to go through Hjalmarch, which would be difficult. They would have to cross Dragon Bridge, which would be difficult. Or they'd have to go through the Reach, which would also be difficult. That I like, which is how it deals with politics. I already touched on how Bulgriff dealt with the initial dragon attacks by making reasonable, sensible decisions after consulting his cabinet of similarly intelligent people. But he's not the only one. Ulfric has a cabinet. Ulfric talks about the new ruler of Solitude giving up Skyrim to the elves. General Tullius has lieutenants. I think you get the point. There's a lot of competent political dialogue in this game, and if there are any instances of someone making a completely asinine decision... Um... Political dialogue good quote it'll come back up the wedding can actually delay the final attack for storm cloaks oh yeah i bet because of the scripting decision that only succeeds because of plot armor i haven't seen it yet which is a good thing because fallout 3 the game before skyrim was chock full of this and it left me questioning i don't know you would have to ask a math person what the ratio is um and it depends on if you're basing it on the dagger fall proportions or if you're basing it on the arena proportions because i believe they're at different scales like dagger fall is a much bigger scale than uh arena in terms of because dagger fall is a small section of the original arena map but it's much bigger I think. ...how anyone became an authority figure when they had no idea how to make a sound decision. Okay, we've gone on more than enough tangents here. Let's get on track. We infiltrate... Oh, yeah. Discord roll. Use this command at Discord server. The roll is not piss yellow anymore. It's now puke green. <laughs> it'll probably be, like... By the time that, like, I end the streams, it'll probably be an actually good color. Trade the Thalmor Embassy in the disguise of a party goer attending the festivities, create a diversion, and sneak through the rest of the embassy looking for any dirt we can find on the Thalmor and their dragon shenanigans. This mission would appear on the outside to have a heavy stealth focus, but it really doesn't. You can get through this with pure combat if you wish to. It doesn't have to. You better bring that up. This is sort of like a weird trend. Everybody who reviews this game bases it on their playthrough and like does no like research about any of the more. You don't have to research every quest. You should research the more interesting stuff and see like, oh, was there like alternate ways I actually could have done that Thalmor Embassy quest? But it's just like, well, I did it with combat. That means that uh, it, it's combat focused. Too, but the setup. Oh shit! Right, I actually have to. 
Sorry, sorry, sorry. I actually have to set it up. <laughs> I have to set it up. It's a... Uh, it's set up in a way where um, you can't get it off stream. But I actually have to go in and like enable the role to be joinable. I apologize for that. And I apologize to the people in the server who just got flooded with a bunch of commands. There you go. It uh, should work now. Also, do it in the announcements channel, please. Were resources like wikis as reliable back then? When it comes to the... Yeah, when it came to the main quests, absolutely. Like, I don't think you understand. The UASP has been a thing most of my life. Not only has it not changed visually, but, like, they had pretty accurate information about Skyrim when this video came out. Which I believe... Like, he said at the start that um, Special Edition had already been announced. on the outside to have a heavy stealth focus, but it really doesn't. You can get through this with pure combat if you wish to, but the setup and level design are likely to make some people start sneaking around even if they aren't a sneaking character, which is at least enough to make this quest neat. The only thing I think is missing from this would be the ability to disguise yourself as a guard and sneak around, even if such functionality was restricted only to elves. Isn't that a thing? I was like literally about to ask, isn't it a thing where you can be, you can do a hitman style if you're a high elf? Actually, yeah, it's like the UESP was fairly complete about Skyrim in like twenty thirteen, twenty fourteen. Easier the more elf you are. I'm going to try it um, on this character who is a Dunmer. I would think it wouldn't work, but I'm still going to give it a shot. Towards the end of this dungeon, we see a Thalmor Justiciere and his pet elf torturing some poor soul over information about an old man named Esburn. Looting the Dossier in this room informs us that the Thalmor don't actually have anything to do with the dragons. Uh, fair enough. I did not see that one coming. After we kill the tor- what? That didn't sound ironic. Were you genuinely surprised that the Thalmor didn't have anything to do with the dragons? Of course they didn't. I didn't think that my first Skyrim playthrough. Well, in fair, the Thieves Guild guy, that's a missable thing. Torturers, we learn that this guy thinks that there's an old man named Esburn in Riften. After we free the guy, the elves figure us out and hold Delphine's contact hostage, saying that if we escape, they'll kill him. And this son of a bitch, honest to God, says I'm dead anyway and punches the guard in the face so we can escape. This, this, this hero here starts a melee combat and blocks the stairwell so the, the guards can't get by. And right before... Don't, I don't I don't think this song is copyright claimed. Get it? He did the thing. He did the thing where he he said he just called them elf guy number 1337. He did the thing. 
All right, let's move on. We escape back to Delphine after having stolen information from the embassy and inform her that the Thalmor are looking for a guy named Esbern, who, as it turns out, is a friend of hers, and one of the last remaining blades. He's apparently hiding out somewhere among the slums of a town called Riften, and we're tasked with searching for him. While we're in the town of Riften, I think it's a perfect time to discuss one of the major talking points and frequently brought up supposed positives of Skyrim. Skyrim has rather often been applauded as a game that has a very alive world, meaning that the world seems to function in a way that makes it seem like the setting of the game is an actual yes. living, breathing place with as Call much it out. randomness and interaction as our real world. Observe once more. Skyrim, this is the best game ever made. Shut up. Holy shit, this world is so fucking alive, it's crazy. Everything is dynamic and it all works. This oh is amazing. God. I don't even know how they did this. Bethesda is a company that knows exactly what the fuck they're doing. I have such wicked respect for these guys. Oblivion. Which is a statement I personally am not so sure that? about. First off, let me explain a few things about how Skyrim and pretty much all of Bethesda's RPGs, save for maybe Fallout 4, which I haven't cracked open yet, are made in terms of how NPCs wait, interact. Wait, wait, wait. I thought he made the Fallout video by this point. How the fuck does this work? You literally showed Fallout 4 as an example earlier. What the fuck? Yeah, I literally have no clue who actually whose like video that was. Is the issue. Having footage of a game doesn't mean you played the game. It wasn't just footage. He literally brought up Fallout 4 as a positive example. When an NPC in Skyrim or in Fallout 3 slash New Vegas is created, it is spawned with a very limited set of actions it can perform or react to. Unless something goes wrong, an NPC will be able to say a basic greeting line, attack or defend itself from hostile characters, run away from a hostile character if it has been allowed to do so, and stand around. Pretty much every other action you see an NPC in Skyrim or Fallout performing is something that a developer has added to a list of actions they can perform. Whether this action is something only this character specifically is allowed to do, or something that the developers plan on having multiple or many characters do. Every single one of these actions is called a package, and each package is something that is crafted by and implemented by a developer. They don't get randomly added to characters as long as the engine is working as intended. This means that the developers over at Bethesda have absolute 100% control of what packages go to what NPCs, which means that any NPCs doing something that they shouldn't do is guess whose fault. No, not the Jews. It's <laughs> Oh, I like the humor. A good joke catches you off guard. Bethesda's world designers, come on guys. Additionally, all NPCs in Bethesda games are created individually by a developer, even the ones that appear to be randomly generated in-game, like bandits, which are made from NPCs that are used as templates for certain levels of random generation, but are still 100% customizable by the developers. Now, what does this exactly have to do with Skyrim's living world? Well, a lot, considering the system determines how every NPC reacts to things around them that aren't scripted events. First off, let me say that it is very- Do you think that guy who defined made-up words caught up yet? Uh, there's a chance he, he got, he like, got dropped off or something. It's true that Skyrim has an inordinate amount of packages when compared to Bethesda's other games, both the ones preceding it and the ones succeeding it as far as I can tell. And it is true that some of these packages are put to good use, namely towards making the towns in Skyrim seem bustling with activity, often seen in marketplaces where buyers and sellers are talking about goods and advertising product. However, I wouldn't go as far as to say that Skyrim's world overall is a very living place, especially when it comes to how NPCs react to certain situations. Now once again, I have to give Bethesda credit. NPCs can react to a lot more situations in Skyrim than they can in any of their other games. But I have to ask what yes. the point of many of these reactions is. For example, something as specific as dropping a piece of armor on the ground can elicit an NPC to approach the player and ask them if they can have the armor for themselves. But if, say, someone in a town gets attacked by wolves, the only response you're going to get is the NPCs fighting off the wolves, which is just the AI's normal reaction to any instance of fighting. Followed by, usually, a that's enough of that and nobody talking about it. You can walk right up to the person who got attacked and be met with their standard affair of three or four generic responses and no one else seems to care about the event right after it ends. The closest to a meaningful interaction I got from the AI was a husband and child running into their house and saying, please leave me be, after their wife and, obviously, mother died. And mind you, that's only from those two. Everyone else in the town will walk up to the body of the woman, say, what happened, and then walk away. Like I said, a lot of work was put into making these incredibly specific interactions, but besides novelty, which is going to wear off quickly, what exactly does having an NPC pick up some armor I dropped add to the game? Wouldn't it have been better served to use the man hours wasted on that to make more important reactions, like when dealing with death, or corpses, or theft, or really anything? Does have- They respond to death, and corpses and theft. Having an NPC talk to you about some silly thing you did actually make the world seem that much more immersive. I really don't think it does. 
I couldn't really care if an NPC has a capability to detect if I eat a cheese Danish or not. I'd rather the NPCs have a fleshed out system for dealing with major events and crimes, which in comparison to Fallout 3 have barely improved. Mind you, this isn't even bringing up the part where a lot of these small packages don't even function properly. <laughs> Anyone who caught my Skyrim stream from about a month ago now might remember the time where a bandit whose camp I was in the process of attacking was the person who asked me if they could have a leather armor I looted off of their friend who I had just killed. And I've had multiple guards tell me how they detest two-handed weapons while wielding greatswords. Now you might say those are just bugs, but I have a feeling they aren't just bugs, they're oversights. Remember all that yeah, technical crap? It's not, it, uh, not bugs, oversights. I like that line. We went through about how NPC packages are set by the developer who can make sure certain packages aren't a part of certain NPCs' routines. Yeah, that was important for a reason. It's oh, okay, so like it would just it would just be like it wouldn't be too much effort to like have it so that if the guard is holding a two handed weapon, they don't use a specific voice line. But it seems like you you loop back into that. Why is Bethesda wasting development hours on such minor things? And also, it's sort of that uh, that typical thing of like, you're complaining about a presence, but you're not noticing all the absences. What's all the weird stuff that Bethesda did actually address that like you just aren't thinking of because it's not immediately apparent? I'm trying to think of what a good example would be, but it, yeah, it's like, um, it's hard to come up with. It's because a lot of these pointless little things the NPCs can do were distributed to NPCs who shouldn't be able to do them, and not enough care was put into place to make sure the NPCs aren't saying or doing something that totally breaks the player's immersion. I mean, again, it, it's sort of that, like, not all man hours are equal kind of mentality so, like especially after like the bruce nesmith thing like learning how they developed radiant system i mean it's like you know man hours is not something where it's like oh there's just eight thousand man hours that went into this game and we we could apply those man hours flatly to this other thing and now it'll be better it's like you know not that big a deal that they went ahead and added the ability for npcs to respond to you dropping armor which was supposed to be the chief benefit of having these minuscule interactions in the first place. And again, that's not even mentioning all the repeated barks the NPCs go over, the most famous of which probably being the shittiest meme of all time, but that I took an arrow in the knee that everybody loathed from 2011 onwards. And of course, all the other infinite numbers of examples, like, Take a look! I hear they're reforming the Dawn God! You get the point. It's also not just a matter of dialogue options that make Skyrim's world feel unresponsive, it's how it treats the player's actions, or more accurately how it doesn't treat the player's actions with any kind of a meaningful response. Now this also needs a disclaimer because once again small things like stealing a blacksmith's supplies can trigger response from them, like said blacksmith sending bounty hunters after the player, but larger, more important actions seem to be not very important to the people of Skyrim. You'd think being the Dragonborn, or being a Stormcloak, or Imperial, or a Necromancer, or a number of other things would carry some amount of social baggage with it, especially considering I'm supposed to be, you know, the one and only Dragonborn, who's kind of currently in the process of saving the world. But yes. apparently not. I have played Skyrim for 205 hours, plus some change from when I owned it on my Xbox. Hey, the number's gone up. ...as of the time of this recording. And not once can I recollect anyone doing anything about me being a Dragonborn, or wearing faction colors, or... I mean, you get the note from a friend... But yeah, that's basically it. Joining one of the factions, or killing a bunch of people in a different town, or doing a bunch of quests in different towns, like repairing the Gilda Green Tree, or becoming the Thane. Let me compare this to a small moment in Fallout 2, where what the player is wearing drastically changes how one of the game's major settlements deals with them approaching the town of Vault City. If the player approaches Vault City in their Vault suit, they'll be given a free day pass and counsel with the town's leaders because Vault City is trying to make contact with any other vaults from around California. If they're wearing anything else, they'll be treated as part of the common outside rabble and be forced to go and find something of value to bring to Vault City to get their day pass, and they won't be given any counsel with the town government. Just think about the att I agree with that, but Skyrim doesn't really have enough meaningful outfits to have this kind of thing. Like, um, 
Honestly, the two offending things is you have the Imperial outfits and you have the Stormcloak outfits and maybe the Forsworn outfit. Um, again, I feel like this is such a minor thing that it's like, if it was in the game, I feel like we would instead be hearing criticism about how like those development man hours should have gone towards like fixing some other issue. You could have fine clothes too. Yeah, yeah. I guess you could have that because like Morrowind would address uh, the the quality of the clothing that you were wearing. So like they wouldn't really mention if you had common clothing, but if you were wearing like extravagant clothing, then people would like mention how well dressed you were. The Brotherhood outfit. Well, okay. The Dark Brotherhood having a signature uniform is fucking stupid. But anyways. Like I said, again, he's opened the door of the why did Bethesda waste man hours doing X when they could have spent it fixing Y. And I feel like that's going to kind of, that, that always kind of bites you in the ass because it's like, this is a really minor thing. Tinted a detail that has to go into even thinking of something like that. Now, fair enough, Fallout 2 isn't chock full of details of this caliber, but Skyrim isn't either. But the thing is, Fallout 2 also has just a bunch of people commenting about your guns and gear like Skyrim. But unlike Skyrim, it also has a world and even a UI that reacts to your decisions. For example, if you kill a child, you'll be ousted by almost every community in the game, and you'll even get a specialized title. Similar effects happen if you join the Slavers Guild. The town of Modoc can be damned to starvation if you don't bring a truce between them and the Slags, who will also die out if you fail to amend their relationship. If you marry or divorce your possible spouse, you'll get a different unique title, and if you purposefully- Okay, so I've had a weird thing going on recently, which is that I've had a lot of, like, NPCs start to run in fear away from me, and I'm really curious. Does Bethesda- or does Skyrim- make lower level NPCs scared of you after a certain level. I, I'll i clarify, I don't have the perk that makes NPCs run away from you if they're on fire at, at, at low health. This is just like, I've had like Forsworn and Bandits like run away from me. It's a really weird thing because I've, I don't recall ever having that before. I'm not going to say it's an issue. I mean, like, I'm not having town NPCs running away from me. I'm having, like, opponents run away from me. Like, they're scared. Which, I mean, is the reasonable thing to do. That's, like, what you would expect from somebody who's, like, famous for being able to cast infinite fireballs and raise armies of the dead. So I'm really curious, like, no, like, yeah, I've had full health enemies, like, they take a little bit of damage and they run away. If you take illusion perks, it affects flames. Really? Because, like, the thing I would expect is once you reach a certain level, the lower level bandits that obviously stand no chance against you would actually start to, like, try and run away from you. That's what you would expect. And so, like, I would say, well, Skyrim's kind of dumb because I'm, like, famously the Dragonborn. You know, I have infinite fireballs and I have, like, I can I raise, literally raise armies of the dead. And, um, and, like, now the bandits are genuinely running away from me. So I, I'm, like, really confused. Like, like, what's causing this? And, um, it, like, did Bethesda actually account for the fact that, um, account for this? Because I will admit, this current character is fucking scary. She's literally, she's like va fucking vampire lord who, like, <laughs> like, I'll say it again, has infinite fireballs and raises armies of the dead. Not like one or two dead people, like literally runs around with a gang of 30 dead bodies fighting for her. Yeah, I, I'm wearing Daedric armor, but it's all like anniversary edition stuff.
fully blow up the Gecko power plant, you'll be banned from entering Vault City because you've contaminated their water supply and screwed up one of their power supplies. This is of course just a small sampling of a very deep set of examples, but hopefully you'll get the point. These small little details aren't in and of themselves a bad thing, mind you. It's almost impressive that some of these packages are in the game at all, but something like this should be added to support- What? I thought it was a waste of development man hours. More important efforts to flesh out the world, not to replace them. The issue of the world's livingness- no, 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 no. You are vastly overestimating what the kind of stuff Anniversary Edition does. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, I will put money on it. That there is not something in the, cre in the Anniversary Edition, Creation Club content, that is causing NPCs to run away. It's got to be something from base Skyrim. Like, you guys don't seem- some of you guys don't seem to believe just how fucking lazy Anniversary Edition stuff is. This only gets worse once you play the game enough and start to get the repeated dialogue lines, which makes the NPCs seem like robots. And gets even worse once you notice that a lot of these packages, especially the ones in the towns, will repeat upon themselves. These minor details are good for novelty, but they're not good for much else. It would have been better served to have actually used the time spent making all of these stupid little packages Please to make the world make react in a realistic again. way. Here's just a couple of hypotheticals from the top of my what, head. Th this was like, th that was their goal, was making the world react in a realistic way. People realistically respond to you dropping weapons in the street. I mean, in the real world, they would respond to that. Like, I can't go to Walmart and just drop a actual fucking sword on the ground and, ex like, not expect the manager to come up and ask me what the fuck. Right? So, in the same vein, it makes, like, I feel like you would just be calling out, like, the, the the NPCs don't account for the player dropping dangerous weapons in environment if it wasn't in the game. What is the worst piece of AE content? Well, that's sort of the thing is, um, there's a lot of anniversary edition content that's literally just, you read a note, you go to a place, you do it. Um, I would say Ghost of the Tribunal is pretty bad. Um, it's badly implemented, and it, I now am just, like, every hour being harassed by infinite ash zombies. And it's like, okay, zombies, the zom the regular zombie mod, adds zombies, like, frequent zombie attacks. But you get something from that, you get more flesh, right? Uh, the Saints and Seducers adds, like, frequent kind of attack. Like, it, there's too many mods that add, like, attacks. It's really dumb. The Ghost of the Tribunal one adds ash zombie attacks they don't drop anything and they are like super hard to kill they don't do a lot of damage they just have way too much fucking health so it's like the most annoying thing that like i was in markarth and i like i was setting i was setting myself up to become thane of markarth and like these ash zombies just came into the city and like started killing all the guards well they didn't kill anybody because they don't do any damage but it's like yeah, it's just these fucking ash zombies that use their fists and d refuse to die. Why would ash zombies even exist at this point? It's the dumbest thing. Like, Dagothar didn't even come back. It was just some, some like, sixth house guy that was, like, wearing Dagothar's mask. And for some reason, he can now just send infinite ash zombies after me, after his death. It is legitimately, like, one of the dumbest things that, like keeps repeatedly um keeps like repeatedly happening to me can the cc content be disabled well that's the thing is you can't like go to your mod list and disable the cc content that you want you have to like go into the game files and delete it and then stop it from installing but yeah like anniversary edition actually makes the game worse with its inclusion completely unscripted for a few seconds. Let's think. After the first dragon attacks on Whiterun, you could have smaller towns trying to build up walls or hire guard forces to protect themselves. If you become a known member of the Thieves' Guild, you could be banned from certain towns without having to sneak in. If you you lead one of the guilds in Skyrim, maybe you should be unable from holding a monopoly on leadership positions in all of the other ones like you can now, or outright banned from joining any of the other guilds. And if you fix the Guild of Green and Whiterun, maybe have any followers of Kinnereth look slightly more favorably upon you. Again, a small set of ideas, but having consequences like this should have been a priority when making Skyrim. At least Why would they waste the development hours implementing those things when they should be fixing the basic... <laughs> I, I mean, I don't want to have to keep saying it, but yeah, like...
Sure. Are you saying more content equals more bad? Yes. If you're going to add more content, it has to be good. At least if a living, breathing world was supposedly something the Bethesda team wanted to get out of Skyrim. Now, that tangent went on for longer than I had anticipated, but it unfortunately has not given me enough time to find this Esburn guy. You complain about the CC content, but it sounds cool to me. Really? It sounds cool to you. Do you like having 5,000 fucking side quests? Do you like getting mobbed by the courier every time you leave your house? Do you enjoy getting randomly attacked by enemies who give you shit all because you completed a quest? Do you like all the random nonsensical bullshit that you encounter? Do you like broken equipment? Yeah, okay, well then you're just a fucking moronic contrarian. for but it has given me enough time to find something more important it sounds cool it sounds cool really yeah you're just saying shit to try and like rally like rile people up so uh congratulations Love. Oh. That's right, Skyrim has romancing elements in it. However, they are such a massive afterthought, I'm not even sure why they're in the game. Basically, the extent of the romance in Skyrim is marriage. You can marry an NPC, a whole heap of NPCs in Skyrim, and you do so just by wearing a necklace, finding your preferred NPC, and asking them to marry you. That's actually it. Those are the only requirements. Once you're wed, you can choose to have your spouse live in your house with you, and once you're there, they'll run an off-screen store and occasionally give you some cut of the cash it earns. And, um, that's kind of it. The best part of having a spouse is that she serves as a blood bank. <laughs> She's like, uh, like having cattle for a vampire. Marriage is kind of the extent of real life romance. Well, it, it's the same thing, like, they don't have, like, dedicated followers. They just have, like, a bunch of generic NPCs. And I think in the same way, um... Like, they don't have, like, interesting marriages. They just have, like, you just marry generic NPCs again. Man's got a drink. You can get divorced. Or, well, woman's got a drink. And if you miss your wedding day, your spouse get, gets angry with you, which is uh, kind of funny, I guess. I mean, it's a cool detail. I mean, it like, again, it's not a big deal. Like, I, like they, I'm sure being able to... Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Before I say that. I'm sure being able to get married was not, in fact, on the box. But, benefit of the doubt, I'm going to go check. Alrighty, I've got myself uh, uh, got myself two copies of Skyrim here. They're both for the Xbox. Um, this is just what I could find as fast as possible. I got the standard edition that I bought day one. There's a map of Skyrim. I actually didn't know where that was, so now I have that. Uh, this is the physical map of Skyrim. That's cool. Uh, and I have the legendary edition that was shipped. Uh, for the Xbox as well. Right here. Let me just uh, look through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, they don't really have a big like sizzle reel of features on the back here, but uh, yeah, it doesn't look like one of the main advertised features. It doesn't appear to be uh, marriage. Mm. Uh, let's check and let's check legendary edition. Now it's mostly the same, but it like says it as DLC, but. Um, 
Yeah, I don't see marriage either. Damn. So it looks like marriage is not on the box. Now, honey, it's woman's duty to be blood cattle. I mean, I am a woman. I am a woman. I'm going to open this map really quick. So the map is dated to 4th era 182. Interesting. And it's copyright uh, says 2011. So this must be from like the original one. Not the... I mean... It looks cool. Apparently... There's a geographical feature that Winterhold sits on called Hasrick Head. And for some reason, the Windhelm River is the River Yorgrim, but then it like gets called the White River once it passes what went oh, the White River. Hmm. Now there's a bunch of like cross marks. I'm not sure what they actually correspond to though. Yeah, I don't recall what any of these are. Oh, I think they're standing stones, because that's the lady. Yeah, and that's, those are the guardian stones. Okay, so those are standing stones. Um, anyways. Glad you're all refreshed. I know I didn't tell you to go, but uh, that was your chance. Because you probably just remember someone being hyped about romance before Skyrim's release and compartmentalized it as a big feature and never happened to reassess that view. Well, I think it has to do with Mass Effect, personally. I'm trying. It's all right. Why can't I do this no in Skyrim? Kiss, kiss. Oh, they hugged. You fucks. Is a full highest rating that I can issue. Ten out of ten, and it easily earns the badass seal of approval. I cannot wait to see. All Is Jack the most overrated? Is she rated? Um, but yeah, it's... It's crap. Okay, now, to be totally fair, the marriage in Skyrim isn't a big part of the game, but after Honey Pop, I think I'm entitled and uh, obligated to talk about bad romance in video games, okay? Okay? Then I kind of just wanted to bring this up. I have no idea why I did. I just, I just wanted to, like, in the back of my head. I really just... So we got one line for the Imperials, but a whole section for marriage. Yeah, your priorities are a bit weird. But uh, I guess it is a different part, so maybe you maybe you just learned. Wanted to bring up this point. I swear I'm not trying to add filler to the video. But yeah, overall, this marriage thing is incredibly shallow, and is luckily something Bethesda seems to have fixed in Fallout 4, which is hopefully a fix they don't forget about. Alright, we've stalled enough. Let's get back to the main quest. So where's this Esburn guy? Well, he's in the slums of Riften. To get to Esburn, we, for some reason, have to look for a guy named Brynjolf, who we haven't quite met yet, but apparently Delphine knows him, so I guess we can trust him. He's one of the first people we're going to meet on our way into Riften, and he says that he won't give us any information on this Esburn guy unless we help him out. You can try to persuade or bribe him to give you the info, but if you fail, you're gonna have to do this little stealth chore thing he does. I don't personally get the point of this quest, but I guess it's neat enough that you can bypass it with speech, so it's... Can you bypass it with speech? Let's look it up. Um, what quest is it? Diplomatic immunity? No. A blade in the dark? No, it's after. It's after diplomatic. A quartered rat. Okay, so you can pass it. So what's the level then? Skyrim speech. Let's, uh, quests. Cornered rat. 
It's an easy persuasion check to get Esburn to open the door with persuasion. Don't tell me it's a... Oh my... Really? Okay, so you have to pass a, a level 75 persuasion check. Or 53 if you get the perk. To actually bypass this quest. No need to look it up. This guy sure didn't for a single thing. Why research for a video about a topic? I mean, like... You realize the inherent irony of what you're saying, right? Like, the whole point of this stream is research. So, just because he didn't do it doesn't mean that I won't. not all that bad of a quest. I mean, it's certainly more layered than 90% of the other affair in Skyrim, but it kind of... Maybe because it's part of a faction. Have you heard of the Thieves' Guild? <laughs> I hear they're evil. Highest rating that I can issue, 10 out of 10, and it easily earns the badass seal of approval. I cannot wait to see all the DLC and expansions coming. Now, if you'll excuse me, I gotta play through it again as evil, doing all the Thieves Guild missions, doing all the Dark Brotherhood missions, and doing a few chores for some Deidre Princes. More lore for the, uh, for the meme. Don't you just raise speech by buying and selling stuff slowly? I did it with the trainers. That was like the main thing I trained first because it's the most tedious to raise. So, um, I'm speech 100. I can pass all the speech checks in the game. So I'm actually kind of looking forward to doing all the content now that I can actually pass a bunch of the speech checks. Except the College of Winterhold one because like how the fuck was I supposed to go for 50 levels without access to the college? All right. Wastes your time. After you perform Brynjolf's little scam, he'll tell you that Isburn is hiding in the sewers of Riften. The Retway, as they call it, which just so- You got rid of Lydia and replaced her with Uthgard and didn't mention it. Happens to be a dungeon. Yay. However- Okay, hold on. I'll ask the chat here. How many of you consider- are, uh, uh, You know what? I'll ask it as, as a poll. Is the Ratway a dungeon? I suppose it comes down to whether you're a, d a dungeon liberal or a dungeon conservative. Is the rat way... A oh, no, he didn't ask that. The rat way... He just said the rat way is a dungeon. I mean, if you're a literalist, right, it's a combat area that you have to go through to get content. It's dark, there are tunnels, I hate it, it's a dungeon. But that's the, that's, that's, um, that strikes me as, like, dungeon, very dungeon, a very, very dungeon liberal idea. Uh, we, we around here in these parts are dungeon conservatives, and we say that the Ratway is not a dungeon. Interesting how, like, increasing... I gotta end the poll now while it's in my favor. <laughs> I'll accept it's a sewer level, but I won't accept that it's a dungeon. It Okay, I say it's not a dungeon because there's no big chest of loot at the end. What channel do you use the code? There's a uh, a roll channel that you put the code in. This code.
It's like right below the rules and announcements channels. Hegelian Dungeolectics. It's not self-contained, but you see, it does do the it does do the donut thing because there's a shortcut at the end to um, to go back to the entrance quickly. The Ratway is a dungeon. Sixty percent of human beings disagree. But there was no loot. The dungeons have to have a chest of loot at the end. Yeah, I mean the drawbridge. Because that's a shortcut to the entrance. So it's like a dungeon. But it's missing an important part. Is the Ratway a dungeon? And if it is, have you told your mom that you are straight? Oh, hang on. Ask it as a poll. All right, now let's answer. This one is actually a really enjoyable dungeon. This is the first dungeon I've gotten lost in since I started playing Skyrim, which is You got lost in the Ratway. I can't believe so many people have told their parents that they're straight. Which is something that you honestly start to miss after 100 hours. But I'm also navigationally kind of stupid, so don't take my word for it. Okay, but how did you... How did you get lost? Where did you get lost? I don't think like the UESP even has a map of the Ratway. Because you honestly don't need one. Oh, no, they do. Okay, the rat way. All right, so this is the rat way. So like, you guys can't see my pointer, but um, here, I'll use this as a pointer. All right, so you start here and you go this way. Now this is not this is not a uh, a four way intersection, right? Uh, this is just these like grates just go are over a hallway, but you can't actually like go this way, right? So you go down here and then you go here and you, you drop down in here, and then I think the only way you go, yeah, the only way you can go is this way or this way, right? I think you can go north. I think there's like a secret way up here, but like then you just go through here and you go through here and you go through here and you go through here and it all roads lead there. So there's also like the other parts of the Ratway, like the part where Esbern lives, but it's like it's just as straightforward. Like it's a really weird thing. You got lost at the Ratway. It's good to see that uh, that democracy has won again. I'm sorry, but the Ratway is just not a dungeon, no matter how lost you get in it. What you can't take my word for is how fun the NPCs in this area are. For some reason, the Ratway is full of joke NPCs who all have their own unique barks that are all some kind of humorous statement or a joke. It's, it's almost like it's part of a faction. 
refreshing after being in dungeon after dungeon that's full of Drogar going blah, 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 blah. And you know, speaking of Drogar, I think it's high time for another tangent! Oh come on, don't be that way. This time, let's waste your time by talking about Skyrim's enemy variety. Now, personally, I have a bad feeling in my gut that Skyrim's list of bad guys may not be all that up to snuff, partially because I've already done all the research. But for the sake of the audience, let's do what we did for Fallout 4 and list out all of the enemies in Skyrim, and compare it to a few other games from around Skyrim's time. Note that we won't be counting alternate versions of a single enemy as a new entry. So, for example, polar bears and bears just count as one bear enemy. And all 800 versions of Drogar only count as one as well. Alright, let's start. We have... Uh, is that really fair? Is that really fair? Come on. There's the, like, main melee Draugr. There's the melee Draugr who has the dragon shouts. There's the, uh, there's the Draugr that can, like, summon Atronax and has magic. And there's the Draugrs that have bows. Sure, I would say that Draugr and Restless Draugr are just different level versions of the same thing. But once you get past Restless Draugr, you start getting into guys that have, like... The, like, the bow enemies and melee enemies are different things. You just describe different weapons they use? Yes, but... You know, a lot of enemy variety is just the type of weapon that the person has, right? Like, you... you would you say there's only one type of bandit... Or that conjurers are the same as ban as like normal bandits? I wouldn't. Like if the if the name of the game is how many different like wildly different enemy types can there be? That just sounds like really dumb and reductive. I don't well, I think Restless might get frostbite if they're lucky. I don't know. I don't think Draugr have um magic conjurers are not bandits they're conjurers but some bandits have magic and i mean even then you would distinguish conjurers from necromancers because they both have magic but they have different magic one summons things the other raises the dead and then of those types vampires are even more different because they have different magic despite the fact that they can summon and raise dead yep and those are bandits okay so so you acknowledge that there can be a distinction between Draugr, like people who use weapons and people who use magic. There are Draugr who use magic! And there's Draugrs that have dragon shouts. So is Skeleton Archer that different from a Draugr Archer? Well, I wouldn't say, like, I honestly wouldn't say, like, the only thing that's different about any of the Skeletons is that they die in one hit. But for the most part, yeah, skeletons are just basically Draugr. Like, I think they even have the same animations. Bandits, Forsworn, Ghosts, Warlocks, and or other associated mage bandit types, whatever you want to call them. Afflicted, Vampires, Draugr. Yeah, okay, the... It's weird to count Afflicted because it's just one extremely tedious dungeon that the Afflicted are in. Bears, Chorus, Wolves, Sabercats, Skeevers, Mudcrabs, Ice Wraiths, Horkers, Werewolves, Trolls, Giants, Mammoths, Dragon Priests, Dwarven Spheres, Spiders, and Golems. Fall you should list it on the screen, personally. Fulmer, Spiders, Skeletons, Hagravens, Shades, Spriggans, Wisps, Daedra, Firestorm and Ice Atronox, Slaughterfish, I guess, and Dragons, of course. Okay, now let's see here. That's, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 36 enemies if my count's not off. Not bad, Skyrim. At least it is for now while we omit all of the little details. Now let's peer into the list of enemies provided by another open-world dungeon-crawling action RPG from around Skyrim's time that features dragons as a major antagonist. Dragon's Dogma. Dragon's Dogma has Chimera, Garm, Wyrms, Wyverns, Ogres, Cyclopses, Cockatrice, Hydra, Griffins, Skeletons, Harpies, Gargoyles, Evil Eyes, Nameless Men, Phantoms, Dragons of various sorts, Saurians, Liches, Goblins, Golems, Members of the Salvation, which is a cult, Drakes, Wolves, Zombies, Bandits, which includes various types of bandits, like Bandit Mages, and... Wait, uh, wait, wait. 
So you'll count the delineation of bandits and bandit mages, but you won't count the delineation of bandits and bandit mages in Skyrim. That to a total of... 25 enemies after filtering out any enemies that have an at least sort of similar function to other enemies. Now you might be asking, Caption, you just said Skyrim has more enemies. What's the problem here? The problem here is that not all enemies are created equal, and this is very much a case of quantity over quality. Let me ask you, what's the difference between fighting a common Drogar and a bandit in terms of strategy? Bandits have different behavior packages so that they... Like, bandits are more likely to run in fear. Draugr are affected by turn undead stuff. They have different resistances. You can't, you can't, um, ca you can't use like poison or fury on a Draugr. You can't, um, uh, fuck, what was I thinking of? The point is, there's differences between the two enemy types based on like resistances and weaknesses and the sort of tactics that you can employ. Like, if you're a poisoner build, then Draugr are the worst fucking thing for you because they don't accept poison. Oh yeah, Draugr can shout, Draugr can summon stuff a lot more often than bandits will. You can't kill a bandit with healing. Does that work? I'm curious if that works. You spam light attack on both. Well, that's down to, that's a skill issue then. It, it, like, if all he thinks combat is, is just you right click, or well, you left click on an enemy and, until they die, then yeah, of of course they're similar, but I feel like he's gonna bring up that like the dragon the dragon's dogma enemies have all kinds of different weaknesses and strengths and resistances and what have you, and it's like Dawnbreaker isn't as effective against bandits. Well yeah, that's kind of my point, is like you have turn undead spells, which let's be honest, are just fear for undead. But, I mean, you also have, like, Guardian Circle and, like, all the restoration magic that's built around fighting the undead. They are both normal human enemies whose primary methods of threatening the player are to either swing a sword at them or to shoot arrows. Which is also... Okay. the same tactics that skeletons use, and um, also happens to be the same attacks Forsworn can employ, which also happens to be what Dramora do, and is also what ghosts kill people with. Uh, hell, vampires and afflicted are the same way if you take off their one extra spell in that like, spit attack. What about the dragon shouts? So, so what I'm taking away is, I mean... Draugr have different animations than human characters anyways, but, like, so what I'm taking away is, basically, if Skyrim presented the illusion of visual spectacle with each enemy, then, the, the but was exactly the same mechanically, the only difference is animations, then it would be fine. Um, oh, and in the vampire's case, it's literally just a spell that makes her health bar go down, so it's not like you can prevent it or anything. And makes their health bar go up. It's literally absorb health. Plus, they're magical enemies, and they have all the undead rules, so it's like, um, you know, poisons don't work. Different resistances, weaker to fire, stronger against frost. Sure, but again, it's the illusion of variety. And I've never been somebody who's particularly bought into the illusion of variety. I'm all about mechanics. So it's like, okay. Like, like I would rather have the Oblivion Fireballs, which is a super bad, like, visual effect, than the Skyrim Fireballs that look cool.
Like, it looks cool. And then... You got the Oblivion Fireball. Why is it upside down? So what's this music? Oh, this is a mod. Okay. Which, that's what the Oblivion Fireball looks like. But I would rather have the Oblivion Fireball because it's better mechanically. How about we have the mechanics of Oblivion Fireballs and the visual of Skyrim ones? Yes, that's my point. Is that mechanically the Oblivion Fireballs are better. It, my, my whole point was, I don't really care about the visual difference. It's entirely about the way that, that the Fireball works. Why is it better mechanically? Because you're presented the ability to customize the Fireball. How big you want it to be. How much damage you wanted to do whether you wanted to do all its damage at once or damage over time those are all options you're given in oblivion in skyrim the fireball does exactly this amount of damage every time unless you augment it with perks or potions and it will do exactly this radius of damage and it'll have ex and it'll burn for exactly this long you know what i mean like the the entire basis of saying that skyrim has better fireballs is that it's prettier That's related to a lack of spellcrafting skill, not the base fireball, but... Okay. So it's not actually the fireball that's better. Yes, the, the difference between them is... Oh my god. They literally, all they do, all a fireball does, guys, is it hits an area, and then it calculates an area of effect, and it does damage to everything that's in that area of effect. It does the same thing, that same basic concept, in Morrowind, Oblivion, Skyrim. The mechanical differences, Morrowind and Oblivion have spellcrafting, the mecha the, and Skyrim doesn't. The animation differences, you know, Morrowind fireballs look like this, Oblivion fireballs look like this, Skyrim fireballs look like this. Not that specifically core spells in Skyrim are worse than in Oblivion. No, that that too. I mean, what are you talking about core skills? Like, like what's a core spell in Oblivion? A core spells in Oblivion are just pre-made spells that were made with the, with the same spell crafter that you get access to. You realize that's all a pre-made spell in, um, in Oblivion is, right? And let's not forget the fall, but I think you get the point. Skyrim's pool of enemies suffers from multiple problems having to do with repetition and a lack of different strategies among enemies that belong to the same category. Not only I mean, honestly, Skyrim's enemy problem has to do with, like, the fact that its, its enemies are so foolhardy in trying to fight the player that, like, they unnecessarily get themselves killed in ways that don't make sense. Of course he skips the Falmer. I don't know if he's fought the Falmer. Like, does anybody recall a clip he's shown where he's fought Falmer? Yet. Does Skyrim have like four reskin versions of many? You're making a good point. I just mean in reference to what Caption is saying is it's weird to make. Well, okay. So my point is the difference between the systems. People think that Skyrim's magic is better than Oblivion's because of the spectacle of it looking better, of it having better visuals. And that, that's kind of my point, is you can get away with stripping the mechanics down and dumbing the things down if the spectacle looks cooler. Like, I made this argument with a shotgun. Shotguns are mechanically consistent. You can take the same shotgun that does the same amount of damage and has the same spread of pellets 
and this the, all the same properties and the only difference is an animation difference where it's like what's the lamest shotgun cool shotgun animation what's the lamest shotgun animation in games you know what look, look, fuck it this works Oh, so this is just reload animations. But, I mean, you sort of get my point. Is like, um, you could swap out the shotgun animation for something shitty and then give it to players, and most players would, like, see it as a worse shotgun simply because it doesn't look as cool. The Doom 3 shotgun? Yeah, let's look at it. Oh, this seems to be a I'm proving you wrong statement. I mean, like, it looks... I don't like its design, honestly. It sounds cool. I don't know. It, it sounds too much like a 50 caliber. People will use a statistically worse weapon because it looks better. Well, I mean, like, it's the it, same gun, different animations. People will think that it's like it one is worse than the other mechanically. The enemies do the game's level scaling nature, but like we've already established, many enemies function in the same way regardless of being different enemy types. Different enemy types said with some air quotes, by the way. Oftentimes, the differences between enemies are either negligible or so minor that they don't even shake up how the player deals with the new enemy, or it doesn't even make enough of a difference to be noted in the first place. Let's go back to our example of Draugr and Bandits. The difference between a level 1 Bandit and a level 1 Draugr is that Draugr are immune to poison, and uh, have a 50% resistance to frost magic, which is something many Bandits can also have depending on which race they spawn at. Dragon shots? Is he gonna do it? Yes. That doesn't change how you deal with them. All it means is that you just may as well not apply your poisons. You're still just gonna run up and hit it until it dies. Isn't that a difference in how you apply, approach it, though? Because now instead of poisoning the enemy, you have to use something different. Like, I feel like his perspective is extremely limited by the fact that he did a single melee playthrough. And he kind of just superficially touched on the other mechanics. So it's like everything he sees is from the perspective of Sword and Board. He doesn't he hasn't tried like doing a pure poison build and realizing how much of a nightmare the Draugr are to deal with when you finally face an enemy that is resistant to that strategy. Or of course die to it if your numbers aren't big enough. The AI itself is also unchanged. The Drogar and Bandits both run up with their weapon and attack you and maybe block on occasion or do a strong attack. It's not like bandits make use of extra tools like bombs or something, or Drogar make use of the fact that they're dead to do anything special. Nothing of the Sort. They're the same damn thing, just as they were with the Forsworn and all those other enemies we listed above, except for maybe vampires, because they occasionally bring something back to life to help them. Just for comparison's sake, let me compare a basic undead and Dragon's Dogma to just the fighter class bandits, mind yourself that there are three other classes of bandit who all have their own unique weapons and fighting styles, to each other. The basic zombies in Dragon's Dogma have two attacks. They can slap at the player, or whatever else, with their gross uncut nail things to deal physical damage, and have a grapple attack where they stun the target and bite them until they break themselves free. Multiple zombies can join in on the grapple and pile onto the damage that this attack does. Unlike bandits, zombies are most commonly found at night and are especially immune to damage when they're getting up, and are especially vulnerable to fire, holy, and topor attacks since they shamble very slowly, and making them any slower may as well just stun them. Cause they're zombies. Sometimes they even outright crawl on the ground to get to the player. They try to swarm the player as well as they can. Their AI is a little bit mindless, because they're zombies. Though oftentimes the only players that are going to be able to outswarm are people who are melee attackers, because they're slow. Like, I don't remember them looking like that. Like, the majority of the time he's talked about fighting zombies, he hasn't shown fighting zombies. So it's like... You know, basically, with, with this example, I'm having to base it off of, like, my kind of increasingly distant memories of how the zombie encounters went in Dragon's Dogma. Which I will admit, I recall liking them. 
I thought they were neat. I would definitely say that Dragon's Dogma has more enemy variety. But I would say that, like, like it's not that different. You know, melee characters still just melee attack, melee attack, melee attack. You can be reductive with anything. zombies. In comparison, bandit fighters are the tankiest of their kind, employing either a sword and board, sword and shield for those of you who don't know what that means, or a two-handed weapon. Bandit fighters can have up to seven different special attacks that they actually share with the player's pool if you're the warrior class, though they can- That's a really odd-looking dre- or, fuck, messed that one up. That's a really odd-looking zombie. Can't use them all at once, it's dependent on their equipment. They do, however, always spawn being able to use the Onslaught and Impale abilities, which allow them to, respectfully, perform the warrior's basic three-attack combo and perform a strong stabbing attack that can knock back small targets. And in addition to that, they may, of course, also spawn with another or multiple other special attacks from the remaining five leftover special moves that they can perform. Now let's talk about the part where Dragon's Dogma is a really bad fucking, like, town RPG. Oh, weird. It's like they had different priorities. Jagger's Dogma, you have magic armors which suck ass as a melee fighter, but otherwise, yeah, things are weak to being hit with sharp sticks. Well, yeah, like, I played a wizard, and I got all kinds of variety to take care of things. My friend played a warrior and literally just spammed the trigger buttons to kill everything. Actually, I don't know if he used a controller or not, but uh, you, you gotta get my point. Like, you can go full warrior in this game and be fine. Respectfully... I'm going to disagree. You can say Dark Souls is just weight roll attack. Yeah, I mean, like, you... Yeah, you could absolutely say that. Because for some reason he like thinks that the sort of mechanical options that you are given, the few mechanical options that you are given in Skyrim aren't valid. Full Warrior in Skyrim is kind of the same too. That's my point. That's my point. That's his point. He's playing a sword and board character that just spams left mouse button. And what I'm saying is that you can also get away with just spamming left mouse button in Dragon Zogma. You can do that with any game. You If you are... Disingenuous enough, you can literally say it about anything. Fighters also have a special charged up heavy attack that can- It would help a lot if he was actually showing what it was like to fight, you know, zombies and fighters. I don't recall it being too difficult to find either of those enemies. Devastated targets health bars, sometimes outright one-shotting whatever they're aiming it at, but are easy to block or dodge. Bandits, unlike zombies, go about combat with some hesitation, mostly because if they all attacked in a huge swarm, it'd probably be a little bit difficult to dodge or block properly, but the important part is that they're not slow, they don't just swarm the player as much, and they have totally different techniques to the zombies. And mind you, this is just the fighter bandit. There's four classes total. Bandit packs can spawn with fighters, warriors... Sure, uh, go ahead, take five. You guys need to refresh. Go for it. I'll probably just sit here in a minute. So we'll be, we'll, uh, be back at five after. So, how are you guys feeling about this video? Well, that's sort of the thing is, um, when you're wrong about something, you have the potential to be wrong about that something for a really long time. So it's like, I won't say he's wrong about this. What was it earlier? Like, the Ratway thing. He, like, he was wrong about that, but he was wrong about it for a long time. I think the inherent issue is 
it's this like anecdote single playthrough kind of thing that I feel like is just like markedly unfair. Like this is why I did three play three playthroughs. I didn't do three full playthroughs where I did everything on every character. But I did like I went to the effort to get to level 40 on uh the warrior and the ranger character. Because my kind of goal is, I'm fully aware, if I only do a magic character and I talk about combat, I'm going to be at a significant disadvantage because I won't know what combat was like at the various stages of the game. But by going to level 40 on each character, I have a general idea of what it's like to play, to actually play each playstyle. Yeah, I'm following the three, like, archetypes. The mage playthrough was very different than the ranger character. Magic feels impossible to start at high levels. Oh, yeah. There's going to be some magic stuff that, like, you have to start early or you um, are going to be spending a lot of time just catching it back up to a usable state. You can get pretty far with illusion just using like muffle in dungeons. And I'm not talking like sitting in a corner and grinding muffle. I mean just like, you know, using it every time you want to sneak. You can get pretty far. I barely know what ward does. All right. So, ward spells. Cool idea, not enough opportunities to really utilize or incentivize using them. Um this is probably a symptom of me having the Atronax sign, so I absorb 50% of magic, so I don't really need the ward spell. Uh, basically, what ward spells do is um, they provide you additional armor rating, which is important for mages, but they also provide you a degree of like spell resistance. If they overpower you with a spell that's greater than the level of the ward, so like ward, the basic ward is like 50 points, um, and let's say they hit you with like chain lightning, then it'll if you have a single ward spell up, it'll break the ward and um, they'll like be able to kind of hit you for some minor damage. It's a neat idea, but the issue is that there's not really enough of an incentive to make use of them. Yeah, the main thing I found with wards is like dragons. Because that's like the main enemy that will actually consistently like fire on you. It's much better to use impact and dual cast fire spells to keep mages stunned. Wards are way too expensive. You can minimize the costs, but you can't fully get rid of them, yeah. It's definitely like a uh, it's a hybrid kind of spell effect. Like a battle mage would benefit from it. Illusion mage falls flat with Draugr and dragons. Yeah, that, that's why Illusion Mages kind of suck. And so you'll you'll end up needing like Stagger Stun anyways, because Stagger Stun will kill anything in the game, provided there are like multiple enemies. Whoever didn't make arrows able to be blocked by wards sure made a mistake. I would agree. I, I think the concern was that they were worried that um, if wards were too powerful, that like everybody would feel compelled to use them. So it's like, once again, a new and interesting magical effect was was cucked by the developers worrying that it would be too powerful. So it ends up just not being powerful enough. Like, I feel like you would be better off with a shield as a mage than an actual ward. Because a shield can... You know, wards can absorb incoming magic. Shields can stop incoming magic if you shield bash them. I should put. I should get spellbreaker. Oh, I have spellbreaker, but Jazargo's carrying it. I should. I should actually put it on my character. But the issue is, I dual hand all my magic, so.
Wards block magic and energy, but don't block physical attacks. Well, oh, they increase your armor rating for one thing, but um, there's not enough utility to them to justify using them. Use hotkeys to switch? I don't think you understand. My 1 through 7 keys are already all taken. I don't have enough hotkeys. That's what the quick menu for? No, I don't think you understand. My entire quick menu is taken. <laughs> I mean, there's, I, there, I don't think there's a limit on what you can keep in the quick menu, but, like, it's it's already full. The existence of Spellbreaker invalidates wards. Mild disagree, yes. Um, There is, you can put spell absorption on wards with a perk, which means that you can actually, like, if somebody is actively casting at you, you can actually use wards to regenerate Magicka, which I think is a cool idea. But it's like a high-level alteration perk, which is a... Or is it alteration or is it restoration? Oh, it's got to be restoration because it's a restoration spell, duh. But I mean, like, it's a high-level restoration spell or perk to get that, but it adds, like, a lot of good utility. So it's like if you're fighting a dragon and you're running low on Magicka, you could, like, tank the dragon breath with the ward and end up having more Magicka afterwards. So, uh, let's go. Striders and mages, all of which have different tactics to one another. And that's not even bringing up the part about Skyrim's combat, where every single creature in the game does battle by running at each other and slapping their opponent with their weapon or spamming magic and arrows until something dies. Which is just one of the deep-rooted flaws of the way this engine handles combat and melee. And after all of this, there's the issue with visual variety. Of those 36 enemies, 9 of them are just humans. And if you count Drogar, it's 10, who are just humanoids. Sure, but I mean, you know, bandits don't look like the Forsworn, who don't look like the Conjurers. My issue is that, like, Conjurers and Necromancers dress the same. And my other issue is that everybody wears brown clothes. So, yeah, that that's definitely a problem. But I mean, like, everybody, all the enemies being humans, yeah. I would imagine most people you would fight in life are humans, after all. Now, that's only 27% of the roster. Problem is, those nine, especially Drogar, Bandits, and Forsworn, are the most commonly... Nine out of 30... Oh, yeah, 10 out of 36, 27%. Okay. ...counters enemies in Skyrim rivaled by only maybe wolves, meaning that most of the time you're probably going to see a lot of dudes in clothing instead of many of the fantastical monsters and automata that the artists have designed, which is, at the very least, a misuse of the opportunities... One, you don't want to see a lot of those things because they're really annoying to fight, and two, it's kind of up to you what enemies you fight. Depends on the dungeons you're running at the end of the day. If you want to fight more Dwemer enemies, there's always Dwemer ruins that you could do. Also, stop sleeping on the Falmer. Presented by making a game in a fantasy world, and makes playing the game not only a visually dull experience, but a repetitive one as well. And mixing this with Skyrim's- Yeah, but Skyrim's supposed to be better than Morrowind. So, you know constant use of dungeons as a shortcut for more interesting content like they've been doing in the sewers as we speak. Skyrim starts to feel like it's a cycle of samey content the more you play it. <sighs> After searching around the right way for a while, we locate Esburn, who keeps up with the- Because he got lost in it. Alright, so 1.22.50, he gets back to the story. The dungeon's humorous nature. This will just take a moment. This one always fits. There we go. Only a couple more. Now I think you'll fight all the types of elemental mages on each playthrough. There we are. Come in, come in. Make yourself at home. Wouldn't it? I, I think it's dumb that, like, well, I mean, it makes sense that, like, there would be, like, cryo mages that specialize in that type of magic. But wouldn't it be interesting if mages, like, changed magic type based on who you, like, were fighting? 
Did your expert level note taking make me self conscious about my own note taking? No, not really. If we're taking a lot of notes, it's because he actually says stuff. I mean, think about the last hour or so. And now think about. Now let's contrast this. The Nordic rune eventually. You know, it really ties everything together. And nothing screams Mage's Guild like going through what feels like the same ancient tomb with the same skeletons and coffins and the same lame rotating block puzzles except with the added bonus of a big mage orb at the end of it. So what do we really learn here? One, the Sigic Order was or is a powerful ancient order of mages that were responsible for a lot of advancements in magic knowledge. And two, big mage ball make a big mystery. I'm sent back to show and tell about the big mage ball, and the Archmage says, Fine, but, you know, now you gotta go research it. Go ask the bookman below to give you- The entire video is like this, basically. So that's kind of why there's, like, more notes than usual. At the very least, again, I can say, uh, by default, better actually says things. Might have some wrong opinions. <laughs> wrong opinions. But, fact remains actually says things so it's more valuable and then goes on a bit of exposition about how it's foretold in some kind of prophecy that Alduin is going to destroy the world that the only hope we have to stop him is the dragonborn we tell him we're a dragonborn and he agrees with us to go and regroup with delphine and start putting together a plan to stop the dragons we get him to cart his way back to delphine's place and we have a little reunion between them and they tell us that we're going to need to go to another abandoned ruined dungeon to find some kind of a wall of history that'll tell us what we need to know about Alduin to defeat him we walk out into the town wait what was that sound <laughs> Gotcha, bitch. Can't pull a fast one on me. All right. Man. So Xenoverse came out like while he was making this video. It's interesting. I get, I mean, I don't think of Xenoverse as like an older game, but it is getting up there now. Like, I heard someone say Metal Gear Solid V's gameplay was bad because they always used the Trank Pistol and literally nothing else. Uh, yes. I would say... There's... I would have to analyze it more, but there's something about that game that, like, pushes you towards, like, non-lethality. I think it's that, like, that gameplay loop of, like, kidnapping people and conscripting them into your military that, like, makes you go, I should probably spare everybody. But it's, like... Yeah, it, it's kind of a you thing. Because it's like, you know... You could just, like, take a double barrel shotgun and kill a bunch of people. And it's actually kind of fun. Uh, Metal Gear Solid Five is a really fun game. If you, let lo if you let go of your inhibitions and actually just start fucking killing people. You literally grow a demon horn if you kill too many prisoners. If you kill prisoners, sure. But I mean, like... I don't know, if you're being moderate and, like occasionally having fun and cutting loose with the killing people i i i never had the demon horn problem and i regularly like occasionally just go on a killing spree in metal gear solid 5. usually it's like okay so i stealth like, like i've said it before my stealth philosophy is stealth until things go wrong and then just like play out the combat encounter and metal gear solid 5 is a really good game for that Yeah, I never stab I never stab people with in melee. If they're in melee, I'm all right with like knocking them out. I'm sorry, why are the demon horns a bad thing? A lot of people see it as a bad thing. I mean, I don't know, I've never had that issue. It's a thing. Like I had to go out of my way to try and get the demon horns. I'm on Elder Scrolls V. Captain found himself wasting five days of his life playing Deus Ex, only to return to see that the land was in peril. And in his absence, Majin Todd has stolen yet another mod for Fallout 4. Will Caption be able to solve the sandbox dragon dilemma? Will he ever actually finish this fucking game? Will he get back all of the subscribers that he's lost? And will I stop using the shitty microphone because I'm too lazy to get the real one? Find out now. Alright, we last left off leaving with Delphine and Esbern to go to some place called Skyhaven Temple. 
Now last time I made a snide comment about this mission involving a dungeon, and to a degree I was being totally truthful, but- Oh wait, isn't this an enemy-less dungeon? Like, once you get past Karth Spire, and actually get into the, um, into the Akaviri part, isn't it just, like, purely enemy-less? I never thought about that, um... Sky Haven Temple is the enemy-less dungeon girlfriend. To a degree, I also misled. It's got some spy. Oh yeah, it does have spiders. Fuck. Never mind. No, I Skyhaven Temple is definitely a dungeon. It's an enclosed area. Um, there's combat encounters and puzzles, and there's loot at the end. That makes it a dungeon. Sorry. That's the that's the rules. So close. I realized, I said I was going to make the uh, Red Guard model after this stream. I'm actually going to do the Falmer, the Falmer model. Sorry, there's more elves. I guess I can make the Maormer or whatever the fuck they're called too, but I, just, I don't think that's as necessary. Slow and wife. <laughs> uh, if you're into that, hang on. Where's that picture? I had some pic. I had some. I thought I downloaded a reference picture of a Falmer girl. I guess I didn't. But. I did find this picture. At least Falmer Mommy has an excuse for being blind. <gasps> I could put that in the character. Like she's got the blind eyes. Yeah, I could do that. you. This dungeon doesn't involve the normal dungeon affair, meaning that there's no enemies and just one trap to avoid. The rune itself is unfortunately hampered by the fact that it goes on Delphine and Esber. Yeah, I guess the slowed would be the feeder fetish, the, the Nikikado tier of waifus. ...on schedule, and they walk through the whole thing, so this mission progresses at a very, very slow rate. Yes, it does. Once these two have finished their evening stroll, Esber directs our attention to- Oh, hey, look, it's the trailer thing. Isn't that cool? Okay, so Esbern gives us a history lesson about the ancient blades, and about how the land was ruled over by dragons, and then taken over by mortal men in a rebellion- oh. oh, my bad, I've mistaken this for the Dark Souls opening, excuse me. Okay, now in all seriousness, these two games were made way too close for one to steal from the other. I just think the coincidence is kind of funny. Somewhere in between the history lesson, Esbern tells us that the blades of old used a special shout to defeat Alduin for the first time, and the player along with Delphine come to the con- Well, not the blades, but, you know, the... That's the detail. Do orcs count as tomboy girlfriends? Why wouldn't they? Are, I'm, I'm sorry, are they too masculine for you? Is that the implication that I'm taking away? Is that you like a girl, but you don't want her to be too... You like a girl who's on the masculine side, but there is a point where it's too masculine, and you start to not be into it. Is that my understanding? She's too tough for you. You're never going to be able to hold on to her. conclusion that the Greybeards would probably be the people to ask about specific shouts, so we start making the trek back to their secret fortress to have a talk with them. White Run is in between our ruins and their ruins, so I decided to take a quick stop to perform a few errands and get some supplies for the road. And then he joined the companions, I'm guessing. Skyrim is the first Bethesda title to feature crafting as we know it. Oh, never mind, it's about crafting. Damn. Alright, uh... Don't answer if you've already seen the video. Is he going to spam iron daggers? Again, don't answer if you've already seen the video. All 
All right, so I'm going to assume that uh, most of you would have said, yeah, oh my God, 146 votes and 86% said yes. All right, get ready to be proven wrong. This is going to be funny if like he's like, you're all fucking idiots if you make iron daggers. And then... Uh, <laughs> Today. The ever... Oh no, it was definitely patched by this video. Growingly saturated grab X of Y things and make them Z formula pioneered by old age MMOs and made immensely more popular by Minecraft's 3x3 grid system, which has made crafting a very, very popular game mechanic since its initial release date in around 2009. But I'll be honest, I like crafting. I like building too. In fact, I probably like survival games more than role-playing games, I'll be completely honest. But if only because like role playing or survival games are like where I'm the like the only modern game I've where I've been like getting to scratch the itch. It's like doing fentanyl after losing your heroin hookup. Bethesda, like a lot of other developers, probably caught early wind of the sales of Minecraft's incoming immense popularity and implemented a magnitude of crafting systems into Skyrim. Although admittedly, these systems take more from old school MMOs than they do Minecraft itself. It's the basic formula where all You must love Fallout 4. I actually like the craft like I like the idea of where they went with Fallout 4, not gonna lie. But um I the Fallout 4's other issues kind of override the fact that it, like, offers me those tools. All very much used to these days. Like, the, that's kind of the issue. They're not good enough to really justify me playing Fallout 4 over an actual, like, dedicated survival game. No, I would agree not every game needs crafting. But I'm not, like, the sort of person who actually hates it. In fact, I've liked the last decade of games that, like, have made crafting kind of more popular. How's WoW crafting different from Minecraft crafting? Um, in Minecraft, you like combine objects into a 3x3 three three grid. In World of Warcraft, you just have the reagents in your inventory, and then you press a button and create it, which is how Skyrim does it. Is Which was technically also included in Fallout 3, but not quite in the same way, since that game was more about gathering materials to build a very specific set of equipment. Whereas Skyrim has a more standardized approach, where all of the game's normal equipment can be handmade. One of the things I think Skyrim does better than many other modern day crafting games, oh, however, no. is give your items and it's well, worse. As I said, hand -made it's feet. worse. He's got two thousand leather. Oh my god, this would take so long. Not only to set up, but it's like literally your smithing XP is tied to the value of the item, and you're making almost valueless items. It's not iron daggers, so blow the fuck out. Yep. We lost. We, we overestimated. We set the low we set the bar for low and he hit the ground. He cheated it in. What level is he? He looks pretty low level, so I I wouldn't be surprised. Though this only personally applies to alchemy and enchanting. Alchemy gives you this by allowing you to mix potions from a variety of different Hell, I think the hide helmet's more efficient than the hide boots. Actually, uh, smithing Skyrim. Oh, I'm a, I'm a vicious power bottom. Oh wait, what am I doing? Um, hide. Hide helmet is worth twenty five gold. Although it might be more expensive, but I, I still think like hide helmets are the way they go. When you have 2,000 of each ingredient, um, ratios st stop kind of being a factor. materials, meaning that instead of just getting, you know, okay, I need four tulips, a piece of tree bark, and five cherries to make a health potion, you can make a health potion out of a bunch of different things that you have lying around, as long as they, you know, have the, the specific use to be able to be used in that potion. Different effects for potions can be made from different ingredients, so... 
sure, but I mean, like, I'm sure there's plenty of people who could tell you better ways. Dwarven bows, uh, transmuting iron into gold, and then making rings. Um, hell, iron daggers would probably be better. <laughs> Restoring health isn't just one thing. It can be used from a bunch of different stuff that you have lying around. And if you have a certain ingredient that you prefer to get... Or He's got 700 iron ingots. For the other ones, you can use that to make your health potions instead. And that's kind of where the homemade aspect of that comes in. Enchanting, while not quite the same, does allow you to at least create your own enchanted gear based on a few personal touches. Like using soul gems you filled yourself and naming your weapon. Aside from that, there isn't very much to mention about the crafting in Skyrim, unfortunately. I'm not a big personal fan of crafting systems, but if this is your sort of thing, it's about as good as any... There's not much to mention. Maybe he's making a point that it's fucking stupid that you can become good at smithing for making leather stuff. Well, I mean, that's some, like, 10th dimensional shit. Because all I'm seeing is a guy doing a really bad technique. Any other crap? Like, if you're going to cheat stuff in to level stuff up, why wouldn't you just cheat in gold and make rings? Crafting system out there. It's mediocre. The only thing I'm not quite as confident about is the actual act of gathering the resources. Most of the time, I personally never made use of any kind of mining, despite it very much being a feature in the game. The mining itself, as a specific example, actually seems like maybe a little bit of an aftersight, because there's never a huge amount of nodes in a single area, unless it's a special case example, and most of the time- A special case example. Like a mine? <laughs> Or, you know, you just carry a pickaxe around and, like, mine the nodes that you come across out in the world. Just, uh, just minor, kind of, just minor gamer girl things. Time, the blacksmithing shop right next to the blacksmithing tools that you're using will have a bunch of different ingots and ores that you can just buy off of them. Personally, I would have preferred if every resource for crafting came from a source that didn't involve sitting on something, pressing E, and waiting 10 seconds. Some resources are like this, namely soul gems which come from dwarven structures, and pelts from animals. And there is a very slim chance of metal bars appearing on bandits and other humanoid enemies. So gathering certain materials is more interesting than, like I said, standing on something and pressing E. More leather than a BDSM shop. E, but not everything. And I think that this is more interesting because it doesn't involve oh, no. interacting gameplay mechanics. It's worse! It's worse! Oh my god! No, why? Why? This has got to be beyond a troll. There's no way if he was trolling that he would think to fucking waste resources on upgrading the battle axes. There's no way. This is a- if this is a troll, this is a 20th dimensional troll. Because you get more resources- you get more XP from making new stuff than you do actually, like, reinforcing it. Because I kind of feel tacked on. It's all nicely wrapped up in the core gameplay of going out and killing things and looting them. But yeah, overall crafting's- see, it's average, it's, you know, it's there and there's not much else to really say about that. Once we made it out of High Hrothgar, we questioned Eingar about the dragon, right? I mean- It wasn't a meme, guys. It was not a meme. It's just her demonstration? It, again, if you're gonna cheat stuff in and demonstrate, why wouldn't you do something cool? Or, like, wouldn't, why wouldn't you use the meager resources that you have on hand to kind of demonstrate, like, the scarcity? The new secret special shout we don't quite know about yet, you know, you know. The conversation that follows is actually something I like. It explains a few things about his character without actually explaining them. It shows, but it doesn't tell. And it's nice to not be treated as the end-all, be-all, 100% positive karma paragon, here's your free Ashbringer, oh, righteous paladin, good guy, all of the time. Eingar eventually cools off and agrees to help us with getting the shout because he's a big man of fate and explains that the Greybeards do not actually know anything about Dra- uh, you know, the secret shout. He says that if anybody would know about this, it would be their leader, Parthernax, who lives on the mountain behind a smoke screen of snow that hurts you if you go near it. And also means that he's got some kind of secret or twist about him, because why else would they put this giant blizzard here? To get up to this Parthernax guy, we need to learn a different shout that will allow us to clear through the hailstorm, which involves us- is there anybody who didn't know that Parthenax was a dragon before reaching this point on their first playthrough? I would think the name would be a pretty big hint. Ah, weird. You just, that's not a very Nordic name you got there. Uh, it must be like a lich or something. I don't know. So learning it from the Greybeards again like we did with Fus, Ro, and Da. As you can see, I've already set it up here, so let's just give it a moment. I figure if you didn't see it coming, it's because like you just didn't think about it.
Just, uh, you, you know, gonna take a second. Any minute now? Hmm. Uh, okay, well, you know, while these guys are taking care of their, you know, the, whatever they got going on over here, let's go do some stuff while we wait. Well, what kind of stuff is there to do in Skyrim? Well, what do you normally do in RPGs? Oh, you already know what I'm talking about. I put it off for a while now, so let's finally tackle the side quest. Skyrim has, very much like every other Bethesda title, a physically rather large world, and as such, exploration is often an advertised and core feature of their games. Now, as to whether or not the exploration in Skyrim is good or not, I'm personally not quite sure I'm totally sold on either answer. Because the more I thought about this, the more I started to dig myself a little hole where I had a discussion with myself about exploration and video games. What makes for good exploration and what can be done to shake up the walking around a big place and finding stuff formula, despite that being exactly what exploration is. Now that's a topic for a different late night pizza fuel test of my psychosis, but compared to the average game, I'd have to say that I place my favor in Skyrim overall. If exploration is just walking around and finding stuff, then Skyrim does that quite well. Now to be fair, Skyrim's exploration isn't all it could have potentially been, it's rather uh, infamously vertically ch- Wait. What was that? Oh god, I think I heard a ghost. <laughs> anyway, like I was saying, Skyrim's exploration isn't all that bad. There was a lot of fun stuff to look at and explore, but unlike certain random number generators built on blatant lies pretending to be video games, the stuff you find in Skyrim's world actually has stuff for you to do in it. Weird, right? Who'd have thought that games actually have to have content? That's crazy in 2016. All very late, uh, slightly topical jokes aside, Skyrim's exploration is good, not only because there's stuff for you to go do and find out and look at, but because there's a lot of little random encounters and events that you can find as well, and that sometimes find you. Anything from common thieves trying to steal your purse, to imperial patrols, to events that start minor quests, or events that start major quests, a bunch of drunken guys just having fun in the middle of the snow, the wealth of random encounters in Skyrim is a very big plus to th Oh wow, you say he's not British, huh? What tipped you off? The game, it is a major improvement over Fallout 3's ex exploitable random encounters that could be re-rolled every time you found one of the points where they spawn, and follow New Vegas's overall lack of any real You can do the same thing in Skyrim, if you're crafty enough. Random events. Alright, alright, I've put this topic off for too long. Let's finally talk about the quest. Did you guys know Skyrim has player housing? Yeah, much like Oblivion and Fallout 3 before it, Skyrim has player housing. This is a feature of a now bygone age, however. Games nowadays have superseded this for a far more customizable base building system, even in Bethesda's titles. However, before the time, Skyrim did have pretty great housing on offer, especially notable for all the various containers the game let you show off your coolest gear in. It was such a popular addition that Bethesda included it in Fallout 4's base building minigame for just an extra 25 bucks. I hope a lot of people thank them for that. Okay, by now these guys must have worked out the... Okay, okay, let's talk about quests in Skyrim. Now, I must admit, the quests have been the most daunting subject of this video because, frankly, there's a lot of them, and you have to do- Oh, hey, look, they fixed it, sweet. After a long walk up a big hill with a lot of mist in the way, we finally meet Parthenax, who's a dragon. And you know this dragon is Parthenax because there's no red dot on your compass. Now, Parthenax's identity isn't exactly a huge surprise. I mean, you must have known there was going to be a thing with him after all the mystery and literal walls of smoke placed before him. But the real plot twist is that he's not actually that bad of a character. I can abide this. Highest rating that I can issue, 10 out of 10, and it easily earns the badass seal of approval. I cannot wait to see all the DLC and expansions coming. Now if you'll excuse me, I gotta play through it again as evil, doing all the thieves guild missions, doing all the dark brotherhood missions, and doing a few chores for some Deidric princes. Thieves Guild. Your video title needs to be the only actual Skyrim analysis on YouTube. That would be funny. And in a way, it might end up being true. No, this is this counts. Come on, guys, this counts. Even if um, even if uh, he's wrong about some stuff, I would say that um, Mr. Captions is definitely at the top. He's the generic old, wise, sage, Yoda type of figure, master of an ancient power that finds a main character has potential and helps them hone their skills in said ancient power. 
not a new archetype by any means, but a character that suits it well. The thing I like the most about him are the things that set him apart from just being the role he fills. For example, he has an affinity for talking with people because, you know, dragon language and all that. And he's also kind of a philosopher of sorts. It's not deep, mind-boggling philosophy or anything, but the question he asks are interesting because they align with a new theme of things associated with what the Greybeards are saying, putting into question if what the player is doing... Isn't Mr. Captions the one that isn't on the internet anymore? Yeah, how funny is that? We chased away the one guy that actually said something! This is the future you chose. All because you couldn't handle a couple hot takes about Nier. About your stupid pornographic robot game. But what can you do? Oh no, I'm a Bajmer ghost. No drama rule? Right, right, right. I forgot. It's only been like seven hours. I'm going to be doing like a Skyrim VR playthrough while I write the script. So I might end up having like a lot of um, VR footage I can throw in. Thing is, I don't even hear people talking about Nier anymore. Yeah, that's part of what I said seven hours ago was um, part of the reason. Like anytime a video game fandom is so toxic that it chases off a content creator, very typically other content creators will look at that and say, well, I guess I'm not going to watch that shit. Or, I'm not going to cover that shit. It's actually that good of a thing. The arguments are usually kind of flimsy, however. The only one that really holds weight is part of the- Although I want to know why Will left. I really wish he wouldn't just, like, up and disappear and leave it up to speculation what the fuck is going on with him. Baby, come back. You can blame it all on me. Was he chased away or did he collapse after a little bit of black backlash? Will or Mr. Caption? I really am disappointed, though, if, like... Because that just leaves me confused. Like, literally, like, within a couple weeks of m my first stream on Will, um, he made that Skyrim video. And then, like, less than a week after, or, like, a week or two weeks after we watched that Skyrim video, months after the fact, he, like, disappeared. Pat, what did you do? I brought a man back, and then I killed him. That's why I'm confused. Like, one of those has to be my fault, right? But which one's my fault? Am I responsible for bringing him back, or am I responsible for chasing him off? Why am I responsible? We hardly said anything mean about his video. Unless, like, um... Unless, like, he couldn't, like, handle the fact that I said that the entire video seemed like a joke... Like it, the entire video seemed like it was leading up to a to a punchline that it never came. You're responsible for both. Next, saying that we might just be clinging onto this world of ours too much, therefore preventing anything from moving forward and a new world from being born. But even that is kind of countered by the idea that the world isn't exactly ending naturally. 
Overall, however, this conversation with Parthenax is good. It may not be as enjoyable as what goes on with the brains in Fallout New Vegas' Old World Blues, while retaining much of the length, but it's not grueling by any means. And the conversation does do a couple of neat things, like having Parthenax initiate the shout with us by going through some of the, the dragon culture, like the Elder speaks first and we have to shout at him afterwards, and it's just neat little things that are added onto it that make it a little bit more fun than just talking at somebody. Okay, so he's at this point in the video, he's done all this content, and he still only has the shouts that are given to him. How is that even possible? You know, you know, unironically, I actually believe that the world is a simulation and that there's only, like, one legitimate person living in it. However, I don't believe I'm the legitimate person. I think that the leg that the only real human being in our simulation is a, uh, is a man named Christian Weston Chandler of Ruckersville, Virginia. <laughs> wait, go back. How many shots did he have? He literally only had unrelenting force and- wait, wait. You might have a point. He only had an unrelenting force and whirlwind sprint. Speaks first, and we have to shout at him afterwards. Oh, it's his favorites. Okay. Ah. Oh, God. Okay. It's his favorites menu, not his shots menu. I was going to say. He'd have to have clear skies, so. And it's just neat little things that are added onto it that make it a little bit more fun than just talking at somebody. Parthenax tells us a new shout, and then explains to us that not even he knows the Dragon Ren shout, and that he can't even comprehend it since it was made by humans. In his language. He then tells us exactly- Yeah, that's not exactly the reason. Like, the whole- idea about the dragon run shout is that dragons can't understand it because dragons are immortal and the inherent idea that's being spread by the dragon run shout is the concept of mortality imagine using clear skies is it just me or does it like storm less in skyrim like, I don't think I've ever been in a rainstorm in Skyrim. Because I, I don't have the storm call shout. Exactly what brought Alduin into this world. Turns out the old blades, the same people that made Dragonrend, used an Elder Scroll to send him forward in time and out of their hair. Now, I'll be totally honest, as somebody who hasn't really played all that much Elder Scrolls, I did not expect this to be a time travel story at all. Nothing wrong with this. It's not really a time travel story, though. Because if you pay attention, there's not even, there's not really a time travel element to the story. You might be thinking, don't you go back in time? No. You witness events in the past. That's how memories work. Hell, you do that during the uh, Veramina mission, when you do the Dream Stride, you were... Uh, experience Arandir's memories of the past. So you're only seeing a window into the past. Now you might be thinking, well, Alduin was sent forward. Well, I'm sorry, but we're all traveling forward in time. A time travel story has the implications that you go back in time and change events. No, it's not even a dragon break. He just stops existing for a while and then he comes back at the same place. At a later point in time. I mean, we are all time travelers. We're just stuck going one direction. You're a witness to previously occurring events. 
Yeah, that's what a memory is. There's, it's like, there's a concept of like the closed loop time travel story where everything you do in the past actually happened in your past, but like, it's not even closed loop. You literally change nothing. This, of course, for now. It's just a bit unexpected is all, which, you know, for now, is probably a good thing. Parthenax also explains to us that this is the most climbable, I mean, the most sacred mountain in all of Skyrim. It is somehow linked to the Elder Scroll that sent Elduin forward in time. Parthenax thinks that if we bring the Elder Scroll up to the mountaintop, it'll allow us to go back in time and learn Dragon Ren from the Ancient Blades. You know, I, I gotta say, this here is a convoluted solution to a problem that would have been solved if the Ancient Blades had been smart enough to, you know, you know, write down the shout somewhere, maybe on the giant rock detailing their entire history because they... I think they have to do a bit more than write down the shout, though. Like, I don't think it's adequate for you to know what the word is. You have to... In order to use a dragon shout, you have to understand the fundamental meaning. So... You could learn what the words of, dra of uh, dragon rend were, but... None of the dragon souls you used would be able to give you that wisdom to actually use the shout. Because none of the dragons know the words of Dragonrend. Plus, like, yeah, he's, he's like, conflating... He's, like, he's all kinds of wrongs here, right? He's conflating the ancient Nords with blades when the blades would have been long after the ancient Nords. And... He's assuming that dragon speech is as simple as knowing the words, not learning the meanings of the words. How the fuck did the dwarves get a hold of the dragon elder scroll in the first place? Well, in fairness, I think that's just an elder scroll. I don't think it's the same one. I know it's called the dragon elder scroll, but I think that's because it's the main quest elder scroll. And it's the one that has to do with dragons. But I don't, I, I don't, I've never seen anything that indicates that that is exact, that is actually the same dragon, the El same Elder Scroll. Although actually, hang on, it's possible, it's actually possible the Dwemer were still alive at that point. So it's actually not that implausible. Because I think... The Dwemer, the Dwemer disappeared after the Battle of Red Mountain, which the Nords were there for. So that implies that the dragons weren't a thing at that point. So the Dwemer might actually have been able to just get the Elder Scroll. They said that scroll literally just disappeared from the Imperial Library. That scroll? You know, there's, there's, um, there's three scrolls. In Skyrim. So yeah, it's actually not impossible for them to have gotten it. Yeah, and also they have a... They apparently just have, like, properties to show up wherever the writer needs them to show up. How many scrolls are in, in lore there? Aren't there, like... Aren't there, like, dozens in the, um... In the Thieves' Guild quest in, uh, Oblivion? Sent Alduin forward in time and knew that their ancestors were going to need this. Oh no. We don't really have any other options for defeating oh, no. Alduin, so Parthenax sends us on a quest to go and retrieve the Elder Scroll and we comply. Hot girls and boys are back. Stop competing with me. I am the hot girls and boys, okay? You're trying to steal my fucking viewers. Alright, what the hell was he saying? In the shout somewhere, maybe on the giant rock detailing their entire history because they sent Alduin forward in time and knew that their ancestors were going to need this. We don't really have many other options for defeating Alduin, so Parthenax sends us on a quest to go and retrieve the Elder Scroll and we comply. While on our way to the Elder Scroll's resting place, we s Oh, hey, I leveled up. I'm going to have to talk about that now, aren't I? The big one. Yeah, I think I am. Alright, let's talk about Skyrim's leveling. First off, let me say that I have a multitude of problems with the way Skyrim and, to a lesser extent, the other Elder Scrolls games handle leveling. But before we get into that, let's establish a baseline of understanding about how this system works so that everyone is on an even playing field here. Skyrim's leveling system is based on increasing skill levels rather than gaining experience points. Did they mention Dragonwind on Alduin's Wall, though? They do mention that, like... They do mention... They allude to the Dragonwind shout, because, like... On the wall, there's a Dragonborn shouting at the dragon. And Esbern, like, has the interpretation that that means that there must be, like, some anti-dragon shout. So 
Skill level ups happen merely by using the skill associated with them, and once you level up a certain number of skills, you gain a player level, which awards you a perk point that you spend on, well, perks. The things I dislike about this system are many, so we're gonna have to once again turn to chopping up this argument into bite size. Okay, I think we're about to get into some real shit. Hit me! Chunks so everyone can actually, you know, understand it, and it prevents it from becoming a rant. The first issue I take with Skyrim's leveling is how it allows for less overall control of your character's progression since you cannot benefit from a skill without also leveling it up. My example for this is going to be Sneak, which is probably the most universally beneficial combat state in the game. If Combat, yes, but I would say lockpicking is more applicable for this point. If any player, regardless of weapon or build, successfully attacks an enemy while in stealth, they get a free critical hit for every- Not magic users, though. ...attack that lands until they're detected, which is beneficial to literally every instance of combat you could ever be in because you're just dealing double damage. My main character for this series of videos was an archery-focused one, and as such, often finds herself far away and out of the sightlines- You were? Since when? I thought you just- I just- I thought you just spammed left mouse button with sword and shield. Well, axe and shield, but- ...of many outdoor engagements. In such circumstances, it's incredibly beneficial for me to use stealth to try and snap away a few critical hits on a single or group of enemies as long as I can before I'm detected, despite having no interest in building a stealthy character, because I don't sneak through the dungeons or in cities or anything like that. Now let me set you up a hypothetical situation. Say I have 45 archery skill and want to get the level 60 archery perk that increases my damage done by 20%. Seems like a simple solution, right? By the time I get my 6 levels in archery, I'll probably be close to leveling up, and once I do, I can perfectly align when I get my perk point with when I get my 60 archery. Problem is, I can't do that, because I've been sneaking around to get those crits, and because I've been lockpicking doors and- Have you thought about- not spending the perk point? Chests to make dungeons less annoying and to get more loot. And because I've been trading away all the stuff I don't need, which all raise my sneak, lockpicking, and speechcraft skills respectively. Which all adversely raise my character's level bar. Because of this, I may only get to his 57 archery skill before I gain my perk point, and I'm now stuck with a dilemma. I can either squat on the perk point for another three levels of archery, delaying its usefulness for however long that's going to take. Oh no, you poor child! Oh dear! Oh... Is the baby not able to afford enough perk points? Oh, Stealth Archer Baby doesn't have enough perk points. Stealth Archer Baby's sad that he has to store a perk point, not letting it go to use. Oh, no. Yeah, needless to say, after our last fucking rant about this shit, that I'm, uh, slightly tilted by this notion. Oh no, I have to spend my perk point, or it'll go to waste. But mom... Yeah, I don't have the pop filter on, so I do apologize for all the times that I say perk point. I'm sure it sounds uh I'm sure it sounds less than ideal, but uh, uh... Oh no, how tragic. You had to save a perk point because you like really that's your issue? I, I really hope you bring up the fact that it's, like, really difficult to predict when you'll actually level up based on what skill ups you get. Like, that better be, like, within the next minute. Or I can just waste on a perk I didn't really want that much and just use the next level I get for the one I did want, which wastes some of the usefulness of this perk point forever. Not to mention that it can feel incredibly frustrating having your plan ruined because you dared to partake in mechanics that aren't strictly archery, and because you didn't feel like lugging around hundreds of pounds of useless vendor crap. Compare this to even the Fallout leveling system, where you have total control over how you progress your skills, and then choose a potential perk after that, meaning that you can get perks as soon as they're available if you allocate your skills in the right way and don't get shafted by not meeting requirements by anything outside of your own point allocation knowledge. You're totally in control of your own skills. You've got full control over your own leveling, and you don't have to arbitrarily not use mechanics to not level up faster than you intend to. But it's also a different system that is attempted to accomplish different things. Skyrim awards XP by participating in the actions that make up the skills. Fallout awards XP by accomplishing things, doing quests, unlocking stuff, killing things, etc. New Vegas forces you to pick one. Well, yeah, I, I suppose that's the other thing is... Um... Uses New Vegas as a positive example of perks 
when New Vegas forces you to pick perks when you level. And also, I don't think you I don't think you can dodge the level up. I think as soon as you're out of combat after a level up, um, you just get ambushed by it. At least Skyrim gives you the opportunity to delay your level to do whatever you need to do. Like oftentimes when I level up, I go to I go to a trainer to make sure that I've trained that level. So it's like, okay, I have more control. Um No. No saving perks or skill points. Yeah, like but that's so much more control, especially with how like random quest XP rewards are in Fallout New Vegas. Like, am I only going to get 500 XP or am I going to get 2000? Is this quest going to be a level up or not? Am I going to encounter an enemy that's going to push me over the edge? Of course, I suppose overall it doesn't really matter. It's not like I have any limitations set on how many of these perk points I can get, so wasting one probably isn't all that big of a deal in the long run. Oh, it is. Are you... Like, what? Did you not play the game? Are you kidding? I have been dredging through the through the 50 levels. Like, okay, so I'm like level 53 or something, right? And it is taking forever to level up now. Um... Those, like, 50 perk points that I've spent up to this point, if I was dumb with any of them, they're just they're just wasted. They're just gone. I got a legendary of the skill to start over to fix it. Stealth Archer Pat. He doesn't need perks. Well, yeah, that's the other thing. Again, motherfucker, play a magic build sometime and complain about, oh, no, I might waste a perk. No, you will waste a perk point, motherfucker. You'll waste a perk point and you'll goddamn like it. Welcome to magic, bitch. That brings me to my second issue with Skyrim's leveling. It doesn't feel like it's all that big of a deal. Of all the RPGs I've ever played, Skyrim has the most lethargic, apathetic leveling up experience ever. Really? Okay. Interesting perspective. It's rivaled only by World of Warcraft, and that's an MMORPG, or at least a... Well, people usually describe leveling in World of Warcraft as... Because, you know, they do, like, the big explosion of yellow, and, like, there's an announcement, you get an achievement, you get, like, all your health back. Was, and it has an excuse. When you level up in Skyrim, you have to go into your skills menu to choose which basic stat you want to increase by 10. Then you get to use your single perk point that you can use on any perk you apply for. Plus, you get, like, a full stat recovery. And, like, you get to choose when it happens, and it doesn't just happen in the second you're out of combat. And then you're done. And a lot of times, it doesn't really feel like whatever you picked matters. Oh, yeah, and what about Dark Souls? Dark Souls has no ceremony for leveling. Matters. It's not like you can run out of perk choices or anything like that. Leveling up in an RPG is supposed to be a big deal. It's supposed to mark a vast increase of power in your character. And Local man who didn't play Dark Souls makes point. God. Not like I streamed Dark Souls. I think I crashed it. That's what you get. This has got to be the most human thing ever. Trying to start up Dark Souls in the middle of a stream and then crashing it. <laughs> And it's like fucked crash too. It's like can't open the task manager crashed.
Is there a... a there she goes. Always on top. Thank you. End the Dark Souls process. There we go. Hey, anything that doesn't end the stream is a success. I have DS Fix, but it only goes so far. Let's see. I have to hope that my character has enough souls to be able to level up. Um... Where the fuck am I? Oh. Oh god. Uh... I don't know the PC controls, so I don't know... I don't know what the button is to do Homeward Bone. So I guess we're just walking back. Legitimately, like, some of the most fun I've had playing Dark Souls was making this build. Um, it's total cheese. It, it deserves all the hate that it gets, but... Why is shift block? Control is walk. Okay, alt is left hand? What the fuck are these controls? Now we find out, do I have enough souls? Okay, that's not the rest button. F? Well, obviously those aren't gonna be it. There we go. Now I don't actually want to level, but this is what leveling in Dark Souls is like. You up your you up whatever you want, and then you hit accept, and then you're just at a higher level. So uh yeah. Not exactly impressed. I'm not pressing accept. I mean, I have the giant dad saved. Like, I have it backed up somewhere, so I have no issue with, like, actually leveling on it. But I do, so. And as such, should feel that way. Skyrims don't. The difference between any two levels of a character in Skyrim is one perk. Usually some kind of percentage-based affair and ten points in one of the three major stats. As opposed to a lot of levels in Dark Souls, which don't mean anything until you finally meet the weapon requirements. Sure. Sure. Wait, he did all that just to show us how to level in Dark Souls? Well, I did all that to show that, like, leveling in Dark Souls is not, like, it's not better than Skyrim. I won't say it's worse, but it's just, like, a thing that you do. Like, I don't understand, like, there's a lot of people who would make the, make the opposite case, that leveling in Skyrim feels uh, impactful. And that might only be because, like, there's the epic sound effect, like, hua, hua, hua. That kind of thing, but... Yeah. The game doesn't stop its actions to let you carefully pick which feats or skills you want to upgrade. It doesn't grant you any new spells or abilities. You don't get a major increase to your damage and survivability outside of your very first level up if you choose health and or stamina, which is a 10% increase at the base stat line, which then falls off dramatically as you go on. You just shove your... Okay. Okay, sure. Whatever. That feels like a really disingenuous way to, like... To, uh present the um the skyrim leveling as like percentage increases 
it's like, you know, health, you know, like vitality leveling in Dark Souls doesn't give you that much health either. Like each individual one, you have to get a lot of them. Perk choice somewhere if you want to shove it anywhere at all and you, you move along. And I actually find myself reserving level ups as an emergency health kit more than I do as an actual increase of character power because frankly it's more useful that way. Which is more than you can say for leveling in other games. I mean, it seems like an. It, I think the um, being able to store perk points as like, as like a health item, or not perk points, but like the level ups as health items. I think that's an that's a novel concept. I wouldn't say it's good or bad, and I doubt I would miss it. Uh, I doubt I would miss it if like Elder Scrolls Six didn't do it that way. But it's like, yeah, I really think that he's like. Like, he's not mentioning... All of a sudden, he's not mentioning Dark Souls anymore. Or Dragon's Dogma, which is kind of... Dragon's Dogma is also one of those games where you level very incrementally. Now, of course, I know why Skyrim's leveling is like this. I know why it's so boring and mundane. It's because you can do however many of them your schedule permits. Because there's no level cap. You can get literally every perk. The reason this is the case is because... Okay, hold on there. In the base game, you could not get every perk. It wasn't until they added the legendary skills that it actually became possible, because the, the max level is 81. So that means you can only get 80 perk points um, without legend doing legendary on any skill, but there's like 250 perks for you to buy. Plus, it's like, I don't fucking... Uh. Plus, it's like, who actually legitimately legendary skills? Like, the only people I know who do that are usually, like, because they, uh, they're doing the thing where it's, like, you get 100% spell cost reduction on, like, alteration spells, and then you just keep, like, grinding alteration by fast traveling over and over. I think that's, like, that's legitimately the only time people actually use legendary skills. Because it's like, you're not going to take your primary combat skill and reset it to 15 so that you basically have no weapons. Right? Because therefore... Like, I, I told the story earlier, or, well, last stream. Um, the first time I've let, done a legendary skill that wasn't part of an exploit was this current playthrough, and that was so that I could get the perk points from smithing an enchanting bag. leveling never ends never ending levels give people less reason to start a new playthrough as opposed yeah but it does it fucking slows down it absolutely slows down like there's a reason you don't see people who are like there's a reason the average max level i've seen in these videos is around 40 What the hell are legendary skills? When you hit 100, you have the option to reset the skill to 15 and you get all the perk points back. Supposed to just chugging along on theirs. And the longer their single playthrough lasts, the more advertisable the game is. The more advertisable the game is, the more people are likely to buy it. And when people buy Bethesda games, guess who gets money? Yeah, Zenimax. Oh, no! Leveling sucks because Zenimax wants money. Okay. Like, that's such a weird thing. Like, wouldn't they also make money if the leveling system was, you know, impactful, like you wanted? Seems like they would make more money, because more people would like leveling. Like, that was such a weak fucking thing that he, like, that, that five-minute leveling section was just, like, really weak. Why does Zenimax take the heat instead of Bethesda? Because not a lot of people understand the relationship.
The third thing I dislike about this system is that it doesn't require the player to accomplish anything oh no. to get rewards. It continues. The reason the experience bar has maintained its dominance in RPGs for so long is because it's a good system. It only grants XP once the player has actually succeeded in doing some kind of task. Skyrim's leveling merely asks that the player attempt or participate in a task to gain levels. It's yeah, it's a different approach. I find it I find it a novel concept. What's wrong with that? I think they're both valid, but I mean like flat XP fits Fallout, but you know, level as you use it fits Elder Scrolls. Like this is such a such, this is like the the weirdest reason to dislike Elder Scrolls. Is it a hot tick to enjoy the really passive leveling system? I guess, but I mean like I don't know, fucking Whoops. Damn it. Why does it now it doesn't remember my plays? We got dislikes back, but now now we no longer have like timestamp bookmarks. And when people buy Bethesda games, guess who gets money? Yeah, Zenimax. The third thing I dislike about the system is that it doesn't require the player to Why cut away and then come back on the same point? It's such a weird thing. Like Like this is like such a prototypical example of Zenimax, boom, drops the mic. And then, like, slowly fades back in as he, like, picks up the mic. And another thing! <laughs> ...accomplish anything to get rewards. The reason the experience bar has maintained its dominance in RPGs for so long is because it's a good system. It only grants XP once the player has actually succeeded in doing some kind of task. Skyrim's leveling merely asks that the player attempt or participate in a task to gain levels. Instead of having to actually kill a monster, you just have to wound it, because it's based on, you know, how many sword swings or how many arrows you hit. Instead of actually picking the lock, you just have to try to pick a lock. Even failed attempts will grant some amount of experience in lock picking. In what a horrible thing. No one has ever improved their abilities to do anything by failure. Nope. Only by success. Nobody's ever been wounded fighting a creature and d became a better fighter because of the, the like wisdom and experience that they learned from it. I mean, as opposed... Okay, here's the Fallout system that he finds so good, okay? Um, you deliver a letter for the president of the NCR declaring that uh, the official form of government for the NCR is going to be communism, right? As as prescribed by the virtues of Karl Marx. And then, like, you get 2,000 XP for the level, and now you're better at guns! Yeah, like... That's a really reductionist take, and it, obviously it's meant to represent like more esoteric concepts, but at the end of the day, you get XP for stuff that doesn't make sense. You can never use melee weapons in Fallout and ha be max level with melee weapons. Instead of any form of actual mechanical bartering, you just have to buy and sell stuff. There's no commitment to anything. You don't actually have to achieve. Oh no, you level speech by buying and selling stuff. The issue isn't that, like, the easiest way to level speech is to sell worthless stuff over and over. No, no, no. Achieve anything to get your rewards. Of course, the moment you mention this to someone, you usually get some gremlins crawling out of the woodwork, usually responding with the argument, but it makes it more realistic. Which I say with a mocking tone because I think that's fucking stupid. Okay. Chat, we have been addressed. My brain dead take on leveling makes sense because there are gremlins who say it's more realistic. Level speech by shooting guns, level guns by giving speeches makes sense to me oh it's not about how fun it is it's about oh no you guys think it's realism okay commitment to anything you don't actually have to achieve anything to get your rewards 
Of course, the moment you, you yeah, you don't have to achieve anything because there's so many fucking people out there who are max level in Skyrim, and all they did was they never successfully lockpicked anything. They never actually killed any monsters. They just hurt them. They never actually accomplished any of the skills. They just made attempts at the skills and managed to complete the game. Like, are you actually brain dead? Do you have a pulse? Is your body supplying oxygen to your brain? Or did you shave off all the wrinkles? Like, what the fuck? By this logic, do you have to die to level armor? Yeah, exactly. How do you fail at, at raising your armor skill? Lock. Even failed attempts will grant some amount of experience in lockpicking. Instead of any form of actual mechanical bartering, you just have to buy and sell stuff. There's no commitment to anything. You don't actually have to achieve anything to get your rewards. Of course, the moment you mention this to someone, you usually get some gremlins crawling out of the woodwork, usually responding with the argument, but it makes it more realistic. Which I say with a mocking tone, because I think that's fucking stupid. Considering A, video games aren't just good because they're like real life, and B, this is a fucking fantasy game with dragons and cat people, and C, that argument starts to crack a little once you realize apparently making 400 iron daggers makes you proficient in Daedric and Enchanted Armor. He did it! He did it, everybody! Congratulations, we can all go home. <laughs> Alright, so, let's break this down. Realism bad, because... Uh, what was the first argument? It's a video game. Realism bad because A, it's a game. B, there are dragons in this game. C, I don't know how the smithing XP system actually works. get some gremlins crawling out of the woodwork, usually responding with the argument, but it makes it more realistic. Which I say with a mocking tone, because I think that's fucking stupid. Considering A, video games aren't just good because they're like real life, and B... So video games aren't good just because they're like real life. I agree. I agree. Here's one of my favorite games of all time. Now, Fury is far from a realistic game. I think we would all agree on that. Ah. Yeah, very realistic. Okay. So, I agree. The realism argument is usually dumb because, yeah, you can have video games that stretch the logic of the truth. That said, I don't like this next argument. This is a fucking fantasy game with dragons and cat people, and see, that argument starts- Okay, so I don't like the argument that, um, X can't be realistic because there's fantastical elements to it. You can absolutely have stuff that has fantastical elements to it. Like, that's a whole genre of fantasy, is realistic fantasy. Sort of the idea of, like, what if things were just slightly different so that dragons could actually exist? It's like the real world, but just enough rules are different so that you have the same cause and effect and logic and what have you. Because if you start to get into the argument of like, well, there's dragons, so anything goes. And it's like, well, okay, I guess there's no stakes to any story because at any time the author could engineer any situation to cause whatever fucking outcome he wants. I have never liked the argument. There are fantastical elements in a story, so it can't be true. That's like saying Mass Effect is... Like, Mass Effect shouldn't a attempt to be realistic in any of its facets because the, it, its faster-than-light system isn't realistic. And it's like, no. We accept that there are deviations in the realism in order to make this happen. That's like Reign of Fire. Yeah, it's exactly like Reign of Fire. The whole premise of Reign, and Reign of Fire is, what if there were dragons in real life? Why does Skyrim have farms? Realism in my fantasy game is stupid. Oh, yeah, hang on, hang on, hang the fuck on. Hang the fuck on. Hello, one and all. Welcome to my review for The Elder Scrolls. 
1040. All right, this is the same guy who made this argument. We go down to the town of Riverwood, a cozy little fishing village, ready for shantification. I thought I'd talk about a few details about Skyrim that I enjoy. First off, Skyrim has better shantification, which if you don't know what that means, there's a link in the description to a video by Mr. B Tongue that will help you to explain it, than the game that preceded it, Fallout 3. Yeah, we're talking about a lot of Fallout here. Basically, in Skyrim, I never sat down in a town and wondered where people get their food from, because Bethesda answered that question. Skyrim is a game that has been lauded for its... You see the problem. To crack a little once you realize apparently making 400 iron daggers makes you proficient in Daedric and enchanted armor smithing. Oh. And I mean, the third point, like, defeats itself. One, there are far better, like, actually realistic ways that you can raise your smithing skill. And two, yeah, part of smithing is just the humdrum of making, you know, weapons. It's like saying that you can't become a master forklift operator because all you do is, like, unload trucks. It's like, you know, some of the world's best forklift operators don't do, like, you know, they they don't have to, like, drive forklifts on the side of a volcano and, like, stack pallets with them. Some of the best forklift drivers are just people who've been driving forklifts for 20 years. No, I do think, like, a forklift driving sim, like, but only the first 10 levels are, like, in a warehouse, and all the rest of the levels are, like, you have to complete forklift objectives in, like, increasingly insane places. That would be a pretty cool game, actually. And see, that argument starts to crack a little once you realize apparently making 400 iron daggers makes you proficient in Daedric and enchanted armor smithing. All this is- Nope, it was the perks. It was the perks all along, similar to how perks make you suddenly better at stuff in Fallout. Oh, t Weird, right? Suddenly how, like, level-ups make you suddenly better at using fucking various items in Dark Souls. Aside, I'm at least glad there is some attempt at shaking up parts of the RPG formula that have been so ubiquitous and stagnant for the last 30, 40 years, but I don't think this is even a remotely viable advancement for the genre. That also brings me to my fourth issue with this leveling system. Oh my god, he did it again. He did it again. That's not, uh, yep, and that's my final issue. Fade to black, drops Mike, awkwardly picks Mike back up, fades back in. Oh, and I've got another thing. But I don't think this is even a remotely viable advancement for the genre. That also brings me to my fourth issue with this leveling system. It inherently makes it so the only way to level skills at all is to just grind them. It's just by the definition of the way it handles the skill levels you have. Nope. 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 All right, so I ground a lot in Oblivion. This was true. There's a lot of footage of me just standing in place, casting the same basic level spell over and over, right? Um, the grand sum total of time that I've spent grinding, grinding, as in like standing in place and doing one incredibly repetitive task, was about 15 minutes. And that was me, I set up a macro to cast Transmute over and over and turned like 100 Iron Ore into Gold Ore. So, um, as far as that goes, no, you don't have to grind to level in Skyrim. You poor baby, you poor stealth archer, you have to grind to make your play style possible. <laughs> that's macroing. Macroing is grinding. If you're just sitting in place doing the same thing over and over, that's grinding. And if you use a mac... And there's no difference if you use a macro to do it or if you actually do it yourself. I just automated it and had the computer do it for me. But yeah, it's like... The only time you have to grind in Skyrim probably is to raise your smithing. After I learned to always use trainers every level, I never worried about grinding. Yeah, like you can literally use trainers to gradually increase the, the the most tedious of skills and by level 30 you will probably be, be maxed out in whatever skill you don't want to level up yourself alteration needs grinding 
I've trained a couple times with alteration. I would it's on the worst side as long as you remember to keep making use of like alteration's gone a lot better for me since I started like every getting into the ritual of casting flesh spells before every fight. And also I make like use of paralysis runes. So um that's worked a lot. Of course that's anniversary content, but you know. What was the smithing grind you mentioned the other day about using gold and transmutation? You just you get a bunch of iron ore. You can get like 27 gold ingots from Kolskegger Mine, but you want to get like a bunch of iron ore because you can get a lot more of that. Transmute it all into um, into gold ore, which will level your alteration, and then use that gold ore to make like rings and shit. You'll level way faster. Plus, you have to sleep with your wife. That's the main that's the main benefit she provides is extra XP. You can sleep with your wife. You can use the Warrior Stone for extra smithing XP, and there's a quest that gives you a like active status effect that also increases your smithing leveling. But yeah, like you don't have to grind, especially not compared to like how much you did in Oblivion. It inherently makes it so the only way to level skills at all is to just grind them. It's just by the definition of the way it handles the skill levels, you have to grind to some extent to get a lot of levels of any given skill. That grinding, of course, comes in many forms, from slapping enemies around with your weapons a thousand times a play session to outright oh, iron dagle crafted style. Never mind. He considers, he considers combat to be grinding. It gets worse. It just keeps getting worse. Combat is grinding. If your wife is a follower, can you get an XP bonus anywhere? Actually, that's a good point. But I mean, like, it lasts eight hours, so. Is that a thing? Sleep with your wife? Yeah, sleep in... If you sleep in your bed, um, you'll get the the lover's comfort bonus, which is 15% extra... 15% um, extra skill increases. Or, like, skill XP. Skyrim itself is grinding by these standards. Dude, everything is fucking grinding by these standards. Are you kidding me? When you say that the the baseline of playing the game is grinding, then yeah, Skyrim encourages you to be grinding. But let's go back to that part where you think that leveling by engaging in combat is grinding. I've never slept with my wife ever. <laughs> you live a loveless marriage. What, you just make her cook you meals and like you, you take half her money? Every week. I think that's called, like, alimony. And your girlfriend works at McDonald's. Repetition. Where you just grind out the same thing. Just craft the same thing over and over and over again. Just to get your skills up. Grinding is, of course, a factor in a vast majority of RPGs. But a lot of times it's optional. Skyrim, however, makes it less optional than many other games. Especially if you want to play catch-up with certain skills you may have neglected using. That you Show me on the doll where Todd Howard forced you to grind iron daggers. Oh yeah, there we go. Now I'm angry orc. Do you want to use now? I don't know how they did it, but they somehow created a system where if you're normally leveling, you don't have to pay very much attention to your skills to get them to level up naturally. And if you're trying to play catch up with certain skills, you have to pay too much attention to them and direct all your efforts toward getting them higher. It's mind boggling. Yeah, that's called paying attention. What, what a novel concept. You started paying attention to your skill and suddenly it felt like you were intentionally trying to level your skills up. How strange. How unusual. How unprecedented. I gotta go to work. Well, have fun at work. Another humdrum day. Yeah, someone someone uh, compared it to like... Um, oh my god, what the fuck? Someone compared it to like using the Speechcraft minigame. So if I actually furrow my eyebrows in real life, this happens. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, th oh no, you said something positive. So now I'm like, uh, I'm like clipping my teeth through the bottom of my jaw. Yeah. That's how pissed I am. My eyebrows started clipping into my eyes.
And finally, my last issue is that there's no restrictions at all for what skills you can master. There's never any real choice you have to make with your character. No sacrifice outside of the time it takes to level or... There's no choice you have to make with your character. Sounds like every stealth archer ever. There is no choice with your character. Mr. Caption, noted pedophile... Oh, oh shit. Uh, noted stealth archer. Boosted. It's all accessible. Let me now stretch the boundaries of what's considered humane. If you don't grind, what do you think about all day? By comparing Skyrim's leveling to the leveling of another action RPG released in 2011, featuring dragons and a major plot role. Oh, Dark Souls. No, 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 please. You cannot. You cannot, please. I've demonstrated with each point because I thought you weren't going to do it yourself because I thought to myself, you wouldn't be so fucking stupid as to evoke Dark Souls as a positive example of a leveling experience in comparison to Skyrim. Really? Let him finish! It gets worse. 2000 level is a good year for that, apparently. Now you might be saying, are you on crack? To which I reply, not yet. Yes. Yes, I would say that. And I don't believe you. You are. But then you might ask afterwards, are you crazy? And it may seem like that, but hear me out here. These games have more similar leveling than you might have imagined. Allow me to take a moment here to list out their similarities. Both games have no hard level cap. Both games allow you to both place points into what stats you want no matter what. Both games games allot you one point to place into a stat to improve it, and the only thing preventing you from maxing out a character is time investment. Thing is, Dark Souls does its leveling, in my opinion, far better than Skyrim's, because Dark Souls has a lot of limiting factors that places a soft level cap, not only on individual- What about the impactful leveling? I thought you considered impactful leveling to be a big part. Well, ...skills, but on your overall level entirely, and also has an experience system that forces you to engage in successful combat to get any souls that you need to level- yeah, as opposed to Skyrim, where you can just keep not killing enemies to level up your combat skills. I'm sorry, who's this hypothetical player that's running around putting arrows in people but not actually finishing the job? In what fucking world does it make sense to me that, like... I'm broken. I'm broken. What the fuck? It took Legendary System after major complaints. Yeah, it was a DLC edition. So what the fuck? level up. The things that make Dark Souls leveling so much more limited than Skyrim's is threefold. First off, skills after a certain threshold start producing diminishing returns, which means that any points placed into that stat after that level, usually 40, loses an immense amount of value that could otherwise have been spent beefing up another skill more efficiently, something Skyrim doesn't have. The more you level up in Dark Souls, the more expensive leveling becomes overall. No matter the level of your skill- The more you level up in Skyrim, the more expensive it becomes overall. Have you played past level 40? <laughs> like really, come on, what the fuck? you're trying to raise. At a very high level, changing a stat from 99 to the maximum of 98, or changing a stat from 14 to 15, has the same exact soul requirement, which gets absolutely ludicrous very quickly. A problem doubled by the fact that unless you were a big PvPer in the game's heyday, which has come and gone and then some, there are only a few viable methods of acquiring huge numbers of souls, which normally force you to go into New Game Plus, which overall makes the game more difficult and locks you out of being able to connect to a certain portion of the player base. Not only that, but raising your level also locks you out of a certain percentage of the player base the higher you go, which means that you're unable to match up with other players for purposes of co-op, or to gain souls from PvP, which compounds the problem from before, where level ups have a nearly unobtainable requirement. The worst Skyrim does is make it so perk points start to slow down due to the level's slow- Oh, I'm sorry, I thought Skyrim had the worst system. Now you're explaining to me all the reasons that Dark Souls is actually worse all along what the fuck that's all I have to say is what the fuck he did it Fuck it, I'm not even putting it behind the- behind the shroud. Sonic free 
Riders has has ruined my life. Garbage! Fuck this shit! Fuck this garbage ass shit! Motherfucking one out of ten! What the fuck levels? ...requiring more skill levels to obtain. But since there's infinite levels, and you can make skill points legendary and receive all your skill points, perk points, whatever you want to call them, back that you used on that skill, then you're probably not going to stop yourself from becoming proficient in almost everything you'll ever need in the game very quickly. Oh, but you apparently did. Oh, you had such self-restraint that you didn't play Skyrim forever until you legendaried everything. Oh, no. You stopped before you actually got to the point that might actually discount some of your arguments. Yeah. It's like, most of the people who play, play Skyrim, they don't seem to get past level 40, so they seem to think, like, the rate that you level for the first 20 levels in the game, like, just continues forever. They don't realize it slows down. I mean, really slows the fuck down. Like, you have to play an insane amount, of, uh, an insane, impossible amount of Skyrim to actually keep going. Now, some of my critics are probably going right now, he doesn't like it because it's easier. Or more accurately, he doesn't like it because it's Bethesda, to which I respond, no. I don't like Dark Souls' system because it's harder. I like it because it forces me to be wise with my points and expects things of me. It gives me room to learn, to poke around with the stats, and to figure out how to make the most efficient character I can as a way of pushing back against the game's challenge. Because that's what it's trying to accomplish. Oh, weird. How? Oh, weird. Different games can try to accomplish different things? Hell, I've said that with videos. Different videos can try to accomplish different things. I'm not going to penalize Salt Factory for doing a different thing. Isn't this video like 10 years old? Was 2016 10 years ago? It allows me to better myself as a Dark Souls player, to figure things out and gain real experience I can apply to the game. Skyrim doesn't have that. Skyrim has a system whereby my character levels to a slightly more realistic system of gaining experience doing certain actions, but doesn't seem to have any room for any actual real learning about its systems. As an example, uh, But that's a different thing entirely. You learning about the game's systems has nothing to do with like, the actual game's fucking RPG systems. Otherwise, Fury is the greatest RPG of all time. Look at this. Oh, well, not this part. You're looking at the greatest role-playing game of all time, based solely on, apparently, the fact that learning about the system is part of the role-playing experience. Look at that leveling system. Lockpicking. Why would you learn more about what makes Skyrim's lockpicking tick when you can just fail a bunch of times, get the experience, and start buying points that make it easier? Because well, you're you'd be a fucking moron to waste points on lockpicking. That's why. Like, it, like I love nothing more than the irony that there's nothing to learn about Skyrim's leveling system when transparently. You don't fucking understand it. Yeah, I find myself defending Skyrim a lot. I just want people to, like, make good arguments about Skyrim. Like, is the bar set so high? Is the bar set so high? Let's see. Christian Oblivion Playlist. Pop up. Probably have to go to my channel to find it. Oh, weird. Yeah, it, impossible to find this playlist. This is never knows best stream. Like, like when I when I said that uh that people love to make that comment, yeah. And uh, a little spoiler here, 
if if any of those video if any of those comments end up at like the top of the section i delete them oh i was talking about behind the scenes stuff that was me talking about like the um the quick comments that people leave on the retrospectives yeah i do delete them if they reach the top so that people keep leaving them do you play argonian because you're small brain small brain what the fuck words oblivion i was so based holy shit anyways I, uh, what I'm wondering is, did my standards, have like my standards changed? Am I presenting an impossible challenge to people? Yeah, I'm just as surprised as you were. Um, I get remarkably less based over time, apparently. So, let, let me ask this to the chat. Are we expecting something that's impossible? Like, are, are, are we, like, are we shitting on top on a bunch of actually 10 out of 10 Skyrim videos? Is it just impossible? Am I just a hypocrite? Am I guilty of all these things? Well, probably, but let's be honest. While we are all guilty of some logical issues, I would say that... I don't know. Expecting somebody to actually understand the story. Expecting somebody to actually understand the systems. I feel like it's one of those things where like, I'm developing Stockholm Syndrome over time and I'm starting to wonder. It's got to be me. It's got to be me because there's no possible way, even though this isn't true, but there's no possible way all these videos are bad. Which is a fallacious argument. It's absolutely possible that... Th that it's always possible that every single video on the topic is bad. Or, like, is there legitimately something about Skyrim that, like... Makes people forget their brain medicine. Am I misremembering the Oblivion streams? Did everybody who make an Oblivion video just make a bad video? And I was like cynical about them the entire time. I seem to recall agreeing with what a lot of people said about Oblivion. I seem to recall not having to defend Oblivion at every fucking turn. I told you 10 years minimum before making a Tez related review. It's been 10 years. So you're saying that they need 10 years in order to actually make good videos? You might have a point. But I just don't get it. I actually don't get it. I am now a Skyrim defender. I am now not only a Skyrim defender, I am now Skyrim's greatest defender. For the simple act of trying to understand it. And trying to give it the benefit of the doubt. I mean, yeah, this is the dumbing down. This is the dumbing down. I feel like... I feel like there's something about Skyrim that makes people worse. Who knew all along the guy who would make an eight-hour Morrowind video would would be the guy who would come up to bat and defend Skyrim from all of its haters? Hot Howard should be paying me. How are you defending anything? You call these reviewers dumb, but don't refute their points with any objectivity. Are you are you are you serious, my guy? Are you actually serious? Have I not like provided examples at every point? about why these people are wrong. He said he got lost in the rat way. I showed how difficult that would be to happen. 
He says that grinding iron daggers is a good way to level smithing. I've demonstrated that that's not the case. I mean, you know, I haven't sat down and said, well, the iron dagger only gives you X amount of XP, but the gold ring gives you X amount. Like, sure. Okay. Here's the thing. I'm not doing X style takedowns. I'm going to prove how everybody's wrong. Okay. I'm just watching the videos. And for some reason, I've noticed this. These videos aren't very good. And now I have to wonder. Do I, like, have I ruined video essays for myself? Well, not video. I hate video essays. Have I ruined video analysis for myself? Am I misremembering what happened with Oblivion? To be fair, around a third of the time. I wouldn't even say a third of the time. We were mostly civil to what he was saying in the video until he started this section. Five minutes ago. In the video, five minutes ago. But it's like... Well, not five minutes. Let's see. 137, so 11 minutes ago. But it's like, we went through most of this video fairly civilly. And then he started talking about the leveling. And, like, things took a massive turn for the worse. Like, it, like let's be, be honest with me now. When we were talking about the combat, the way he presented the combat section, I don't think I called him a moron. I don't think I called him stupid. I don't think I insulted his intelligence at all. I just said he was wrong. And I'm sorry, but to, saying someone's wrong is not insulting them. But, like, I feel assaulted. You did, you did imply he was a literal baby for five minutes. That was after he started talking about the leveling. That was when he was talking about the perk points, which was at 139. And he started talking about the leveling at 137. Like, I legit... Things didn't go south for this video until we got to the leveling section. But it's like, is there something about Skyrim? It all started with Shantification. I mean... I mean, I call that stupid, but, like... That was mostly just me mocking, like, video essayists inventing terms to describe stuff. Hmm. Curious how there's suddenly a bunch of names I don't recognize bringing up points. Weird, right? This video isn't terrible, it's just this section. And I said it before, when you're wrong about something, you have a tendency to be wrong about it for a long time. So you have to give it the benefit of the doubt. But I mean... He's not wrong about one thing. He didn't say, like, he didn't start with a faulty premise and then, like, just continue from there. Like, he's just giving us, he's just wrong, 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 wrong. He keeps saying new things that are all wrong or all disingenuous or are probably just straight up lies. And now I have to wonder, was he intentionally lying or is this a product of just incredulousness? To learn more about what makes Skyrim's lockpicking tick when you can just fail a bunch of times, get the experience, and start buying points that make it easier. Additionally, whatever happened to real experiences, to the player actually getting better at something through learning and repetition? Isn't that more realistic, more importantly, more interesting than this phony baloney skill system? Okay. So he's trying to pull the epic mic drop moment here of... Um... 
Oh, you thought that Skyrim's leveling system was realistic, but is it actually realistic? What about Dark Souls? That's clearly more realistic than this. And it's like in Dark Souls, you spend souls that you absorb from other people to artificially increase your stats. So, um, no, no, it's not. <laughs> Sample lockpicking. Why would you learn more about what makes Skyrim's lockpicking tick when you can just fail a bunch of times, get the experience, and start buying points that make it easier? Additionally, whatever happened to real experiences, to the player actually getting better at something through learning and repetition, isn't- Have you tried getting better at shooting the bow instead of complaining about how the, all the arrows start by going up? Have you gotten be have you considered getting better at timing so that you don't get hit by all those animations that you complain are just too short? Have you thought about getting better and figuring out enemy variety through experience? Hmm. Oh, weird. I know. That the arrows go up? I don't even know if it's true. I think it is. Additionally, whatever happened to real experiences, to the player actually getting better at something through learning and repetition? Isn't that more realistic, more importantly, more interesting than this phony baloney skill system? Why does a game suddenly become more realistic just because it gets easier the more you play it? It shouldn't get easier the more you play it, you should become better at it because you've been playing it for so long. Have you thought it's, well, sounds like a skill issue to me, personally. However, once again, like I've said maybe four or five times in the series, Skyrim is a special case example that I'll be talking about at the very end of this entire series, whenever that is. To return to the plot, however, Parson X doesn't really... What? No, just finish your point. Please, just finish your point. I don't want that to... Now I have anxiety. Now I have to worry. At some point in the future, he's just gonna fucking ambush us and stab us in the gut with more retardation about fucking how the Skyrim's leveling system works. Great, now we just have to worry. <laughs> if you just finished your point, you would get back to just having a normal video, and then, like, the bad take is from uh, 137 to 149, and now we're going to move on. Know himself very much about Elder Scrolls, so we're going to go ask Irongar where we can get one. Turns out he doesn't know either, that's, that's fantastic. But he suggests... Yeah, how weird. ...that we can go over to the library in the Mages College to see if they know where we can get one. Once we get there, we go to the library and ask the librarian if they have one. He says if they did, they would never give it to me, and I asked him if they would give it to the Dragonborn. And without confirming with me, or even asking me, or confirming with anybody else, even if I'm the Dragonborn or not, he helps me by getting all the info they have on one. Apparently just suggesting you're the Dragonborn is a pretty big business here. A really fucking stupid librarian. Apparently- Oh, uh... Okay, let me think about this here for a second. Actually, it's just 150. Okay. Do you know what a librarian's job is? A librarian's job is to provide information that people want. That's stored in the library. Okay, so. Here's the thing. Urag is not going to give you an Elder Scroll if he has it but he doesn't have the Elder Scroll. So there's really no harm in giving the player information about Elder Scrolls that if they're going to go off and get an Elder Scroll that he, again, doesn't have. His issue isn't that, the play, that he doesn't want the player to have an Elder Scroll. His issue is that if he had an Elder Scroll, he's sure as shit not going to give it to you. That's his point. Why would a librarian not give you information that you asked for? It's not like Ureg wants to keep you from getting the scroll. He just says that he wouldn't give you the one he had if he had one. They know where we can get one. Once we get there, we go to the library and ask the librarian if they have one. He says if they did, they would never give it to me, and I asked him if they would give it to the Dragonborn. And without confirming with me, 
or even asking me, or confirming with anybody else, even if I'm the Dragonborn or not, he helps me by getting all the info they have on one. Apparently just suggesting you're the Dragonborn is a pretty big business here. I really fucking... Stupid librarian. Apparently one of... I mean, you're at the college. That means you're part of the College of Winterhold. Your field of study could be Elder Scrolls. It's his job to give you the books that he has on hand. That's literally his job, is he knows where all the books that have to do with stuff is. So if you go, I want to know about destruction magic, or it's like, okay, I can get you all the books in the history of destruction magic. That's his job. That's what librarians do. One of these books was written by a crazy person pretending to be a writer, which is known in some... Here we go. We'll be nice again. Am I actually frustrated? I would say we're about 10%. A really fucking stupid librarian. Apparently one of these books was written by a crazy person pretending to be a writer, which is known in some circles as a poet. And he might know where we can get one of these scrolls. We go to him. Actually, you know what? All he does is send us on a, a quest. He sends us on a fetch quest. He, he, he tells us to go fetch a thing. He tells us to go get the scroll and to put it on like a cube. You know what sounds more interesting than talking about a quest where we go get a thing? Talking about all of the quests where we coincidentally go and get a lot of things. Okay, now first off. You could have picked any point to do that. And you picked the quest where you get an Elder Scroll as the time to do it. You pick the one that goes through a lengthy dungeon, leads to Black Reach, involves a puzzle to get the scroll, and then you give the guy what he wants because he's making a deal with you to do something for him in exchange for the location of the scroll, and that starts the Hermaeus Mora quest. This is the one. This is your moment. Okay. Before I start dumping piles of negativity all over the place, let me just say that not Oh, before you start doing that. What would you call the last 25 minutes? Okay, oh, somewhere in the video he says Skyrim doesn't have good quests and you looked for them. Sure didn't have a drink with Sanguine, I'd wager. Th yeah, he's had far from a comprehensive playthrough. I'm really curious what this video was actually originally titled. every quest in Skyrim is bad. There are some good ones, like the faction quests. At least, you know, the, the faction quests that aren't radiant, so 40% of the faction quests. And I remember this one quest with, like, a white stag I had to kill. That was pretty cool. But overall, after having played Oblivion and, you know, other video games, especially the new Deus Ex, I do not understand the appeal of these quests. Of all the quests I've played, and I tried to play a lot of them, I found myself doing a lot of either walking into a dungeon or fetching a thing. And often... Well, um, that's, uh, that's kind of the thing, right? Uh, Skyrim's not known for its quests. It's more known for the campaign. So. You played the Hearsing quest? Eh. It was literally called Skyrim Review Part X. Well... Okay, so it's, it wasn't anything like, um, it wasn't anything like the comprehensive Skyrim review or something like that. Any recommendations on specific mage builds that you can think of? Um, if you want to make mage fun, you could do the ritual stone exploit, which is you get the ethereal crown and then you keep taking it on and off to reset your ritual stone. And then... You can just go from fort to fort collecting bodies and eventually have like a 100 man zombie army. That's fun. Another thing is you can use the restoration loop to make some gear that will reduce your destruction spell cost to 0%. And then um, you can cast fireballs infinitely. That's another fun thing. 
Um, if you're wanting to stay within the bounds of like exploits, or stay within the bounds of like not using exploits, Illusionist is fun up until a point. Conjuration builds can be fun for a while. Um, honestly, like magic is better if you don't use destruction. Like if you were just use if like, like if you were playing a battle mage build that used magic on the side, you might have a bit more fun with it. I would definitely recommend you have to take alchemy as a as a mage. Because the only way you can increase the power of your magic outside of a scant selection of perks is to use alchemy potions. Magic's better if you play Morrowind. Yeah, that could be it. Have you played a pure illusionist run in each Elder Scrolls game? I've done it a bit. I've done it a little bit, like I started one in Morrowind, and I've done it a bit in Skyrim. But I've never like I've never gone like um as pacifist as possible, which I think is like the benchmark of illusionist builds. Sometimes a combination of those two. Now to be totally fair, there are a very small portion of RPGs, especially fantasy ones, that don't feature some form of questing that isn't just go get the thing. Even the classics had stuff like this, and in more amateur projects, they are very, very common. But the amount of fetch quests in Skyrim is insane. And oftentimes quests that should in no way be either just a dungeon crawl or a fetch quest are. For example, let me bring to attention a subsect of Skyrim quests which are supposed to have some amount of importance. The Daedric Artifact quests. Now these are supposed to be some of the coolest quests in the Elder Scrolls series. They have the word artifact in them for Christ's sake. So you expect to do a lot of really cool stuff to get them, right? Like for example this Dawnbreaker sword thing. It makes zombies explode. Fucking awesome. How do I get it? You run through a dungeon. You run through a dungeon and you kill a guy at the end who has a bunch of pet ghosts. And he also turns into a ghost, which is really nothing more than him getting a second health bar. Not kidding. Yeah, I kind of wish Meridia's... Like, Meridia's dungeon has a great opportunity. That's the one where you guide, like, the sunlight beam through the dungeon, through all the crystals. So, like, that's a big opportunity where you can do that Talos Principle-style puzzle where it's, like, you're aiming a thing and it's changing the angle of the, of the laser. And so it's, like, you have to guide it through this dungeon. But, yeah, that dungeon sucks. But, like, he was showing Azura's Quest earlier, and Azura's Quest is a dungeon run. It's, I think, one of the more interesting dungeons, like, an interesting Necromancer dungeons you'll do. But, um, the cool part is at the end, when you go inside Azura's Star. What does he want to fight the guy in the open? Well, that's kind of the thing I'm curious about, is, um, what's his kind of go-to for, like, what would a good quest be? Meridia's dungeon has shit tons of gold. Well, that's like the only notable part of that dungeon is that like there's an unusually high amount of gold in there. But I mean like Vermina's quest is kind of cool. Guy yeah, at the end who has a bunch of pet ghosts. And he also turns into a ghost, which is really nothing more than him getting a second health bar. Not kidding. Okay, what about this Azora's Star thing? It's apparently a soul gem that allows for an infinite number of souls to pass through it. A massively useful tool for enchanters. Where do I get that? Hmm. Dungeon. Fucking surprise, am I right? Now again... Yeah, you're leaving out a big part of Azura's Star quest that I know you did, because when you were talking about dungeon design, you showed Azura's the actual inside. Yeah, I played Deus Ex, but it was mostly me just, like, running around shooting people. I don't really get what the hype about it is. Not all the Daedra quests are that bad. The Wyberjack one is pretty nifty with all the really weird stuff that happens there. But the fact that any of these supposedly important and amazing quest chains resorted to the most basic form of quest design is not a good thing. And that's not to mention all the other quests. For example, right now, right in Whiterun, I can remember at least three quests where I had to just go somewhere, get a thing or a person in one case, and come back, and that was the quest. I tried specifically finding cool quests by asking people on Twitter where to look, and honest to god, the only answer I actually got was quest mods. Mods. And frankly, after- Bullshit. Bullshit. I'm sorry, 2016 and you were recommended quest mods over any of the content that's in the game? I'm 
I don't think you have very good friends. You don't have friends that are giving you good advice here. And again, it's like 2016. Like, I think Legacy of the Dragonborn was like just like this was just like the first updates of Legacy of the Dragonborn. Isn't Falskar like super simple? Like it was made, it's like it's an entire island, but it was made by like one guy. So there wasn't really that much he could do. Legacy of the Dragonborn was much worse in 2016. Well, that's what I'm saying. It was like, it was super basic when it first came out. Like it wasn't that complex. A lot of it was just go to X and, and do Y. So it's like, what were the good quest mods that he was getting recommended in 2016? And why doesn't he say what they are? I tried specifically finding cool quests by asking people on Twitter where to look, and honest to god, the only answer I actually got was quest- Source. Just trust me- trust me, bro. Oh my god, what the fuck? mods mods and frankly after a hundred hours of scouring this place for stuff to do i give up maybe all the best quests are just five levels away or something i don't care i've played this one playthrough for four times more than i did the newest deus ex game and found one i don't know how long you played the newest deus ex game so it might be more prudent for you to actually give me an hour count one quest i thought was cool in mankind divided i have enjoyed every quest i've done and i've done all of the ones i've had available to me except for two isn't Mankind Divided all right? How did he not, like, I don't know, like, Blood on the Ice, Vermina's Quest. Anything to do with Blackreach? None of this sticking for you? Did you do the Wooden Mask one? I know that's a bit, that's a bit like, just go to go to a bunch of places and collect stuff, but it's kind of interesting. Forsworn Conspiracy? It's impossible to go to Markarth and miss Forsworn Conspiracy. Come on. It's like one of the archetype, ar archetypal good quests. There's, there was nobody on Twitter who recommended you do Forsworn Conspiracy. They thought that mods would be a better alternative for you. Something that Skyrim Skyrim mods have never done good quests, or very rarely do good quests. But none of those were good, huh? Also, doesn't this guy love Dragon's Dogma? That game is literally just walking around. Doesn't he love Dark Souls? Which is like... I mean, there's not really quests, but the quest you do have is literally just, yeah, go kill these four big soul guys and then go kill this big, the, the biggest soul guy. Oh, wow. What wonders of quest design. Four times more than I did the newest Deus Ex game and found one quest I thought was cool. In Mankind Divided, is it? I have enjoyed every quest I've done and I've done all of the ones I've had available to me except for two. I do not understand what people find compelling about this game's quests at all. I barely even remember half of them because 90% of them are just going through the same linear dungeon, smacking health bars down as fast as you can with this stupid shitty combat system. Why don't you show me you doing a dungeon then? I want to know what quests you did. Can you tell that this game is starting to frustrate me after all this time? And that's not even to mention the cherry on the motherfucking shit cake, the radiant quests. The actual, in my honest to God himself opinion, worst thing that has ever come out of Bethesda's mouth, radiant quests are the worst quests ever. They are bad. They are designed from the ground up just to be repeatable, over and over, and they are boring. They're MMO daily grinding quests, but in a single player RPG, and as someone who is currently playing an MMO on a daily basis, fuck daily quests, fuck radiant quests. It's just the same quest, over and over, and- 
and over and over until either your game crash. Base. You're never. You're really not gonna like Daggerfall. Oh, something that could have legitimately criticized, brought out af after he absolutely manhandled the leveling. Well, yeah, it's like you spent all this time being wrong about leveling. Why don't you take like a? Why don't you take five on an easy target like Radiant Quests? Just tell us how you really feel, okay? And then you might redeem yourself in our eyes. But just saying, like. Oh yeah, they're they're kind of they're kind of boring. It's like thank you for your insightful commentary. Please don't talk to me or my wife's son ever again. Continue. Overlapping Skyrim music. crashes which is very likely considering it's skyrim or you die it's repetitive there's no closure to the quest itself because it just keeps happening again and again and this system can burn in hell for as far as i care for it have you thought about not doing them i mean i know that's a pretty pretty weak argument i would definitely say like it's valid to criticize radiant quests the first time you do them but the second you recognize the pattern you know it starts to be on you that you are the one who is, who's having the issue. Can't believe I'm defending Skyrim again, but I think it has good RP. It just comes down to where you go and what your character does rather than how they do it. Well, I think the main thing he's missing is that Deus Ex Mankind Divided has an established character as the centerpiece of its missions. And so it can do a lot more interesting stuff with that premise. It's trying to do a different thing. Show on the doll where Mr. Howard forced you to complete Radiant Quests. Yeah, basically. Being annoyed at urns is one thing, but like announcing to the world that you just can't stop looting the urns despite knowing better is another, right? Um, another thing would be like complaining that like, I'm surprised he hasn't complained that like Skyrim encourages you to save your best potions, but you never actually use them. Like I saw he, in this fight, he uses poison. So I, he's definitely making use of the system. You're forced to do Radiant Quests if you want to restore the Thieves' Guild. I think that's the only one. That's the thing, though. He hasn't done the Thieves' Guild. I don't think he did the Thieves' Guild. So it's like the main source of Radiant Quests, and he hasn't really done them. Absolute game design. It must be like the game I... It must be like game I like. Boring quest? Make it like 2050's cyberpunk game where you raid soda machines and get beaten by the, up by the police. Yeah, I mean... Sort of the thing is like Deus Ex has a lot of advantages for the way that it's set up, but one of its disadvantages is that you have to play as Adam Jensen. And not that Adam Jensen's a bad guy, but let's be honest. You know, what if I want to play as not Adam Jensen? Elder Scrolls gives you the opportunity to really define who the character you are is, but that comes with the inherent downside that a lot of the quests aren't going to involve particularly compelling player character drama. It's just kind of difficult to do. That's why they're mutually exclusive. As they say, different strokes for different folks, you know. Saving consumables forever and never using them is a curse that plagues every RPG. I think that that's a you thing, though. Like, it's completely possible to break yourself of that habit. So it's not really the game's fault. Adam Jensen is better than Skyrim, man. Probably. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Probably. 
But, I mean, to be fair, he's also comparing it to, like, a game that came out in 2016. And you can make future comparisons, but it's got to come with the caveat that, like, you know, Mankind Divided had the opportunity to actually learn from and be better than Skyrim. It's like saying you're going to be the world's best racer. Or, as they say, racist. You're going to be the world's best at the 100 meter sprint. And you're going to compete against somebody who died a long time ago. Or at least is too old to compete now. <clears throat> I keep eating these french fries and I keep almost dying. No, no, no. This is not a, um, this is not a repeat thing. These Wendy's french fries are not ideal, I'll be completely honest. They're a bit too, like, they're too kind of stringy. I need more meat to my french fries, goddammit. Always on top of that sport, baby. I imagine you are. You want to hear a, an example of what Radiant Quests have achieved in four years after their introduction? How about the... Not really, but, um... I assume you're going to tell me anyways. I don't think they're even salty enough. I'm sorry, these fries just weren't good. So go ahead, tell me. What has, uh, what, how, how have Radiant Quests panned out for you in the current year? Well, well, no, it's 2016, so it is current year. It's current year plus zero. For it. You want to hear a, an example of what Radiant Quests have achieved in four years after their introduction? How about this one quest in Fallout 4, this one nifty little quest in the fourth Fallout game, the most recent game from Bethesda, where a single gang of raiders can abduct one of your settlers over and over again, even if you clear out the dungeon they're in of all of their raider friends and unlock all the doors to get to them. I'm not kidding. I am honest to God, not kidding. That can actually happen. It happened to me four times in my initial playthrough of that game, and even if that quest did work as intended, I would just be running around and doing the same dungeon four times and not have my settlers taken hostage at random. Of course. I mean, there you go, but that sounds like a Fallout 4 problem to me. Wait, did he not play Fallout 4? Yeah, I don't understand the continuity. He has, but he hasn't. He might have been saying that like he hasn't broken open the the CS for Fallout 4, but it's like you you it's the same engine, so it's not going to work that differently. I don't know. I'm <clears throat> I feel like he's all over the place. Just running around the same dungeon over and over again isn't really very different to what I'm doing in Skyrim right now, is it? Here's the thing about the Elder Scrolls that I've noticed. The Elder Scrolls isn't really a series about role playing. At least Whoa, now you're showing me that, like, this is what this is. Did you think about doing this with, like, all those videos that I wanted to know who made them, but had no clue besides Angry Joe and Darkside Phil? It's from Oblivion to the present. It's a medieval-ish fantasy open-ended action game where you go do missions and cool stuff happens on those missions. It's not about the tough choices or building your character's writing or anything about it. It's just about going out and having cool stuff happen on the little quests that you do. Which is fine if that's what you're going for. You can do that. You can make an open-ended action game and have it be good. But most of the time, Skyrim doesn't even have that. So many of the quests in Skyrim are just so passive. Like, okay, not every- I would be this salty if I played salt Stealth Archer the entire time. Sorry, but you made the wrong choice. Played Skyrim badly. You did a dex build. Everybody said don't do dex builds, but you did it anyways. It's fine if that's what you're going for. You can do that. You can make an open-ended action game and have it be good. But most of the time, Skyrim doesn't even have that. So many of the quests in Skyrim are just so passive. Like, okay, not everything about the questing is bad. Having a separate menu of quest objectives that you haven't started yet and have only heard about is a good idea, and it saves a lot of menu space. And the fact that you don't have a quest marker on the quests you haven't interacted yet, and the fact that some of these quests have objectives where you're supposed to go find something, which you're now not being told about because you don't have a quest marker, is a fantastic combination and something more RPGs in general need to do. But I'm sorry, what? What was the fantastic part? choices or building your character's writing or anything about it. it's just about going out and having cool stuff happen on the little quests that you do which is fine if that's what you're going for you can do that you can make an open-ended action game and have it be good but most of the time skyrim doesn't even have that so many of the quests in skyrim are just so passive like okay not everything about the questing is bad having a separate menu of quest objectives that you haven't started yet and have only heard about is a good idea and it saves a lot of menu space that's not what that that's the miscellaneous quest tab that's not what that tab represents 
the fact that you don't have a quest marker on the quests you haven't interacted yet, the fact that some of these quests have objectives where you're supposed to- That doesn't mean you haven't interacted with them, it just means you're not tracking them. Do you, did, how did you play so much Skyrim and not understand how the fucking quest log works? And it saves a lot of menu space. And the fact that you don't have a quest marker on the quest you haven't interacted yet, and the fact that some of these quests have objectives where you're supposed to go find something, which you're now not being told about because you don't have- You're only not being told about it because you're not tracking the quest. Like, what the fuck? A quest marker is a fantastic combination and something more RPGs in general need to do. But so much of the more real nit and gritty questing is boring to me. And people call this gameplay loop, this constant stream of walking down corridors. He said the words. He said the words. Try clicking your mouse. That that stops the video. Maybe he's comparing it to MMO quest logs. Uh, it's just like... I don't know. I, the only takeaway I can get is that he doesn't understand how the quest log works. I refuse to believe that he has not once clicked on a quest and found out, oh, that's how it works. Well, there's some quests, like, some of the Radiant quests are straight up impossible without the quest log. And the game auto-tracks quests that you start. So it's impossible for you to not be able to figure out that if you click on the quest, that's, it, it's not like quests you don't know about, it's just quests that you have that you aren't actively tracking. Quest marker is a fan of objectives that are just so passive. Like, okay, not everything about the questing is bad. Having a separate menu of quest objectives that you haven't started yet and have only heard about is a good idea and it saves a lot. Having a separate menu of quest objectives that you haven't started that you've only heard about. Again... I'm thinking he's basing on the, like, okay. So when you start to Dark Brotherhood, it starts with a generic quest. Well, he didn't do the Dark Brotherhood. When you start the, like, Civil War, it starts with a miscellaneous quest to join each side. And I think that's what he's interpreting it. But it's like... A lot of menu space. Oh no, him playing passively is definitely a problem because he's he's literally playing what is, without a doubt, the most monotonous way to play. And the fact that you don't have a quest marker on the quests you haven't interacted yet, and the fact that some of these quests have objectives where you're supposed to go find something. I guess you don't have a quest marker on quests you haven't interacted with because you haven't fucking started them. That's true. Which you're now not being told about because you don't have a quest marker is a fantastic combination and something more RPGs in general need to do. But so much of the more real nit and gritty questing is boring to me. And people call this gameplay loop, this constant stream of walking down corridors, slamming N1 and chugging health potions a masterpiece. And that boggles my mind. It drives me crazy. Okay, with all that out of the way and all, we are finally out of topics. We have finally run out of major things I wanted to discuss for Skyrim. An hour and 40 minutes later. Except for the story, of course. And one last thing that I'm intentionally saving up for myself, that I'm going to do in the conclusory video that will be coming after this one. That's going to be the big one. That's going to be the video where we're finally going to put this thing to rest. It may not be our very next video, but it will probably be very, very soon. So hopefully between this and what I expect to be a Deus Ex review or critique, that'll be enough entertainment to hold everybody off. Until then, however, I'm once again going to have to just bid farewell. I'll see you guys next time when we finally overcome this mountain of a project. Notice, the part 4 in the title means something. It means that- Well, yeah, so we've talked about this, like... So, like, with the White Light video, we kind of had this existential crisis of, like, is White Light good? Or is White Light good about stuff that we don't know about? And if you're actually a fan of the games that he that he, that he covers, um, then, like, does White Light's video stand out as badly as the Skyrim one did to us? So I, I kind of have to wonder about that. Like, is this a situation where because we know about Skyrim, like, so he got blasted for the near video. It's starting to seem somewhat legitimately. If he butchered near as badly as he's butchered some of the stuff about Skyrim, I can absolutely see why the fans were upset.
that if you're starting on this video, you're not really gonna have a proper understanding of what's been going on in this series for the last three videos. I suggest that if you care about having a firm grip on the topic at hand, then you go back and watch the series in full. But for the rest of you, let's continue. Oh, don't worry. We've unfortunately made it this far. Continue. I hate this game. Okay, now, last time we played this game, I said that I was out of topics to talk about as far as the actual game goes. However, that is not actually correct. I completely forgot about a few things. So let's just spitfire them so we can finish it. F Number one, the UI. Do I even have to explain this one out for anybody? Do I have to spill the beans on this? Like, really? Skyrim's UI is great for consoles. It's built up out of a lot of lists which controllers carve through, like... It is not great for consoles. It's better for consoles. But it's not great. My main complaint with Skyrim's UI is... If you have a bunch of, like objects of different categories in a container it sometimes won't alphabetically sort those objects skyrim like skyrim's ui has really started to break down since anniversary edition added so many more objects that like it's become genuinely like a nightmare of mine to like have to interact with my containers. Yeah, being able to see more than five items is nice. I will say that. That's user experience. Sure. Yes, you're right. In a way. But. No, you no, you're right. Sure. We're using UI and UX interchangeably, though. Hey, buddy, do I have to spill the beans on this? Like, really? Skyrim's UI is great for consoles. It's built up out of a lot of lists which controllers carve through like butter, and the main menu is split into four directional categories for easy access by a joystick or D-pad. But on PC, this is a... Yeah, because accessing that main menu with four directions is just so difficult on mouse and keyboard. Disaster. Mice don't go through long lists as well as keyboards or controllers, especially when most of the things on a list are... That's why I use the arrow keys. ...aren't all accessible at once, like in Skyrim. Where something like the inventory may have 10 or so different types of items for you to scroll through, but you can like, click on like 5 of them at a time. And it's even worse for the actual inventory of stuff you own, because you can carry around up to, you know, multiple hundreds of items, and only manipulate like maybe 15 or so via the mouse. The mouse being, you know, the primary UI navigation device for PC gamers for the last uh, 20 years. And one of the worst parts is how small the area in which you can actually click on to interact with many UI elements is, especially spells. It's way too small. Instead of being able to click in the general area of what you want, you know, you're speeding up the process of getting through the menus because you don't have to go exactly to something, instead you have to click right on top of something's name, usually, to get it. Not to mention that everything is hidden behind layers of interface, which causes you to have to click maybe three times more than you should have to. And then there's categories behind categories of things. And from what I can tell, the game doesn't come with any baseline hotkeys for certain menus or submenus, so you do have to click through all this crap. No, I'm not- Doesn't it? Hang on. That might be a special edition thing. Let me load up standard edition. Which should be about the same version he's playing now. I'm going to make sure that Standard Edition has that. Level 39. Oh, I only made it to level 39 on the melee character. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, imagine 39 levels of melee without any kind of grinding. Does this loading screen take any fucking longer? Yeah, I know, I'm, I'm low FPS right now. And I'm not sure why. I The VTuber software doesn't seem to work very well when I'm playing, like, it is the same thing with Dark Souls. What's happening? Can you just I'm I'm terrified. I can't you can't alt tab uh like it, it alt tabbing is not a good idea for standard edition. Hang on one second. Oh god. What's happening? 
I should have learned my lesson. Should have learned my lesson. Don't take risks like that. Just trust the chat. Chat says that you can do it. I think I believe them. I'm pretty sure I remember hitting I to open the inventory. You wouldn't lie to me, chat, would you? Functional garbage! Fuck this shit! Fuck this garbage ass shit! Motherfucking one out of ten! What the fuck level? Of course, of fucking course you can press I to open your inventory. Why wouldn't you? Um. Well, listen to the video and you'll find out what I'm talking about. You don't have to go exactly to something. Instead, you have to click right on top of something's name usually to get it. Not to mention that everything is hidden behind layers of interface, which cause you'd have to click maybe three times more than you should have to. And then there's categories upon categories of things. And from what I can tell, the game doesn't come with any baseline hotkeys for certain menus or submenus, so you do have to click through all this crap. You know. I'm maybe he means hotkeys for the submenus, but like. Why would you want a hotkey f to go, like, straight to destruction spells? Well, that might be useful, but, like... Maybe options to, like... There's no hotkeys to submenus. Fuck it. I'll assume submenus he's referring to is, like... The overmenu is the option where you get map, magic, inventory, and skills. And then, like, the submenu is the actual inventory. I assume that he doesn't want a hotkey to go straight to the, his, his keys tab in his inventory. Not a hotkey for the magic menu. There is. It's called Q. It's called the favorites menu. <laughs> I hate the fucking magic menu. But and you would think it seems so so neatly organized, but I think the it's like uh, its subcategories are too broad. Like dividing it by school of magic means that like if you have a lot of spells in a school of magic, it becomes like difficult to use. I'm not saying it's indicative of anything, but there's possibly a good reason the only UI mods for the game's preceding Skyrim only improved scaling, but Skyrim itself has an entire UI refurbishing. Just saying. I don't know how true that is, but I'll have to take his word for it. I can't believe I already have to put it back up. Source, Doctor, trust me on this one. Haven't I seen people use Oblivion mods that, like, change the inventory to be, like, more functional? <clears throat> As I understand it, what he's saying is Oblivion UI mods only change the scale of the default interface to show more, uh, to show more items. Whereas Skyrim user interface mods have to actually change the whole interface. Guy UI is not much of an improvement. Oh, it's definitely an improvement. Skyrim VR is the true shit UI. Oh, God, yeah. Oblivion functional inventory mod. Is it Wondrous Inventory from September of 2008? A portable container, very similar to Purse of Wonders. Is this a container or is it an actual user interface mod? No, it's a container. Container and magic menu overhaul. So the one on the left is kind of what he's talking about with like it changing the scale, but the one on the right is definitely like new. Which I don't know if I would want the one on the right because like 
That, that potions area looks absolutely dreadful. You would need more unique icons for items to actually, um, to actually justify using that. Seeding Skyrim only improved scaling, but Skyrim itself has an entire UI refurbishing. Just saying. Number two, Skyrim's leveled nature. Okay, now this one is a bigger problem than the first, and it's also one that extends to this game's junior, and unless there's a major shift in the management or way of thinking at Bethesda, it's likely something that's going to affect every The Elder Scrolls or Fallout game for the rest of this company's lifespan. If you aren't already aware, Bethesda in their recent years has, for some reason, decided that the act of designing a game around being experienced fully only through ruling multiple different characters is a bad idea, and prefers to make games that attempt to last forever on a single playthrough. Probably so that they can advertise the playtime statistic. God knows they love their numbers. Here are some staggering numbers. To this end, Skyrim and Fallout 4 are both games that scale an immense amount with their player character's level, and it's personally one of my most hated game design decisions in any game that I've played. They've transitioned from making games that have, you know, a measurable end game and content all the way in between there, to making games that are an unending drag of repetition that never seem to progress in any real tangible, definable way. Sure, the numbers get bigger, but that's about it. No matter what level you are in Skyrim, you're still gonna have a challenge with enemies you've already been crushing since minute one, since they just keep coming back with new names and more health, and the same happens with your gear. Instead of working towards getting better and more interesting stuff as the game progresses, you just have to slowly transition all your gear from one tier to the next. Iron becomes steel, steel becomes dwarven, dwarven becomes orcish, orcish becomes ebony, ebony becomes daedric. But in reality, what's happened is that iron has just morphed into a bunch of different visual stages and gotten higher numbers. It's not like a daedric sword is at all different to an iron one or anything like that. The game is stagnant. It, nothing changes. The looks change. Sometimes I add some new... I mean, you still face, like, the generic low-level bandits at higher levels, so, like, that's the difference over Oblivion, is that you will occasionally have an enemy that you just stomp because you're higher level. No, Dark Souls is uh, Dark Souls is different by having you use, instead of upgrading to different gear, you just use the same gear but keep plus one in it until like fifteen. Titles onto something, and apparently that's enough to make a game a very well realized, very well detailed world, like all the reviewers lied about it being. Like you start off the game fighting Drogar with an Iron Great Axe, and then you end the game fighting off Drogar Overlords or whatever the fuck their names are with a Daedric Great Axe. Even worse than all this, however, is that the game's leveling can actually make important pieces of gear obsolete if you dare to go and get them early. For example. He's He's like making the oblivion arguments with Skyrim. Um I mean Skyrim for the most part like got rid of a bunch of this stuff. And I mean here's the things that here's the thing. Okay, I actually have an itemized list of all of the things that are level scaled in Skyrim. It's not a very long list. Uh, which one is it? this one? All right. Here is every item in Skyrim, which is a which has level scaling. Chillrend, Dragonborn. Uh oh, the, the dragon sword. Galdir Blackblade, Galdir Blackbow, the lunar weapons. The Nightingale Blade, the Nightingale Bow, the Pale Blade, Murex Sword, Murex Staff, Murex Mask, Nightingale Armor, the Shield of Solitude, the Amulet of Articulation, and the Mage's Circlet. That's it. For the entire game. Now you might be thinking, well that sounds like a lot. That's nothing compared to, to uh, Oblivion. And that's sort of the thing is like, if when you get Dawnbreaker, Dawnbreaker stays consistently, it stays consistent, and a lot of the um, a lot of the Daedric items are on the higher end. They're not the absolute best, but like it's not like you know there's like you know a lot of tiers above them. And I mean the thing is, he didn't do the thieves guild which has like the bulk of leveled items in skyrim and i don't think he even did like the college of winterhold which has another leveled item and he didn't seem to do all any of the side quests with them that's nothing compared to morrowind thanks yeah
Drogar with an Iron Great Axe, and then you end the game fighting off Drogar Overlords or whatever the fuck their names are. But that's mostly that's mostly an issue with the Daedric items being just badly designed. Like, I'm going to be completely honest with you. The Mace of Molag Ball isn't terrible because it gets outpaced by, like, Daedric Maces. Okay, the Mace of Molag Ball is terrible because it does damage stamina and damage magicka, 25 points each, and soul, tra soul traps for 3 seconds. The most useful piece of that enchant is that it soul traps. But, let like, damage stamina, damage magicka, like, that's it? And it's not even, like, in terribly impressive values. Like, imagine if it did damage magicka 100 points. So it's like one strike from Molag Ball's mace just invalidates spellcasters. You might think that's kind of dumb. But, I mean, you know, it is a Daedric artifact. And it does, like, 16 damage. Now let's look up Daedric mace. The Daedric mace does... Um... Oh, 16 damage. So, never mind. Bit OP for how easy it is to get? Well, then it shouldn't be so easy. Yeah, it is one of the easier Daedric quests, but, like, honestly... Like, what's, what's the level for House of Horrors? 14? So it's, like, super easy to get. I don't know. It being invalidated is, it, is still an issue of it being badly designed. Yeah, but the thing is, how hard do you need to invalidate spellcasters? You have to fight a Forge Sword camp that's not very easy? No, it's not, it's not impossible. It's just running a dungeon, basically. But yeah, level 14 is the second time you enter Markarth. Those are like the two stipulations to get the quest. And then doing the quest is just you run a Forsworn area. Fallen Drung is very bad. Yeah, well that's kind of the issue is, um, again, stuff only falls off because it's badly designed. If they had made the Daedric weapons both like hard to get and better than anything you can craft, then than you can craft or like generic loot than you can find then you wouldn't have this issue but to say that like oh the gear falls off because you leveled up that's not exactly accurate or with a daedric great axe even worse than all this however is that the game's leveling can actually make important pieces of gear obsolete if you dare to go and get them early for important pieces like children for example, many of the unique named items spawn with stats based on your raw level. Things like Chilrand, the Nightingale Bow, the Nightingale Blade, the Nightingale Armor, Dra Dragon Bane, etc. Now look- Things that you didn't get. Things that aren't that- I'm sorry, but I don't think any of those items are actually important. I mean, they might be subjectively important to you, but it's like, uh, Skyrim, Dragonbane. I mean, Dragonbane already suffers because I think it's a two-handed sword. But it does, okay, so it does 40 extra points of extra damage to dragons, 10 points of shock damage to others. It does 14 damage. Isn't 14 damage terrible? No, it's one-handed. Okay, so 14 damage is fine. But, I mean, like, yeah, I'm sure so many people have been running fucking, uh, so many people run Dragonbane or Children. Exactly, this doesn't happen to Daedric weapons because that'd be hilarious, but still, it's kind of a joke that unique weapons in this game spawn with stats based on your level of when you get them. You can technically go and get any of these unique weapons too early. But see, Skyrim marks an improvement in the series because they cut down on the number of leveled items that you get. Early and get a shittier version of them than you would have if you just waited a while. That shittier version being forever inferior to the one that you could have gotten if you went at level 46, which seems to be the average for this thing. It's actively punished. Which seems to be. There's a goddamn itemized list of them that you can find.
punishing players for seeking out the best gear in the game. When instead you should be rewarding them with the best gear in the game because they knew to go out and seek the best gear in the game. They're using their knowledge and experience having played the game previously to go and make their players start off as more powerful than they should be. But instead the game is hampered by the fact that you made the mistake of exploring and finding it too early. And hey, I gotta say, for a game that focused so many assets, advertising dollars, and manpower towards exploration, its open world, the size of the game, and generally encouraging players to just go out and find stuff, that's probably the stupid. Don't lie, if you play Skyrim the right way, you put the unique stuff in your house and look at it like a fat guy looks at a Funko Pop. Well, yeah, that's kind of the thing is like, I'm really glad I did all these Daedric quests so that I can have fucking Fallen Drunk hanging on my wall. I'm sure Malakath is really pleased with the fact that I never once used Fallen Drunk as a weapon. stupidest thing you could have done like no really congratulations isn't the drake sword a meme though like isn't the drake sword genuinely dog shit that's actually retarded everybody give him a clap oh, come on join me give him a clap number three skyrim looks good okay yeah i personally think that despite the mounting technical archaicness of the tools with which it was built and the increasingly fast rate at which it is aging skyrim can look good it can look really bad if you get too close to anything, because, you know, textures. But as long as you stay in the nice big environments that give the art team the space they like to put lots of neat stuff everywhere, I think that Skyrim, even before the 800 pounds of GPU steroids, can look pretty presentable. Number four. I don't actually have a number four, let's just get back to the plot. Okay, so we do a fetch quest, absolute massive shocker there for this game, am I right? For an old man involving us transcribing a lexicon of dwarven knowledge. And of course, this involves that we do a dungeon, and as an archer character, it pretty much goes like this. It's like the whole fucking game. After we fight through a myriad of enemies, we find this giant structure adorned with mirrors and gemstones. We then do a- It's just kind of blowing past Blackreach there, okay. Just, uh, blowing past Blackreach. Pathetic excuse for a puzzle, I mean really, the situation for half of this thing is to hit the same button three times, and then you hit a different button twice over, and then you hit a button once. And after we unlock the telescope- Yeah, I've literally never understood that puzzle. We finally get our Elder Scroll. I am just brimming with excitement. We take the Elder Scroll back to the old man who tells us he wants us to collect blood from a bunch of elves to open his box. When we try to leave, some scenery-chewing Cthulhu wannabe tries to indoctrinate us into his pyramid scam. But luckily for us, I already read Shadow over Innsmouth and know how to evade his unorthodox business practices. And after- Uh-oh. I mean, he didn't say the word, but- I'm going to count it for the list. It's on the bingo card now. The IGN re reviewer was using the Drake Sword in Anne Orlando. Well, he had to be told to get the Drake Sword. There's no way that, like, he figured out how to get the Drake Sword. So, like, he believed the stupid meme that the Drake Sword's actually good. After I swindle him of his cash, we move out. We get back to Parthenax, and it turns out he was right, and the LD Scroll has created a big portal in the past for us to take. This launches you dick first into a nine- Actually, the portal was always there, you just- In a ten-minute cutscene where we see a bunch of stuff we already know happened to happen, where a bunch of Nords hit Alduin- And then they trap him into the future. Once we're done having our hallucinogenic seizure, Alduin shows up in real life and we have a boss fight with him that I have a vendetta against. Did you know that he used the Dragon Ren shout on Alduin before you're supposed to? He becomes invincible? And you have to restart the game to get it to work properly? Oh, and check out this rock. Oh, and your game crashes sometimes. On my ninth attempt, it just happened to crash to beat this piece of shit because he kept being invincible. Bugs make the game better, am I right, guys, or am I- Okay, so we pull the stupid chameleon out of his lunch money and he doesn't even die. Because like someone who just got an extended prison sentence, I can't escape from this game. So Alduin runs away, and we talk with Parthenax, and he schemes up a little plan to get one of Alduin's allies, imprison them, and then interrogate them to get some information, so we can find where Alduin's hiding out from. His plan is to trap said ally in the basement of Dragon's Reach, which is Jarl Bulger's house. He also tries to teach us some shit about, like, words or something, but we're not falling for that again. So we're just gonna move and find this other dragon. We walk our way over and have a nice speech with our friend Jarl Bulgriff about setting up a dragon basement cellar. But he's not too sure about the idea at first, and he says that Whiterun's already too exposed to attack, what with the whole, you know, war going on. And he says that he wants some at least- Didn't you su- Oh- I thought you just glazed over the Battle of Solitude, so you actually never finished the civil- You started the Civil War, and you did a bunch of battles for it, and you thought it was alright, but you never actually finished it? 
least temporarily lasting peace before he's gonna give us the go-ahead to keep something so dangerous in his cellar. He suggests the best and least bloody way to do this is to hold a council for peace talks in High Hrothgar, since that is neutral territory and the Greybeards are very well respected among all Nords, so that's what we're gonna go ahead and do. We ask Angar if we can use High Hrothgar to set up the negotiation, he clears us and we bring word to the leaders of the Imperials and the Stormcloaks. The talk itself is a lot of political dialogue that's kinda neat at first, but drags out if you pay too much attention to it. It's like 12 or so minutes of stuff, it's well written, don't get me wrong, the dialogue does feel very human, but the more this game drags out, the less patience I have for it. You do also- Sounds like a- that sounds like a you thing. This is pre-Civil Wars, y'all- y'all ball griff. Wait, what the f- Oh god, this continuity is- this continuity is all over the place. So get to at least make some pretty neat decisions while you're here, and once you come to an agreement, everyone sets out to help bring down the dragons. Before we leave to find her lizard, Delphine tells us that she wants Parthenax dead because he's a dragon, and prone to betraying people, and tells us to choose between the blades and him. You choose between your dragon friend, who is helping you actively bring down Alduin, and a psychic, who has actually read the developer's notes for the plot, because she seems to know fucking everything, and an old man. Aldrich- I'm gonna go with the psychic. You can still be there, but you'd have to halt the civil war and progress the main the uh the main quest then somehow. Yeah. I mean I think you you can't you can't use Dragon's Reach until the war is over, I think. So it's not like you can't take you can't take Whiterun and then use Dragon's Reach. I think you have to conclude the Civil War, but I might be wrong about that. Aside, however, there is one thing surprising about Skyrim's later on main quest. It's that it throws a lot of nifty choices, or at least illusions of choices, which, mind you, can be just as valid as real ones, as you- I mean, it, this isn't the illusion of a choice. You have to pick a side. There's no illusion here. You can't lie about this and say, oh, it's not actually a choice. How is it pretending to be a choice? go through it. They start to stack up. They, like, rapid fire at this area. It's a very nice diversion from the rest of the entire game. Tripping our dragon isn't a difficult process. We just have to say his name and lead him into this big mechanism, and then we interrogate him. This guy's name is Oda Ving and explains that to get to Alduin, we have to go to Sovereign Guard, and the only way to go to Sovereign Guard is to go to some temple in the mountains which can take us to Sovereign Guard. But we can't get there because we can't fly, and as we know, we cannot climb that mountain. So we ask Oda Ving to fly us up to the temple, and I have to say, for just a minute in this game, I was actually excited. I expected this place to be a serene, calm exploration of a derelict temple where I'd see all kinds of old Norse religious stuff, and figure out how to get where I'm going. It was really pretty on the outside, and I was kind of relieved that I didn't have to go fight shit for once, but that was all before I saw the fucking Drogar. Fuck this game. Oh, they just start throwing dragons around too. Fuck it, who actually wants to do anything interesting? We could just have them fight more stupid fucking dragons, am I right, guys? Okay, so we fight through... I don't know, sounds like a skill issue to me. <laughs> yeah, and he's like fighting Restless Draugr. Like a lot of them. More of the same stuff, we kill some dude in robes and then we go to Sovereign Guard. On our way through Sovereign Guard to get to the Halls of Valor, which I'm- I'm- I'm tired, so I'm just gonna, like, give up. We need to go to for some reason. We see Alduin. He doesn't really do anything about it, so just walk past him. And then, for some reason, the guy who guards the gate at the Halls of Valor, basically the equivalent of Heimdall, says that we're not gonna- he's not gonna let us in, even though, you know, the world-ending soul-eating dragon is, like, like, a, like, 400 meters away. Okay, whatever. Okay, so we pass- Makes sense to me. This is challenge, even though- For some reason! He's not complaining about enemies, he's complaining about the same enemies over and over. He literally said, I was expecting this to be a serene area where I could explore a dungeon that was full of old Norse stuff. 
Now we explain to him that we're the fucking dragonborn. And we go inside. And once we're inside, some dude tells us we need to talk to some three other dudes. Yeah, just don't, just don't do this. If you're not feeling the passion, you, you always have the option to just like, just to just stop. Literally just say you're tired of playing Skyrim's main quest and like, just give us the cliff notes. Like you're not doing us any favors by doing it this way. Dudes, and once we're done doing that, we talk to three other dudes. Might have been the guys from the original fight with Alduin. I don't even remember. I mean, I, I would remember the girl, trust me. If you would remember the girl, then, you know, maybe you would, um, know that, yeah, that is who they are. He's not tired of playing Skyrim at this point. He's tired of writing the script. It's even worse. Well, it's like you can either power through it or you can just like give us the cliff note summary. Like, I don't blame him for wanting to get the video over with, but it's like, you know, you're the one who's in control when it comes to the amount of information that you're giving the audience. And it's completely legitimate if you just want to if you just want to get it over with as fast as possible. You don't owe it to the game to give it the full analysis because you're not even doing that anyways this is li this is literally phoning it in just to get it done i am amused at the i wanted to explore some old norse stuff and wow i do not care about being in the presence of ancient nord heroes or like he's like i want to experience the nord culture and then he meets soon one of the biggest examples of nord culture and he's like why is this guy making me fucking fight him Yeah, there's still dragon encounters. Nah, oh, fuck. Who caught my Skyrim stream from about a month ago now might remember the time where... 2.11. I can see that this is going places. I mean, I, I would remember the girl, trust me. And we talk to them, and they decide that we're going to go fight Alduin together. One last thing before we continue and then subsequently wrap up, I guess. A cool thing about the people in Sovereign Guard is how they speak. They don't speak with 100% normality. The writers change their dialogue up just a little bit. Instead of saying something to the effect of, with your voice joining ours, they say, with your voice joined. Because of these are the old warriors of Skyrim who are speaking a different breed of whatever language we speak. Like how old English is different from modern English. It's a neat thing. And as much as I would like to explain exactly what literary device or style of writing this is, I'm not a lit major, so I don't know. If anybody I mean, it's just kind of, uh, constructed language. We are superior. In the comments knows, uh, please tell me. I would actually like to know that. Anyway, we go outside, we shout at the air for a few seconds, and then we finally get to fight Alduin. Alduin's fight is the same as all the other dragons, except that he has a meteor attack. And the, uh, the trick for the meteor attack is that you just move around a lot, because only one meteor that spawns is going to spawn at your current location at a given time. The rest are just completely random. He's literally just another dragon. I don't know why I didn't expect that. So we kill Alduin, and he explodes, and then we're sent down to Nirn again, and we talk to Parthenax for a little bit. All of the dragons fly away, and the main quest is over. I mean, I agree that Alduin's fight sucks. I don't know what the hell happened to Bethesda when they were making this final mission, but someone must have burnt part of the money pile because this final bit is rushed. It only takes 15 minutes between going to Sovereign Guard and getting to the game's ending. What? Do you want it to take longer? Why would you... You were just complaining that it's, like, too long. Plus, that area up in the mountains that you have to go to is, like, really fucking long at later levels. But, yeah, it's like, if it seems rushed, maybe that's because you're, you know, rushing it which you are. And the ending is completely worthless. There's no closing cutscene. Nothing to explain the effects of what you've done on the world. No big speech with all your favorite characters. No world-shattering events. You don't wake up sometimes later. Nope, nothing. The closest you get is Parthenax saying, you see you later, dude. Good luck. And all of the, and by all of the, I mean like six dragons flying away. Then you're just standing on a rock. And now I guess you just go into all the quests you didn't do. I mean, Par Parthenax talks about like what his philosophy is going to be like going forward and how he's going to try to change the mentality of the dragons. Probably going to watch Sword Art on Online Abridged or some shit. Yeah, it's a good series. Man, I sure am glad people bitched and moaned that they couldn't play Fallout 3 after the ending. Lord knows, shafting all of the closure these games and stories could have had was totally worth it just so some loser didn't have to load a save. How okay. What would you have done?
I'm very curious. What would you have done? What's your final cutscene? What's the final consequences of this of this story? You don't even seem to understand the story well enough to really even bother trying to propose endings to it. He must have loved Cyberpunk's endings. Yeah, he must have. By his own logic, he wouldn't have been able to continue his main playthrough considering he did the main quest first. He fucking hated Fallout 3. Why is he praising it here? Apparently, he just seems to think that RPGs that have set endings are just inherently superior. No room for alternatives. Well, I guess, I mean, like, that is his alternative, is just make it like Fallout. That's been pretty much all of his alternatives. Just make it like another game. Not, here's how I would fix the story. Not, here's how I would... Here's the small number of elements I would change to fix the story. Just, you need a final cutscene, you need an in-game slideshow, and then it's over. Plus, why wouldn't you cite Fallout New Vegas? Over, finally, after all of this time, Skyrim is fucking over. Thank Christ. Let just get this stupid closing statement over with. Now a long, 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 long time ago, I said multiple times that there was a special clause to make when it comes to Skyrim. And it's here that I'm going to finally explain what that is. Now, the more I've thought about what I'm about to say here, the less I actually believe it, and it's led to the creation of a second clause that we'll get into after this one. The reason I think some, not all mind you, just some, of the flaws in Skyrim are, to some extent, excusable is because Skyrim was a game for the casuals. Now, usually this is not an excuse for shit design, and please do mind much of what we've talked about is not excused by this, but some of it is. I don't normally think that target audience is a get-out-of-jail-free card for quality, especially when it comes to media focused on children. Like, how many times have you heard someone defend a shitty children's movie by saying it's for kids? But more than a game for casuals, Skyrim was THE game for THE casuals. And are we sure this isn't Dishonored Wolf? As an industry, gaming hasn't been around very long in comparison to other cemented forms of entertainment. Arguably, the first games came out on radar machines back in the 1960s, but the real world of gaming as we know it started in the late 1970s with arcades and home systems like the Atari 2600. So for all intents and purposes, it's safe to say that we've been around for about 40 years, and it has been a very long 40 years. Gaming has faced very widespread opposition to its legitimacy as not only a product that should be sold on market, but as a form of serious entertainment and most gruelingly as an art form. I'd say that we've been fighting for our right to game without scrutiny since this industry started and that we're still just barely fighting. The most oppressed group of all. Gamers. <laughs> I'd say that we'd won our stake as a legitimate form of entertainment and as a real job pathway in two recent and major explosions of popularity. I claim that the first of these happened in 2007 and lasted until about 2008, the later on of 2008, and the fallout of widely popular games such as Oblivion, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, especially Modern Warfare, World of Warcraft, Wrath of the Lich King, Fallout 3, Grand Theft Auto 4, Metal Gear Solid 4, Assassin's Creed, and any of the other big budget brown gun middle gray games that led to a plague of color palettes until 2014. The release of these massively popular games brought in waves upon waves of teenage and college age people into the hobby and created what I personally like to call the mainstream market. I like to think of this as the blockbuster explosion, because it's characterized by games that came out with flashy graphics, a focus on realism, and their massive budgets. That and this was also around the time that Blockbuster was starting to die. The second of these explosions happened around 2010 and lasted until 2013-ish. Why would you why would you delineate that? Oh yeah, they we just stopped hiring in 2009. Okay, this is like a really weird kind of position. Yeah, the the, the late 90s never happened for the video game industry. The early 2000s never happened for the video game industry. It was only in 2007, 2008, 2010 and 2013. I'd say Skyrim is also nearly wholly to blame for this one, but Skyrim can't hold all of the weight. We also saw releases like Bioshock Infinite and Saints Row 3, not to mention all of the indie games that got popular around this era. Now, I don't actually think of Skyrim- It definitely wasn't the advent of YouTube, live streaming, Steam, online distribution, the development of easy-to-use indie development tools, the widespread increase in the accessibility of game design classes in colleges, or, you know, 
the fact that a bunch of people lost their jobs and got opportunities to start their careers over. Did none, none of that. No, it was it was Skyrim and Bioshock Infinite. That that oh that oh oh man, that's what it was. Okay. Or any of the other examples as what brought a lot of people into gaming as a wide concept. Merely what brought them into the world of core gaming itself. I attribute this their success mostly to cell phone gaming more than anything. Think about it, the average person around this time probably got their first or second smartphone, and this is when the technology in them was starting to get good enough to have competent little games right in your pocket. Mix that with a new generation of kids born in the late 90s hitting their early to mid-teens, and you have what is essentially a gateway for even only the slightly nerdy kid to explore their imagination in a way movies and TV never really will. And the big releases of this- Yep. Nerdy kids never had any, any access to consoles until 2007 and the advent of mobile phones. Makes sense to me. This time suit that market very well. There were a lot more games in this era that started to ditch all the monochrome. I'm sorry, but this is just like this is just like unfounded speculation. Like, I don't actually know if this is the case. I'm just saying that it is, and it's like, thanks for your opinion on how you think it is, but more explorable, fantastical settings. I have confidence that these two claims are true mostly from personal experience. I can safely, for probably the only anecdote, it's from from Doctor. Trust me on this one. significant event from the last 20 years of history say i was there but that the second claim here hits a little close to home to me because sorry, while did, i was i yeah, confident he, that these two claims are true mostly he just admitted that like this is just an anecdote from personal my source is the crack pipe experience i can safely for probably the only significant event from the last 20 years of history say i was there but that the second claim here hits a little close to home to me because while i was well indoctrinated into gaming long before the 2010s i know and saw people friends of mine even make their transition into core gaming from casual stuff through skyrim skyrim just seems to be a I'm sorry, what was that conversation he showed? I know and saw people, friends. Okay, what would you say? Would you say Skyrim was your introduction into core gaming in a more or less sense? Yeah. And in general, what do you think of Skyrim? It's, I think it's a good game, but by now it's a bit aged. Okay, so you have proof that like... Yeah, I knew people in high school who were like, you know, they were not the stereotype of somebody who plays video games, but they were into Skyrim. But like... It's still more complex than that. Like, it wasn't mobile games as much as the advent of the internet that caused a lot of this. There weren't a lot of people who realized that video games could be something cool until it started becoming very easy for information about games to be distributed. Friends of mine even make their transition into core gaming from casual stuff through Skyrim. Skyrim just seems to be a game that was like born out of opportunity, almost like it was deliberately designed with this new wave of spreading gamers in mind without even knowing they were going to exist. This yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. It was an accident. They got lucky. That's why I think some things in Skyrim are okay to excuse, like how arrows start in an upward trajectory, or how players aren't really punished for their build. Because frankly, this game was built for people who were just starting to get a grip with this whole gaming thing. Of course, this isn't a pass- Todd Howard totally just fucked upwards in life. He was not cognizant of market trends until 2000- Oh wait, no, Oblivion came out in 2006. Well, shit. Sometimes you get it right. For fuck's sake, he thinks gaming got popular in 2010. I know, like, gaming got very popular in our culture in, like, the early 2000s with the advent of couch co-op and, like, Halo and online multiplayer. Sort of the idea that, like, one of the new ways that you can hang out is to play video games with each other and you don't even have to leave your house. That was what made games more popular than fucking, oh, yes, uh, Sky I played a lot of Skyrim. As for everything, like how flaccid the dragons are, or how little there is to learn about the combat, or how all the levels in the game are a straight line. But generally, I think that Skyrim was a good game for the casuals. Everything about it is just really good for that market. You can pick it up, play it for a while, and put it down without ever having to really think about anything that you just did. However, after playing it again... Same's true of Bioshock Infinite, my guy. Same's true of Deus Ex, really. There's a lot of stuff you can just kind of pick up and play casually. Oh, we have the citation. The citation's on screen. The tr this guy is, like, a known professional in the game industry. I've come to realize something about Skyrim that might not make it so great for casuals in the long run. 
Skyrim is the cusp and finality of the Bethesda Company. Everything that they ever were and ever will be was leading up into Skyrim. They figured out the decently satisfying and non-offensive gameplay loop that's successful for them, and they're going to stick to it until the end of time, unless they make some really big mistakes. It's perfect for people who just want to pick up a game, play it for however many hours they have in the day, and turn it off without having to think too much about anything. And it goes on forever, so they never need to buy a new game. Skyrim is the new stamped press from which Bethesda will cut all of their future games. So many elements of this game are not going to change, from major philosophy of design, to individual development tactics and mechanics. Like, Really think about it, just look at Fallout 4, and all of the things from that game that it shares with Skyrim. Linear dungeon levels, weapons spawning with enchantments that come from a big list of the Oh no! Man, it's so good that those guys at Bungie started doing, like, third-person action-adventure games after they've made Halo. It's not like they went back to making, you know, first-person shooters. Oh no, every company in the industry changes the genre that they do. And it's not like every company in the industry, you know does the same genre over and over and iterates each time and really learns from their mistakes of the last one. You like ban apples or bananas? I definitely say I'm an apple guy. Bananas are nice. I think they're too mushy is my issue. developers can use. Everything scaling with the player's level. Radiant quests. A lot of Skyrim ended up in Fallout 4 and a lot of it is going to end up in the Elder Scrolls 6 and be- Okay, follow me on this one. A lot of Morrowind ended up in Oblivion. A lot of Oblivion ended up in Fallout 3. A lot of Fallout 3 ended up in Skyrim. A lot of Fallout- or a lot of Skyrim ended up in Fallout 4. A lot of Fallout 4 ended up in Fallout 76. And I can guarantee you, probably, a lot of the lessons they learned from Fallout 76 are gonna be in Starfield. That's how things work! Are you telling me that as a content creator, you don't improve by learning lessons from each thing that you release? Or that that's somehow, like, a bad thing? Maybe he didn't learn from each video that he made. That might explain how he ended up making, like, that, that near video. I have only the bad flavors of jelly beans left. But I'm going to power through it anyways. Because we're going for gold, baby. We're going for gold. Beyond. The immense success of this game means that Bethesda is probably not going to be very willing to change the basic formula. And this is bad for those very same casual gamers this game brought in. Because a company isn't ever going to change. They're never going to challenge anything. And because a lot of these casual gamers who were brought in with this game look to Bethesda to make... That's pretty black-pilled. Can, you earn, can we earnestly say that Bethesda didn't change and didn't learn anything between Fallout 4 and Skyrim for the positive? I think the crafting system's better. I think the building system's better. There are things in Fallout 4 that are better than Skyrim. I like the guns. <laughs> I like the power armor. They still made Fallout 76, though, but that has a lot to do with greed and the desire to make an online game. I mean, I haven't, I haven't played Fallout 76. I only know what I've heard. So, and what I've heard generally didn't focus on the mechanics or, like, didn't focus enough on the mechanics. So it's like, I know it was buggy on launch, but if I play Fallout 76 right now, is it going to be an improvement or a, not an improvement over... Fallout 4, and even then, can you directly draw a line, that kind of line of comparison? I mean, it is an online game. Enemy variety of attacks? Yeah, there are, like, you got the burrowing enemies. Um, again, that's, that's still all I remember from Fallout 4, is enemies who dig into the ground. Ever going to change, they're never going to challenge anything. And because a lot of these casual gamers who were brought in with this game look to Bethesda to make them other better games. Well, yeah, what about the games he likes? What about Dark Souls? I think Dark Souls 2 and 3 were out at this point. 
things are never going to be challenged, nothing is ever going to evolve, and no one is ever going to progress. A lot of people look at Bethesda to provide them with the games that they like, and a lot of these people started their career over Fallout 3 and Skyrim. It's like the game itself is designed in such a way to get you to play for however long they can get you to play, for however long, even if it's almost forever. And for someone just starting out in the hobby who doesn't yet know what's good, what's bad, and who they can and cannot trust, and takes a big risk in just buying any game, why would they ever not- He's like, um, he's like obsessively compelled to knock those fire pots down. Know what's good, what's bad, and who they can and cannot trust, and takes a big risk in just buying any game, why would they ever not want to play Skyrim? They already like Skyrim, they don't have to buy Skyrim again, and they can play Skyrim almost forever. Or at least until the next Bethesda project. But like I said- You can't play Skyrim forever, let's be honest. Like, eh, that's an extremely disingenuous point. Oh, there's infinite radiant quests, so people who like Skyrim are going to play it forever. No, most- I would imagine most people who like Skyrim like mostly the, the custom content that's available. What do you want instead of Skyrim? Tell us what you want. Yeah. I think he made the Fallout 4 video after this, which I recall being better than the Skyrim one, so I think like he this seems to be like a video that this is the kind of video that gets made out of obligation rather than passion in my view. No one's who's pat no one who is passionate starts phoning it in in the nth hour said the next Fallout Elder Scrolls game isn't going to challenge anybody. It's just going to be Skyrim again, because Skyrim is what works. The casuals who were brought in by this company and who stick to this company haven't made any progression from this game to the next. It's a straight line. The only way they're ever going to progress as gamers is if they have the sense to go out and play other, less casualized games. But that can take a long time when your first experience with the hobby was so coddling and lasted for so long. I don't... I, I fundamentally disagree, because I played a lot of kids' games that are really simple when I was a kid, and I still got into more complex games as I got older. I imagine there's a lot of people who would have started with Skyrim who would have no difficulty getting into kind of more complex stuff with time. Of the two people I know who really got into gaming from Skyrim, I'd say only one of them is- Yeah, I don't trust your friends, okay? Every time you bring up your friends, you say something fucking stupid. Like, literally every time. Your friends told you that the best quests come from mods. Your friends told you that the, like, Stormcloaks versus Imperial events ne never happens. I'm starting to think your friends are pretty unreliable. ...experience with the hobby was so coddling and lasted for so long. Of the two people I know who really got into gaming from Skyrim, I'd say only one of them is kind of just now getting into more core games, or more hardcore games, rather. He's actually gonna... Oh man, it took him only five years? Wow, yeah, how devastating. Yeah, the average Skyrim player, uh, five years, ooh, man. You know, most people who read books don't start with pretty complex stuff. They usually start with, like, cat see dog. <laughs> see spot. See spot run. Run spot. Run spot run. That's typically how people start with books. But then they get into more complex stuff as they get older. That, that's just how people's hobbies work. Like, you kind of get into, like, really shitty films, but then, like, as your taste increases, you actually start watching good movies over time. Really got into gaming from Skyrim. I'd say only one of them is kind of just now getting into more core games, or more hardcore games, rather. He's actually on his first playthrough of Dark Souls, so, you know, good luck to him. The other one is complete casual. Skyrim almost seems designed around the idea that the player shouldn't jump off it and into the well of other games. It just seems like it wants to capture people into a loop of accessibility. It doesn't reward people for beating it and going on to their next- Some people just want to read romance novels, let's be honest. Next adventure wants to keep playing and playing and playing to never see the real end and never hop off into the next game until Bethesda. Okay, so basically, you had a different experience with video games than your friends, and you got into it way earlier, and now you have a more developed opinion on video games. Oh, fucking wow. I'm sure the first game you ever played was Dark Souls. That makes that next game. I see some of these people, and all I can. I mean, in fairness, the first game I ever played was Doom 2, but that's because my dad played it all the time. But, like, the first game that I legitimately got to play by myself was, like, um, actually, I don't recall, because I've been playing games all my life. I mean, I played a lot of, like, kids' games when I was a kid, because that's what my parents got me. Like, Hot Wheels Stunt Track Challenge, or, like, Lego Star Wars. I think I only had, like, the prequel one, too. ...think about is all the great games they're gonna miss out on because all anyone is ever gonna get from this company now is Skyrim because that's what made them a lot of cash. But it's Oh, no. I mean, you, you just try 
different games again. I guess what he's trying to say is that it's upsetting to know that casuals will skew the market into making simple games down the line and ruin the hobby for you. I mean, this is sort of like blackpilled, like, yeah, specialist game studios just don't exist that don't, that don't make simple things. Meanwhile, like, the year that he's making this video, there was a company that made a game that's really good. Oh, this is bullet hell section. Oh yeah, no, we're just we're just stuck with casualized casualized shit. But it's not just Bethesda doing that for us. This is a much more far reaching problem. For example, Ubisoft has been making like the same three games for the last seven years. And Sounds like a Ubisoft problem. You know the way to do it? Support the trip or not fuck the triple A industry. Support the double A and indies indie crowd. It could be good, but how successful is Fury? It was decently successful. Um, like the developers got to make a sequel. So the developers are still doing the things that they want to do, so it's like, it, it seemed to work out for them. I mean, the secret is they didn't spend, you know, $200 million making Fury. They, they had a budget in like the double digit millions. What's worse is that even casual games he's calling out, Assassin's Creed, COD, Skyrim, etc., have their insanely skilled players. I don't understand what his argument is. Well, yeah, and it's like you're basing the idea that like casual players are going to be drawn to Skyrim when you don't even understand like the complexities of Skyrim. Like you barely seem to dip your toes into like poison. You didn't really seem to do a whole lot of alchemy. You didn't really like try playing with magic. You didn't really even seem to understand like the leveling system. Did COD turn people away from military simulators or turn people to movement shooters? Yeah, I mean, well, to be fair, like, the uh, the arena shooters killed themselves. Arena shooters and, like, real-time strategy games are good examples of what a toxic community will do to a, to a genre. And I don't mean toxic community like racist jokes. I mean toxic community like you have a top core of player base, the uh, top core of player bases that is, like, so good at the game that they just start chasing the casual audience their way. And no one hops off from that. And because so many people spend so much time not thinking about and just playing Skyrim instead of any other games, their pool of experience and example in the industry dwindles. And they start calling games like Skyrim masterpieces despite its enormous number of flaws. And I genuinely think that is the reason this game is so highly coveted. It's not because Skyrim is some masterwork of design, it's because no one bothered to look at it properly and go past the surface. It's like a freshly fertilized field. If you start digging, all you find is shit. And, and I could go on and on about this, but I'm just gonna cut myself short because I need this topic for later. I'm gonna take a break from Bethesda games for a short period. However, after we talk about the Dark Souls 3 DLC and maybe we're- So is Mr. Caption a Moro Boomer? It seems to be worse. He seems to be a Fallout Boomer. Sorry, what did he say? You guys are saying something ironic. If you start digging, all you find is shit. And, and I could go on and on about this, but I'm just gonna cut myself short because I need this topic for later. I'm gonna take a break from Bethesda games for a short period. However, after we talk about the Dark Souls 3 DLC and maybe we're the Lindy game I found, which will release on the 25th of this month, we'll get back to this. If you want my final words on Skyrim, I hate it. I genuinely am frustrated with this game every moment I play it. Every crash, every bug, every drogar, every dungeon, every dragon angers me to no end. I have no more patience for this game anymore. I get that people like this game, and I get why people like this game. Because for a lot of people, it was their first. It captured their imagination in that special way only games can. But after hearing that this game is the best game ever made 500 times, I just snapped. And hopefully this snap, which has manifested into it. I didn't understand Skyrim, and that means I also understand that other people didn't understand Skyrim and are casuals as a result. This guy is what Sky Babies think Morrow Boomers are like. Yeah, I guess. You're just a Morrowind fan. I don't think he's ever played Morrowind. That's the impression I take. Hell, I don't know if he's complete if he's played Oblivion. Like this genuinely seems like a Fallout a Fallout guy who felt compelled to make a Skyrim video.
two hour long video, contains a good enough claim to explain why people don't like this game. Again, there's more to talk about with Skyrim, but most of what I have left is more about its creators than the game itself. And we'll get to that later because we have a much bigger fish to fry. A much bigger fish. God. I believe the, the bigger fish to fry was, like, the Fallout 4 video. God, how did something... Like, it started fine, but it went to shit fast. You put a spoiler warning for Morrowind at the beginning and didn't even refer to it? God, you remember that? I didn't even catch on to that. I don't recall a single instance where he referred to Morrowind. Probably, and I, I would because he'd probably get it wrong and I would, like, immediately notice. Can we rate the first part separately? Honestly, I would say rate the first two parts separately. Like, what went wrong in part two that you didn't like? It was like part three for me that really kind of started to, to shit itself uncontrollably. Did he even spoil anything? Oh, I don't think he even... Like, he had spoilers for the Witcher games that didn't seem to manifest. He, like... Put a spoiler warning in for Oblivion that didn't seem to manifest. He had a ton of spoiler warnings for stuff that didn't seem to pay off. He compared that the Skyrim followers to followers in Morrowind. Okay, yeah. But, like, he didn't show followers in Morrowind, and he didn't even seem to understand that, like... Like, I legitimately don't understand what the basis of that comparison was, given that it seems pretty obvious he didn't play it. Oh my god. This is rough. This is... I mean, do I even have to ask you guys what you're going to rate this video? Go ahead. Tell me. Shit! Motherfucking one out of ten! What the fuck levels? I can only guess that half of your review will be dedicated to how bad all these videos are. Well that's the that's the tough part is we did this for Oblivion and then like um I'm I mentioned some stuff, but like you know, I didn't really go too hard on people, and that was mostly because I was like in the middle of the script for that. This is like I don't know. I feel like I would have to say, and I have to address in the video, that I don't think there's been a good fucking Skyrim video. It really did start out so good, because he literally had Angry Joe at the beginning, and it got worse over time. The only good Skyrim video. It started with Shandification. That was a red flag. I mean, it's not his made up term. So it, that's that on that doesn't bother me as much as like where he went. Like literally, I shit you not. He was good until this point in the video is going to be Sneak, which is probably the most universally beneficial combat state in the game. If any player, regardless of weapon or build, successfully attacks an enemy while in stealth, they get a free critical hit for every attack that lands until they're detected, which is beneficial to literally every instance of combat you could ever be in because you're just dealing double damage. My main character for this series of videos was an archery-focused one, and as such often finds herself far away and out of the sightlines of many outdoor engagements. 
In such circumstances, it's incredibly beneficial for me to use stealth to try and snipe away a few critical hits on a single or group of enemies as long as I can before I'm detected, despite having no interest in building a stealthy character, because I don't sneak through the dungeons or in cities or anything like that. Now let me set you up a hypothetical situation. Say I have 45 archery skill and want to get the level 60 archery perk that increases my damage- Yeah, so like, this was literally the point at which he started to shit himself. Like, you can see it, like... You can just see it. So, like, most of the video was good to average, not terribly mediocre. He was good. Everyone has pretty bad takes. Sure, but it's like, not everyone lines their bad takes to the point that, like, you spend 40 minutes of just unadulterated bad ideas, bad opinions, bad presentation, disingenuous arguments. Oh, has anybody noticed that the Skyrim music stopped? The Skyrim, we literally ran out of Skyrim music half an hour ago. I didn't even notice. Someone should have mentioned it. <laughs> We're not one hour and 40 minutes into the video. We literally just finished. Yeah, like, so if you want any proof that I've, like, tuned out the Skyrim music, literally didn't notice it wasn't playing for half an hour. Not as bad as Salt? I would, yeah, I would definitely say not as bad as Salt. I will always value bad opinions over no opinions. Alright, you guys sat through it with me, so we're going to watch another video by this great channel, Ether Dynamics, uh, as a reward. So we did the first three, so we're on part four. This is Ether Dynamics with a follow-up video to the recent mod release in Skyrim The Elder Scrolls V. This video is the first of three supplemental releases. Part 1 will cover details on new weapons, Part 2 will focus on new spells and equipment, and the third will cover comment responses and discussion. And now, a few quick notes before we begin. Thank you for all the feedback! I wanted to give a few weeks to get a broad swath of responses. Much appreciated! At the time of launch, this mod was done for technical demonstration purposes, not yet for a fully immersive experience. I wanted to publish a technical expose first so I can get feedback and tweak things before working on the polished final product. A few changes have been made in the new version. The invasion must now be triggered by a conversation inside Markarth Silverblood Inn. This will allow you to experiment with the new weapons, spells, and equipment without immediately having to fight. The invaders will now only attack guards in the main city, leaving merchants and other NPCs to do their normal activities. Once inside the keep, the invaders will attack just about anyone associated with Markarth. Keep in mind that Skyrim protects almost every quest essential actor, so you shouldn't have to worry about quests becoming unavailable. These new enemies will just knock out essential NPCs per day. After defeating the invaders, just return to the area 24 hours later and essential NPCs should be back to normal. Should the need arise, you can always use console commands to resurrect non-protected NPCs with no problems. Please note that, due to the inclusion of the new temporary quest trigger, you'll need to verify this file appears in the following directory. As for balance, I want to make sure these opponents aren't too weak or too strong for mid to high range players. I know that Skyrim has a few builds that basically break the game and one-shot everything. Though I can't code around every overpowered build, I'll keep exploring options to limit those kinds of exploits. Suggestions welcome! Similarly, a huge thanks to the folks that posted immersion ideas, such as NPCs verbally communicating orders and status. I'm happy to integrate these into the final quest, which is coming together now. More details on this in the following moves. So, please feel free to play with the new enemies, weapons, spells, and equipment. I'm very eager to hear what you'd like to see in the final version, including immersive and technical changes. And now, weapon details. As several folks mentioned, Dark Souls has one of the most balanced equipment systems out there. Subtle differences in weight, poise, stun, damage, Take and off a that variety of other attributes allow players to experiment with an incredibly broad spectrum of combat styles. These same players correctly noted that, once you acquire the ability to use a new set of armor and weapons in Skyrim, there is absolutely no reason to ever go back. While that rewards progression, it also makes everything converge to the same final set of equipment. 
So, to shake things up a bit, I use the principle from Dark Souls that different weapon builds should offer a broader set of options to the player. To get your hands on this new equipment, just run into the Silver Blood Inn, where you'll find an unfortunate victim loaded down with loot. I wanted to offer players both light and heavy weapons, each with their own tweaks. First, we'll start out with the Swift Wind Dagger. This has been balanced against the normal dagger by dramatically increasing the attack rate, but decreasing damage to end up at just about the same DPS. The advantage of this faster swing speed is it allows for multiple deliveries of enchantments or other magic effects versus a normal dagger, since enchantments are cast on a per-hit basis. The I other perk is it allows the wielder to keep immense pressure on the target, incessantly wearing away their health. The 15% chance to cause mild, prolonged bleeding damage is also a deterrent for enemies that give no thought to defense. The disadvantage is the damage from the dagger itself is so weak that basic armor and shields may be enough to almost completely negate it. The other drawback is that enchanted swiftwind daggers will burn through soul gems significantly faster than normal weapons. So, without a steady supply on hand, you may find yourself out of juice rather quickly. Next is the glass rapier. Like the swiftwind dagger, the rapier trades off hitting power for speed. In addition to the increased damage from enchantments, the rapier has a 15% chance to disarm opponents when executing a blocking bash. To gain the disarming benefits of the rapier, the character has to use nothing in their offhand. Disarming may give them an advantage against close-range, weapon-wielding foes, but it does nothing against mages or monsters and robs the character of a shield against archers or a ward against spells. Similarly, the high attack rate but low damage is great against lightly armored foes, but bad against creatures with tough hides or well-armored soldiers. This is definitely a weapon you want to use on mages, hag ravens, or other soft targets. It also diminishes the player's offensive capabilities for spell use, such as runes, summons, healing, or paralysis. This gives the player an optional trade-off for high-risk, high-reward. The heavy weapons have been altered in the opposite way. They sacrifice speed for more hitting power. This can reward a player with a finesse to time a well-placed hit, but also leaves them vulnerable to shield bashes, disarms, spells, and similar counterattacks. The first of these is the Dwarven Grand Maul. Despite its slow swing and reduced frequency to deliver enchantment damage, the Maul is a weapon of immense hitting power. In addition to the usual armor ignoring perks available to all Warhammer users, the Maul has a 30% chance of sending your target flying. This can be a great way to break through an enemy line or take advantage of some perilous terrain. And lastly, this weapon type also keeps in line with Elder Scrolls lore. Speaking of lore, the Orcish Grand Cleaver was made to punish weaklings that cower behind shields. Similar to the Maul, each power attack has a 30% chance to knock away a target's shield. This is especially effective against opponents that use shield charge or other potent blocking perks. Lastly, the Steel Claymore has a 30% chance to cripple the target of a power attack, forcing them to stumble whenever they use stamina for the next 15 seconds. This includes sprinting, power attacking... This is a lot of like really creative ideas that work outside the kind of norm of like Skyrim weapons that are just, oh yeah, it does like 25 points of burn damage. It's like, um, no, this, this weapon has like a unique ability and it didn't seem to be... Um, it didn't seem to be like reliant on any kind of like craziness. Just to implement it. Bashing and any other activity that consumes stamina. This can completely change the landscape of combat, making targets reconsider options for both offense and defense. Being overly aggressive in either case can lead to a stagger and a wide open opportunity for retribution. St Goodbye, missing texture one. Stay tuned for the next video, which will showcase a variety of spells that allow the player to augment themselves, act as a controller, or create new synergies of sword and sorcery. This movie will also demonstrate unique, one-shot magic items that can turn the tide of battle even against overwhelming odds. Once again, this has been a presentation by Ether Dynamics. I don't know, sounds overpowered to me. So there's your Ether Dynamics for the day. Would you say base Skyrim would benefit from incorporating these weapon varieties? I think the only issue is too many, like, it was a bit reliant on, like, like ragdolling or, like, disarms. And if you don't know, disarms are very powerful in Skyrim. So, um, I'm not sure how much I would uh, advocate for that. So, let's uh, wrap things up here. You can grab this rank on the Discord server. You'll get active notifications. That means you'll know when we're streaming a lot sooner than we actually are. Let me give you a completely out-of-date schedule that I still have not updated. Um... This is just the times that we stream. I was an hour late today, but it um, uh, didn't seem to matter that much. Um, but we'll be back 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Monday. Now, Monday is going to be... What we're doing those days are probably all wrong. So, um, Saturday, probably going to be Acerthorn. Uh, 
We're probably going to spend Wednesday and Thursday just kind of powering through everybody's requests for what they want. I kind of want to finish the era of pre-anniversary edition Skyrim videos before I actually start with any more like um, more recent kind of up-to-date Skyrim uh, anniversary edition era videos. So I don't know if next week will be the last week. It depends on how much we get done. That's just as far as like the schedule was printed and I made that schedule like over a week ago like on the 11th or something no on the 10th because that was when i updated it because we canceled thursday um so it's like over a week old uh, but monday we are going to be doing the bethesda podcast and what that means is i have hours upon hours of bethesda podcast stuff that i need to compile into a single kind of video and then i'll be uploading it on my second channel but i actually have to go through the work of compiling all of that. I have it all downloaded. I just have to put it all together. So that's what we're going to be doing on Monday. That's going to be like a really big kind of thing, I think, um, in terms of getting these insights. How many more streams? I'm not sure. Will I cover Donut Edits and DW Terminator? Yeah, that's still like a that's still a complicated thing. I know you went out of my, out of your way. You like you tried to go like above and beyond with like the note taking stuff. I was mostly looking for like quick assessments of like. Would that would the videos be good to watch on stream or not? So, uh, I will say it again. Um, actually, I'll put it. I'll add it to the the text. Can I can I uh, edit? I'll just add a new one. How about that? Probably work a bit easier, anyways. All right. Um. DW Terminator. I know I know it's overlapping. Give me a second. Uh Donut Edits. Nocturnal Rambler. Genji Fudge. Um yeah, okay, so these channels. These are all these guys all have Skyrim videos. But they're all also small channels. So it's one of those things where it's like I don't want to do a 10 hour stream dunking on some guy who d barely has a viewership um, for his bad Skyrim takes. So if anybody's looking for anything that they need to listen to, even if it's just for like 15 minutes um, and you can leave a comment under the video and say whether or not you think it would be appropriate for a stream, then you have to remember um, appropriate for a stream should not be, oh, you're going to fucking tear this guy apart. Um, I would appreciate that. Watch Donut Edits. Well, that's the first good sign. Wait, is the fishing actually free? Yeah, I think that part's free. It's like on special edition now. You realize anniversary edition is just special edition. Oh, well, there is one small channel that we are going to be guaranteed watching. Um which is probably next Saturday. And that is, let me pull it up. This video. Um, it should be pretty obvious what's wrong with this picture, but if you can't see it, this is a 2019 video that is analyzing Skyrim from the 2020 perspective in 2021. Um, this is a particularly kind of scumbag thing to do, and Acer Thorn's kind of infamous. So this is something that we're going to at least be looking at, even though Acer Thorn's on the smaller side. So, yeah, that kind of wraps things up. Follow me on Twitter. I shitpost over there. Join my Discord. You'll get announcements. You might even like it. Um, I'm going to get out of here. This has been a very long stream. <laughs>